Hi, I'm Bill Brocktrup. Hi, I'm Katie Swink. And if you want to know more about NTS Theater, please listen to the conversation we're about to have. I grew up in Portland, Oregon, and the Portland, um, the, there was a small uh, community theater that actually did quite good work. And at six, I started going about every three months in high school. And my father had a law office down near Ashland. So during the summers, we would see all the plays in Ashland. And I was in, I don't remember not being like you, I don't really remember not being in love with theater. And then I became an actor and a teacher and now an artistic director. And the love just keeps getting deeper and richer as I get, as I enter my dotage. I have a weird uh, thought uh, that everything is high school. And I fell in love with theater, you know, during high school, um, like a lot of people. Uh, the, the cool, eccentric, you know, crazy, wildest people at uh, school were, were part of theater and I wanted to be a part of that. And, you know, because, because they did a musical, I'm from Tacoma, Washington, and they did a musical um, every year at the community college that had high school students from all the different schools. So like, I knew people all over Tacoma because of that. So, you know, it seemed very, very sophisticated to me <laughs> to know people from all different high schools. Um, and but that was a whole like sort of theater community. And in a, in a, the idea that we all come together at eight o'clock when the curtain goes up and it's and it has to happen, whether it's ready or not, or the flats are painted or the costumes are sewn, it, it's happening at this time. And there's something about that um, immediacy that brings people together and you kind of create, as we all know, these sort of uh, families, these, these very intense relationships that you feel with people when you're in that kind of situation. Um, I loved that. I loved it, that it threw us together and we became like a, a, a unit. And I, when I say everything is high school, it's because I, that same uh, feeling still, still comes over me when we do a play, the people at NTS, the, and as well, the people in the Los Angeles theater community, you know, we represent a, a, and are a very tight knit group of people who really do care about each other and care about what we're doing, care about the art that we're trying to make. And um, I have always felt like I got to spend my life with the fun, interesting people. You know, I call it pub life. It's like I get to hang out with these guys at the pub after the show. And this is the kind of people I wanted to know. And now I do. So that's why I kind of love uh, the, the whole theater thing. Now you can talk about art and, uh, and, and the power of great writing and all these other things, which, you know, are massively important, but just on a kind of personal emotional level, it was that, that closeness that comes from working together uh, that, that drew me in and, and, and still does. For my money, it's a two-way membrane. You don't really have a play until the audience is sitting in the theater with you you rehearse and you learn and you get better and you fine tune everything. But when an audience comes in, they're a living, breathing part of the play process and they tell you what the play is in a funny way. Because as an actor, I really look at it from my perspective. As an artistic director, as a teacher, I look at the play as a whole. But as an actor, I look at it from what my character needs and wants and whether I'm doing Shakespeare or a brand new play out of our playwrights lab, it's the same thing. But then the audience comes in and you go, oh, I, they teach me something every single time. And it's so personal and so intimate. It's the same kind of relationship you would have with a, a lover sort of, you know, it's, it's so um, immediate and they, you can't, get away from that immediacy. And it's a place where you can fail big or you can soar big in a way that you don't, when you're doing film and television, you um, sometimes a cruel laugh after the take or something, but it's not the same. It's not that same, you're breathing each other's air. Boy, I wish we could be breathing each other's air right now. You're, you're experiencing the thing in the moment together. and. It's, I mean, I've had times on stage with Bill where we were as close as I am with my husband of almost 40 years in a different way, obviously, but so, so close. And then there's, then there's you sitting in the audience and you bring something else to the party. And every night 
is so different and so exciting. And you never know when you're walking out for that first entrance or the entrance to what seems like a nothing burger scene or the 11 o'clock number, it's still, you have to, you have to show up. You have to be there in your soul. You have to, Uta Hagen once said, it's not finding the character yourself in the character it's finding the character in you and i think that's so true that would be my reason why i think the experience is so different there's no separation you're together i've been very lucky to have uh um in my career to have worked in um, uh, film and television and in theater and i have loved both i've had great experiences in both um in some ways, the acting is the same acting as acting and figuring out a character and what you're doing and what your character wants and those kind of things are, are the same in many ways. Um, but to me, I guess the reason I'm drawn back to theater all the time, uh, and maybe it's two things. One is that when you're on, on a film or a television show, uh, Everybody, the crew, everyone feels it. When you get the right take, uh, you know, you do a couple takes and now on the, they were on the third one. And it, when it goes right, everybody knows it. There is a feeling in the room that everybody knows it. And we're moving on and we know that. And we never have to think about those words again. And we never have to think about that, anything in that scene again. We just, it goes whoop, right out. In a theater, when we I feel like we had a great night and everything went right, we have to come back tomorrow and do it again and try to recreate that without it being a copy of what we did before. So that is a really interesting thing to me is to try to do it again and better without copying what we tried to do before. It's a, it's sort of a, um, feels monastic to me. It's like a, a, a goal we can never quite achieve. And so because we can never achieve it, it's constantly compelling because we just, there's nothing to do but keep moving forward and trying again. That's one thing I love about the theater. And the other thing I love about the theater uh, working in it is, um, and the kind of connection that you feel with the other person on stage is just something that I have not felt in film and television in the same way. Uh, in, in film and television, if you if you mess up something, you know, you, they say cut and you get to do it again. And it's, you know, wow, we, did, we didn't do that very well. Let's do it again. It, on, on stage, it's a tightrope. You know, people say that it's like a tightrope. And it is the, so the connection that you have with the person you're acting with to sort of support one another you know, the, the kind of, and many times I can think of the kind of look I've seen in someone's eye when, when something's gone wrong and you're like, and you, the two actors can see each other like, we've got to, we've got to fix this. We got to together do this. There's a real reliance uh, upon your partner that um, you're the only ones out there. So there's a real reliance upon one another that uh, I think, I think creates a kind of intimacy um, and closeness that, that you, that I haven't felt in, in uh, any other situation and uh i think that that feeling is um it's pretty compelling i i would add one more thing and it's something you brought up before you started recording Bill, and that's the play it's about these words it's about accomplishing a playwright's vision and in film and television it's as much about the editor and the and and the director of photography and all of those things but the theater is about the word and bringing the written word to life. And that's also really compelling to me. Uh, I became part of Antia's theater company when uh, I was working on a television show actually. And um, the artistic director at that time was Jeannie Hackett, a uh, wonderful actor in her own right. And um, well, we worked together on the show and she said, you know, I'm with this theater company. You should come and do something with us. And uh, she kind of lured me in. Um, but I've always been doing theater in Los Angeles, so I was well aware of Antius and, and what a great bunch of people they were. So uh, when I went, I, uh, you know, I saw the kind of commitment that people had to the work they were doing. And it's just the kind of actors you want to be around. I mean, it, 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 it goes back to my earlier answer about uh, hanging out with, the, with the, the awesome people that you want to be with. Um, Antius was full of wonderful actors, is full of wonderful actors. And... Um, uh, and I just want to be a part of that. So once I got in and did a play with them, I did a, 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 a my first play with them was a, a play called Para Palace. And um, 
I was like, oh, this is the work I want to do. These are the kind of people I want to work with. It's it's uh, it's exciting and vibrant, and people are committed to their work and to the art and uh, and to making the play come alive. And uh, uh, I was like, yeah, sign me up. I became a member shortly after Bill uh, did, and once again, like a year after you, um, and. Uh, again, it was Jeannie Hackett had sort of pulled me in. And it's interesting, many of my oldest friends, for instance, Peter Van Norden and my husband did their, it was Peter's first Broadway show, Armin's second Broadway show together. And uh, Larry Pressman, all, all these people I had known for years and years and years and years, Larry and I had, had been members of the Matrix Theater Company together, uh, were there and they were, the people I wanted to be with. And every time I saw, I remember seeing Chekhov times four and Bill and Parapalas and Bill and I had uh, worked together on a show that he was a regular on. And so we knew each other and um, it, it just, I, my favorite thing about being an actor is rehearsing. And it was a group of people I wanted to be in a room with rehearsing and learning with and there's a commitment in Antius to um, th three things overall in my mind, community. It really is a community of artists and actors. So that excited me. I wanted to see that. Uh, I wanted to be part of that. And um, the next thing is, is a commitment to, to continuing to learn and grow as artists, which is uh, so exciting and not true, true everywhere. Absolutely true, many, many places, but at Antius, it, it felt like such a deep commitment. And um, finally, there's a, a commitment to great words, whether they're brand new plays or whether they're classics, there's a, a commitment to that sense of what makes something eternal. And what makes it eternal is that you're looking at big ideas. This Maybe it's the sweep of history or what it is to be an autocrat or what it is to fall in love, but those are big ideas. And Antius embraced that sense of uh, theater. And I, I like to think under uh, our leadership, uh, we continue to try and find what the next classic is, but also um, committed to the classics from which the theater originally sprang. So that would be, and I just, I love the place. What can I tell you? I became uh, uh, an associate artistic director at NTS first. Um, you know, it's, we're we're an actor-driven company, so the the um, artistic directors all come from the company and are actors. Um, Jeannie Hackett, who was running things uh, before uh, uh, we were. Um, she said to me, like, I think you have leadership potential. And I said, I don't know. What you, I don't know, even know what you're talking about. I don't even know what that means. Um, but I, I, I thought it would be interesting uh, to take on uh, that job. And then uh, Jeannie left and, um, uh, and I've been working as an uh, artistic director with the company uh, ever since. It's about nine years now. Um, I have it, I've enjoyed it very much. It is a different way of thinking, I think, in some ways than just being an actor. Um, uh, you know, we have a lot of constituencies to kind of answer to when you're an artistic director. You've got to think about your board of directors. You've got to think about your subscribers and your donors and your audiences, as, as well as the artists who come through our through our doors. It, we're, we're dealing with designers. We're dealing with uh, crews. We're dealing with stage managers, as well as the actors. It's just a bigger piece of the pie, kind of. Um, it's It's been a very interesting thing. I'll tell you, when I've been just an actor after this now in... in plays at other places and things it's sort of a relief it's like oh wow I don't have to worry about the marketing you know <laughs> I don't have to think about that um, but there's been something great about being an artistic director and I, I, I different people I think would approach it differently and some people have a big stamp they want to put on things many artistic directors also direct themselves um, uh, I'm not a director um, so I haven't done that, but I like to think my philosophy about uh, what our job is meant to do is uh, to to help choose material uh, and 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 marry that up with a concept and a director and a cast and then and designers and then sort of turn those people loose. And I feel my job is to help amplify their voices. Uh, I don't want to necessarily put my stamp on everything, what I think it should be, but I want to make sure that their voices are as clear as possible 
in everything that they're doing and to um, encourage them to, to, to follow where their voice is leading them. Uh, and, and then when it's not clear as an audience, when I'm watching, is it when it's not clear, I say, well, I'm kind of missing, or is this what you meant to do here? Or why did you think this? Um, but it's to amplify uh, those, those voices. Bill said much of what I would say. I too was an associate artistic director and then moved into artistic director. Like what Bill said, it uses a different part of my brain than my, um, my acting life or even my teaching life. I certainly incorporate them, but it uses a different part of my brain. And I, I like having to look at things in a bigger way. In a, and I just want to say something about Bill. He, he is the most astute audience member. When he gives notes to a director, he's so clear because he's always looking for understanding how to clarify and, and um, help the directors and the actors pick those or designers pick those moments out and lift them up. It's, he was a good role model for me in that thing. Um, I, I have all my life done, I was a vice president of the Screen Actors Guild. I was a, I've all, always added other tasks into my life besides just being an actor because a lot of being an actor is working on your, on your work, but it's also sitting around and waiting for the opportunity to work on your work. And I don't think that we have much time to sit around as artistic directors and being too busy is for me an ideal thing. And I also like sort of being, I know it's sounds silly, I sort of like being um, the mama bear of the theater in a funny way. I'm, I, I, I like that sense of I'm helping you guys and you're helping me and thank you. The Antias Playwrights Lab is a really important part of Antias. You know, we are a classical theater company. That's how we started. Our founder, uh, Deacon Matthews and Lillian Grogue were, were people who love the classics and they got all of their friends who love the classics, all the great actors they knew who, in LA who, who love the classics, love that kind of work to come together. And that's what Antias uh, has focused on and that's what they're, we've been known for and that's what you know, audiences and members love. Several years ago, we started a playwrights lab um, because people wanted to, and there are so many great playwrights here in Los Angeles. When you're running a classical theater company, you're, and that's the canon you're looking at, it's just, you know, obviously it's a lot of uh, white men writers. It's a lot of um, uh, plays set in you know London or um, in in country houses in uh, in, in Russia, <laughs> you know, and 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 much less stuff that's set in LA. Um, that was part of the motivation. Uh, of course, the playwrights write all kinds of things. That's, uh, I guess when we get to the zip code plays, we'll kind of mention that LA aspect in particular. But um, one of the things that's been exciting about having a playwrights lab is to, for us to deal with living playwrights because, you know, obviously Shakespeare and Chekhov don't care at this point what you do with their work. Living playwrights, it's a whole other thing. And so we have a group of playwrights who come together uh, uh, every Tuesday night. Uh, actors from our, our company uh, also join them and they read pages and, uh, and then there's a discussion back and forth about what works, what didn't work, what hit people, what didn't. And then uh, the playwrights go off and, and uh, you know, hopefully improve their plays. And uh, we've now produced, uh, we produced a series of uh, play readings um, called Lab Results every year, which are six play readings that come out of plays that have been developed in our lab and written in our lab. Um, and then this last season, for the first time, we produced two new plays that came out of the Playwrights Lab. So more and more, it's become an, um, uh, an important wing of NTS. Uh, I often look to the Oregon Shakespeare Festival in Ashland as a model because it's uh, obviously the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. They are well known for their classical work, but they have a lot of new plays there too. And they're now nearly equally as well known for that. And I think that it, it just is a great combination. Also, I would say that... Um, Actors who can handle Shakespeare and, and Chekhov and Shaw uh, are the kinds of actors that you want doing your new material as well, because they're able to really understand things in a great way. So um, it's been terrific having them, uh, having, having our actors, I think, hook up with new playwrights has just been a, a, a wonderful experience for both the writers and for the actors in the company. I would, I would say all of those things are absolutely true. And one of the th things about the lab is that Bill described what Dakin and, and uh, Lillian wanted to create when they created it. And Tias was uh, 
a part of Greek mythology, he was a Titan and he could not be defeated as long as he touched the ground, which was his mother earth. And we like, we, Dakin and Ann, because we're a wonky group of people, picked that name because as long as we could touch the ground of classical theater, uh, he could not be defeated. And then what happened in Antaeus's story is that Hercules held him over the ground and was able to defeat him because he could, you know, but as long as we can touch the theater, not, I think it doesn't just have to be Shakespeare or Chekhov or Lorca or a- any of those playwrights. It, as long as we touch the theater, as long as we keep working together, as long as we keep doing the deep dive. Um, and so the Playwrights Lab becomes extremely important because it continues to create the next um, group of great theater artists. That's how you, you do it. We had done in the past, uh, Parapolos, which was Bill's first show, was a, a new play. Uh, we had done uh, in the, before I was a member, we had done um, plays that Lillian and Dakin had written or translated. And as Bill and I came into leadership, we also did Jeffrey Hatcher's play, Cousin Bet, which was, and Jeffrey Hatcher, who's a very famous American playwright, was on the ground with us a lot, or Ken, Ken, Kenneth Cavender, whose um, adaptation of Oedipus we did, but now it's not just taking classical material and making it new, but taking, making new material that hopefully will become a classic. And that's why the lab is important, I think, too. Yeah, we're always looking at the lab as a potential place to find the next classic. Um, the writing that comes out of there uh, 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 is so terrific. Um, and, uh, I, you know, we may find, and these plays may go on to become, uh, uh, you know, this generation's like uh, Glass Menagerie or, 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 or whatnot. Bill and I and Anna Rose sort of all from different angles had this idea. Bill and Anna Rose are big podcast fans. They listen to audio stuff all the time. And uh, I was out walking with one of our board members one day and she was talking about how during the pandemic, we were doing a socially distanced walk with our masks on, hardly able to understand each other. And she said, you know, I'm listening to radio plays and, and uh, old ones and new ones. And it draws me in, it's intimate. It's like being in a theater in a way that watching, say a Zoom reading is not because there's no lag time. I'm not putting down Zoom readings, but there's something about Antias that is so, uh, cl- we're so close, it's so intimate, it's so immediate. And if you put headphones on, you have the, you have the same experience. It's, you're in, you walk into the world of the play. Um, Bill's probably better about describing how we got to the zip code plays and the radio plays, because I think he was the guy who had the zip code idea. In fact, I'm sure he is. Several years ago, uh, our Playwrights Lab put together, um, just as a fun thing to do, a 10 minute play festival. This is back when we were all, you know, before the pandemic and everything. Uh, they put together a, a festival of 10 minute plays and the prompt, as they call it in the, in the lab, you know, is they give someone an idea and, you know, you kind of riff on that as a writer. And the prompt was uh, zip codes. And so we had these 10 minute plays. Um, you know, that was probably five or six years ago that we did that. Um, so when the when the we were forced to you know shut the theater down and, and leave the you know the building, um, uh, we were looking for ways to continue on with our audiences and our actors to to carry on during this pandemic, as is every every theater in the country, uh, the world probably, um, and lots and lots of people are are doing Zoom readings, which is is, is awesome, but. Uh, we were looking for a way to recreate the experience that Antius uh, has, which is, um, it's a very intimate place. You know, you, our theater is um, only 80 some seats. You're only five rows. You're always this close to the audience. And I love seeing actors and, and plays like this close up. That's what I love. Um, and so we were looking to how can we recreate that? And to me, as a podcast fan, there are, uh, there's something very intimate about people sort of speaking into your ears. Um, it's very... It's a very, uh, I think it recreates that intimate experience. So, um, and as a classical theater, as I said, we, we end up doing lots of plays that are set in far off places. And, um, and it's harder to find, you know, classics that are set in uh, California or in Los Angeles. So in looking for something to do, we thought, why don't we have the writers in the lab? Uh, let's revisit this idea of zip codes, particularly when what, 
people told us they missed so much about Antius was the community, was coming together as a community. And so we thought, uh, what, what tells that more than our own neighborhoods, taking a look at our very own neighborhoods where we all, all live. And um, so we thought about revisiting these zip code plays, expanding them. Um, uh, yeah, and so we, we, from 10 minute plays to, to you know, like 30 minute plays. Um, playwrights in the lab um, pitched zip codes and ideas to us, and we we chose six of them. We'd have a, a, a very diverse group of zip codes, and, and then they went off and wrote them, and uh, we recorded them, and that's a, a whole thing I guess we can probably explain uh, in a bit. But um, the, the idea was to celebrate uh, the diversity of our own neighborhoods and our own city, especially when we're kind of locked down and you know, we, you, you, you can't take a trip to New York or Paris or, or, or Tokyo, you know, you're here. And so let's look at our, our own city and our own surroundings and our own communities and celebrate those. And that's kind of where the idea of the zip code plays came from. And that's where the idea of doing them as audio plays rather than on Zoom, uh, but as something that we can listen to while we're walking around those neighborhoods or walking around our own neighborhoods. Um, uh, and 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 trying to recapture the the intimacy that that we feel um, is um, representative of Antius. And at, at some point while we were kicking this idea around about how we were going to do it, which is a much longer conversation, we realized that people could explore LA from anywhere in the world. Uh, one small example is I have an Irish friend who lives in Wexford, and he and his wife and two daughters were going to come to LA this year for the first time when we were going to show them around LA. And now he's very excited that zip code plays are dropping because he and um, his wife and kids are going to be walking around. They'll still have a chance from Ireland to take a walking tour of LA. They'll just do it in an auditory way, which is, I think, magical. I, I think that we can take the Antius theaters uh, work and it can go anywhere in the world now, not just to people who would show up in Glendale on a Sunday afternoon or a Friday night or whatever. I think that's, that, that occurred to us about, I don't know, a day into pitching back and forth to each other, how important that was. When we started this process, we realized we couldn't do it with the kind of um, grace and skill that we wanted unless Jeff would come, Jeff Gardner, who's our um, well, Bill will describe everything he does because it's extraordinary. We couldn't do it without his uh, working on it. So we went to him and we said, how can we do this? What will work? What won't work? And he uh, created a, a method. He, he bought, purchased a full package of sound equipment to make a little personal sound studio for every actor. He found the clean feed, which is a way for him to record everybody's, all the actors are working at the same time in the safety of their own homes, but the feed, they each have their own feed. So he can, uh, like you would do on a film or television set, or if you're doing LA theater works or whatever, he could um, edit them so that they, it was as if they were all in the same room and that the audience who was listening on their headphones were together. And then most miraculously, he created um, full video explanations of how to set up and break down this thing and how to get your computer to work on clean feed and how, how to do all of that. And then he tested it out on Bill and I, who may be the two biggest Luddites in America. So it was great because if we could do the setup, we figured our actors could do the setup. And then with the patience of a saint, he walked each person through and every time there was an emergency, for instance, Harry Groner and Don Dinowick, who are each, who are a married couple and each in one of these uh, zip code plays, their internet during the huge heat wave, their internet failed. They had electricity, but no internet. So he somehow set up a hotspot and was able to get as good of a recording as if their regular internet service was working. And Bill will tell you more about his, um, is everything else because he's mm. a god. When we tried to uh, to actually make these zip code plays happen, once the uh, the writing was done and the casting was done and the uh, director was done, we had to figure out a way to actually accomplish the recording because obviously during COVID we couldn't bring people together in the theater to record together. So um, 
We are absolutely blessed to have an amazing sound designer. He's our audio producer, sound designer, and Foley artist. And, you know, Foley is, you know, making, <laughs> making noises that aren't, aren't there. Uh, um, horse hooves and, uh, you know, car doors and whatnot. Um, he does all those things. In, uh, in addition to being an amazing actor in our uh, ensemble, Jeff Gardner, we all, you know, we all worship him. He's fantastic. Um, so he put together a, um, a package that includes microphone, cables, a, uh, a, a little tripod thing that has a kind of a, uh, it's like a sound booth, a, a portable sound booth basically with, uh, you know, baffling so that people can speak and sound right. Cords that have to go into your computer and then and we recorded on something called clean feed, which is better than Zoom because there is no video feed so that the audio feed is stronger. Um, but everyone, that means all the actors remotely in their house had to learn how to um, plug in the cables, download clean feed, put the settings at the correct place. Um, and Jeff Gardner came up with all these things so we could put together a package for each actor. Each play has three actors in it. Um, our wonderful um, uh, executive assistant, Jade Mujayas, uh drove to each actor's house and dropped a package off for them. Jeff Gardner made uh, instructional videos on how to set the whole thing up. Uh, and um, after they were finished, um, they, the actors packed the stuff back up. Jade picked the stuff back up. They left it sitting for a, a couple of days. They disinfected it and then they brought it to the next set of actors. Um, so it was a big operational kind of, uh, uh, you know, logistical puzzle to put all the pieces together so we could get everybody there together at the same time. Um, yeah, Kitty is right. We, 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 Kitty and I did a test run with all this stuff. I'll kind of show you the setup because I got a little picture here that you can kind of see. There's a little, little, this is the microphone and the, and the, and the sort of baffled little, little, you know, <laughs> little room to speak in. Um, and then somehow magically, Jeff uh, and, and uh, with uh, Adam Macias, our, our, um, our sound editor, put these things together and it, sounds like the people are in the same place it's absolutely amazing there are some uh, there's some kissing there's some fighting in the zip code plays and the people sound like they are in the same place it's absolutely I, I don't know how they did it it's amazing um but that's how we did this uh, to to try to make all, all of it work together uh, and make uh, remotely situated uh, safe actors um sound like they are in the same zip code and i also have to say Jeff has a long working relationship with the composer, Ellen Mandel, who's done a bunch of shows for us. And Ellen and Jeff together, the music that she created and then he wove into it is extraordinary. They're such a good team. My first experience with the two of them working together was being on stage in Picnic and the world that they created was so specific. And once again, Ellen has really she and Jeff work together so seamlessly. It, it just enhances everything that he has done and all the actors and the directors and the writers have done. We also are lucky to have Ramon Diocampo as our host and he is the host of the entire Zip Code Plays project. Um, and so he speaks at the beginning and the end of each episode, giving us little context, little information and introducing each of the plays. And he is an, a wonderful actor and uh, award-winning audiobook narrator. So we're very, very lucky to have Ramon on board as the host of this entire project. Well, each play is uh, totally different. And I think what's um, exciting about them is that they come in a real variety of uh, styles and genres. We, um, you know, we, all we did was, all we did was uh, uh, um, pick the playwrights uh, from the pitches that we, we received and, um, and the zip codes. And we wanted zip codes from all over, uh, all over Los Angeles. And then we let the writers do what they wanted. Um, there was no other um, note from us except for to, again, strengthen their voice and make their voice um, as clear as possible. So we have um, some magical realism and we have some historical fiction and we have uh, some things that are based on true stories and we've got a little piece of satire. So they're all different. Um, as you travel around Los Angeles, uh, not only will you be moving between different um, geographical locations, but you'll be moving through different genres. Uh, I think that's really exciting. As we met with each of the playwrights, we, we narrowed it down and we met with each of the playwrights to, to talk to them. Most of these playwrights I've known for years because I do often go to lab, but we were so, what we thought we would walk into a meeting and hear from these playwrights would often 
completely uh, surprises. For instance, Santa Monica, uh, Plucker, when we met with Nana, who's the, is the playwright, we had no idea that we were going to scream with laughter through the entire meeting. She was just so um, deliciously funny. And we were so excited then after that play. And with each meeting, we were meeting with Kari Wyatt and learning about uh, what happened in South Central at the end of, of World War II as writers, uh, as uh, black American writers were often leaving and going uh, to France where they were more welcome and what happens in this family. And it was fascinating to us to learn more about that history. So with each one, we got more and more excited because each of these playwrights brought something to our attention and to the party that we had no concept about. So that was, that's exciting. And, and that's true for all six playwrights and all six plays. You can listen to the zip code plays in any order, but we have an order that we uh, kind of put them in. So the first play is uh, South Central um, by Kari Wyatt, South Central Los Angeles. And it is a, a piece uh, set in um, 1953 um, when uh, Central Avenue uh, had was just coming off of being a thriving neighborhood and just beginning to, to change. Um, and it's a, it's a really interesting historical piece that talks about um, uh, race relations in Los Angeles and in the world. Um, uh, I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's funny. It's uh, a little dark. Uh, it's a little sexy and it is. It's, very um, it's not a little sexy. It's very sexy. Just saying. And it, 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 it touches on an interesting history of Los Angeles that a lot of people wouldn't know. The second play is set in Pacific Palisades by Alex Goldberg. It is a very interesting, based on true story, crazy true story, a little piece of, uh, an odd little piece of uh, LA historical uh, anomaly. It's just a strange little story. Uh, and so it's based on a true thing of something um, that happened in the Palisades uh, in, on the verge of World War II. And so I think people will want to tune in to find out like what kind of odd things were happening in the Palisades at that time. The third play is um, Santa Monica by Nana Agrawal. And it is a satirical piece based on a true thing that happened to her, an actual <laughs> event that happened to her. Uh, in Santa Monica, and it, it really just pokes fun at the kind of pretensions that uh, one finds in Los Angeles, <laughs> and and some of those uh, some of those stereotypes about Los Angeles that uh, you know are a little bit true. Um, and I think it's a very funny little piece of satire. The fourth play is set in Westwood, and it is by Deb Height, and it is um, it's in an interesting genre of like found materials. It is um, uh, it is items that have been uh, tape recordings that had been found in an FBI file uh, on, an, uh, on a woman who's uh, become a, a newly old, a new protester in the, in the social justice world. Uh, and um, it's uh, as if as, as in the Blair Witch Project and so far as like it's found material uh, and it's uh, set in Westwood. The next play is uh, Set in Sun Valley, and it's by Steve Serpus. And it is a really interesting uh, relationship story between two people um, in a, set in an auto junkyard, two people who have um, uh, a lot of coincidence has reconnected them, and they kind of come together and find a little bit of salvation in, uh, uh, far out in the valley. And the last play is Downtown Los Angeles by, um, by Angela J. Davis, and it is... Um, a really, it's a piece of magical realism. It is a little fantasia uh, where some historical figures come back to life in Los Angeles and sort of set in a swirling world high above the city of angels. We take a look at um, grace and kindness and forgiveness. And it's a, kind of a perfect ending for uh, this series of our zip code plays. I think, uh... The thing about these plays that I, I want people to take away is that they might learn something. Uh, they might uh, have a new experience of audio that they didn't have before, but more importantly, I want them to have a really good time. I want them to feel like they are back in the Antius community, that they're part of this, that they're welcomed into our world. And because uh, I think the art is so good, what those writers and actors and directors and Jeff and Ellen and Adam have created is so good that I. I want them to walk away and say, 
and TS doing uh, the kind of top level work we expect from them. And I want them to come back. I want them to feel like the theater is gonna come back. It's gonna survive and it's gonna be fine. That's what, that's my personal goal. I just can't say enough because I didn't really do anything except work with the, everybody to help facilitate this. I can't say how excited I am about how good these plays are. I'm so thrilled. And I, I want the audience to know that we put our heart and soul into it. Well, I think people must listen to the zip code plays because what we're missing in the theater world today, what the audience are missing is community and, and coming together. We can't do that now. That is the, the point. You know, we're, we're all on Zoom calls all day, you know, all, all of us. And um, it's great. And uh, thank goodness it, it, it works as well as it does. But it is not the same as being together. Uh, now, the zip code plays are not going to quite bring us together, but you must hear them because does bring us together. It, it is people doing theater in your ear. They are speaking right to your soul. That's why you must listen to it. We don't have any plans to bring these particular zip code plays to the stage. So these were written for uh, this audio purpose. We're absolutely hoping to, to produce plays written by playwrights within our lab, but these zip code plays were written specifically to be recorded uh, for this purpose. I want to do I want to do another edition of the Zip Code Plays very badly. Uh, I just want to dive in and do more. We'll see what happens and how long, you know, we are not on our stage uh, in the traditional sense. But uh, to my mind, there's a number of good reasons to continue the Zip Code Plays. There are um, lots more Zip Codes to do and speak about um, and stories to tell. And we've done the hard work of trying to figure out how to do it remotely, how to accomplish it. Mm -hmm. You know, figuring out the microphones and the cables and the platform and all that uh, was the hard part. Now we've got, now we know how to do it. So um, I feel like it would be kind of a shame if we didn't continue. Uh, I would go one further and say, my big hope is that even after the world opens up, maybe we'll continue to find ways to do these, these audio plays because I, I think one of the things that we've learned during the pandemic is people are, are craving this, this kind of culture, and people are more and more and more listening to podcasts. So uh, I think it's a, a way for the future, uh, even when the, the theater is back up and running and audiences are coming in. Another great thing about, uh, about these audio plays and releasing them in a podcast format is that one, they're free. Anyone can listen to them. There's no barrier to, uh, as there often is for theater tickets and people can't afford them. Also, you can listen to these uh, anywhere and any time you like. So uh, uh, if you're not near Glendale, where our theater is located, if you um, are not free um, you know, in the evenings when we do shows, all the many reasons that might uh, be barriers that keep people from attending the theater, uh, all of that is available uh, for free on um, either our website or any of the places where people get their podcasts from. And so I, I hope it will be something that is sort of tears down barriers that may keep people from attending theater or from getting to know Antius. And that could be a great thing. I'm going to add one anecdotal story because I, I love it so much that we did Nambi E. Kelly's adaptation of Native Son, which was spectacular and thrilling. We did it in our theater and we then transferred it to the we were lucky enough to be picked for um, for Block Party, which is part of the Center Theater Group's uh, new play festival that they do, picking theaters, picking plays from from small theaters in LA every year at the Kirk Douglas. But at Antius, our actors said to us, came to us in the middle of of previews and said, "This play is a uh, a lot emotionally and." Uh, in every other way. And our audience needs to talk about it and we need to talk about it. So because of the size we are, where we were small enough and large enough, every single night the actors came on stage and sat there and the, most of the audience would sit there and they would have a, a talk back, but really it was a communal experience. And I think that's the kind of thing that Antius provides that very few uh, uh, big institutional theaters can. and um, small uh, uh, intimate theaters also find difficult to do. That's an anecdote that I think says so much about who Antius is and who our audience is. My, my sort of big overarching answer is always that I believe art changes lives, that um, 
that coming to the theater humanizes us in a way and teaches us empathy. And not only is it a rousing good time, and uh, uh, it's the only place I've ever been in my life where the artists and the audience members mingle constantly. We have a real, uh, Bill talked a lot about community. I talked a lot about community, but at Antius, we really, we really embrace the idea that, that after the show, you're gonna, the same actor that you saw on NYPD Blue as a series regular, you're gonna hang out with in the lobby and chat with afterwards and talk about art and life and what they just experienced and what the actor experienced at the same time. And so that's the first thing, art changes lives, whether it's in our arts education program, whether it's coming to the theater, whether it's listening to zip code plays. Um, the other thing is, it's just a really nice place to be. I, I gotta say, I'm proud of the art, but I'm also proud of the world that we live in and the world we're trying to create for the future that's um, inclusive and uh, diverse and exciting and um, humanizing and all of the things that I think art should be. I think people should get involved with Antius because it is a real artistic home, uh, not just for the actors uh, who work there, but for our audiences um, as well. I like to think that we um, sit in a very sweet spot and that we are uh, big enough that we can kind of, I think, create uh, world-class art uh, and, and, and support that in, a, in, a, in the way it needs to be supported, but small enough that uh, as an audience member, you matter. It, um, you know, uh, uh, seeing a show in a big ginormous theater is, is f fabulous. Um, but we're able to create something that's uh, much more intimate, much more personal. Uh, when you come to Antias uh, and you hang out in the lobby afterwards and, and talk to people, you, you get to hang out with the actors. You even meet them and your voice matters and your interest matters. And you, we're there and you can talk to us and, uh, you know, one on one. And, and uh, if you have an idea for something great to, or play that needs to be done, uh, we're excited to hear it. it you you have uh, it's a more of a hands-on experience than I think you can get at a lot of places. So small enough where you matter and big enough where the art is, I think, world class. Right now, we're trying to concentrate on what we can do right now and be ready when the world opens up. I'm sure NTS will survive the the, the plague. Uh, as the London theater survived the plague in Shakespeare's time and um, theater survived the 1918 uh, flu pandemic. Um, but in the meantime, we want to make sure that people have access to art and community and work and joy and laughter and all of those things. So uh, it's yes and. Yes, we intend to open the theater uh, as soon as it's safe and possible and makes sense. But in the meantime, we want to keep bringing art to all of our constituencies and making art because that's who we are. Hi, I'm Kitty Swank. I'm the co-artistic director of Antia's Theater. And if you enjoyed this conversation, I hope you did, please go to our website, www.antias.org. That's A-N-T-A-E-U-S. Hi, I'm Bill Brocktrip. I'm co-artistic director of Antias Theater Company. And if you enjoyed this conversation, please check out the zip code plays available uh, for free on um, either our website or any of the places where people get their podcasts from.
my process for writing plays, really it can be sparked by anything, the initial idea. I mean, in general, I deal with issues of, of race and class, societal structures, uh, really the pursuit of love, not necessarily romantic, although it can be that within certain characters in certain pieces, but just in general. How do we treat each other right? Why do we feel the way we feel? How do we arrive at our conclusions? How do we change? How do we grow? How do we not? And why? So I could be watching, uh, you know, some cable news, or I could be uh, on the street taking a walk and the bus drives by with an ad for something and it sparks an idea. Usually for me, dialogue is first, like a character will just start talking to me. I'll have an idea in my mind of things that I usually talk about. And then some character would just say, hey, blah, 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 blah. And I write that down and then another character will say, blah, 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 blah. And then we're off and running. It's, it's, you know, and it, after, after that initial bolt of energy, then I'm like, okay, let me start to shape this. What, what, am I, what are these characters, what is this story actually about? And from that point, I'll go back and start new and go forward until I have a draft. This is Kari Wyatt, playwright. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about my play and the other zip code plays that my piece is a part of and support Antaeus Theater Company, watch this video. I think they chose podcasts right now because that's kind of the, the latest zeitgeist. Like a lot of places are doing audio plays, and I think it was a way for uh, Antaeus to incorporate actors and directors and use a different form than people have been used to previously. And for me, I loved it. Actually, it was always a dream of mine to have an audio play. When I was growing up as a kid, I used to go to books, when I would go to bookstores and buy books, certain bookstores also sold tapes of old time radio shows. And I used to buy those and listen to them. You know, I go home and I wait till the night and I would turn off all the lights and put this tape in my boom box and I would listen to this, you know, this audio play from 1945 or 1948 or 1955, you know, The Shadow and Suspense Theater and all of those types of things, you know, Jack Benny. And I'm like, oh, wow, this is awesome because it sparks so much imagination in the listener, you know, what are they wearing? What do they look like? How tall is that guy? You know, what does that woman really look like? You know, what kind of car is that that drove that you heard the horn honk? You know, what's actually happening in the city? What, what's that block look like? What's that house look like? So it really, even though you're getting a story and you're getting a beginning, middle and end and you, and you have all the sound effects and whatever music cues are involved, it really, in an easy way, makes the listener a part of the story. You're, you're in that club. You're in that house when that burglar comes, you know, you are next to that ghost who is next to the guy who you're listening to. You're in that, you're in that field when the aliens are coming down, <laughs> you know? So it makes the, it makes the listener a part of the story. You're an actor in that story. Your imagination is drawing you into that story and it's because it's just voices and, 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 and effects, you know? So it, it, and it was always a dream of mine, so when I got selected, I was overjoyed because so, I had been thinking actually do one on my own and, and fund it. And lo and behold, this opportunity came. And so, thank God. The idea came originally uh, Kitty Swink and Bill Brocktrup, the artistic directors of the Antaeus, put out a call to the Playwrights Lab that they were going to be doing audio plays based around zip codes in Los Angeles. And the idea basically was to give people slices of different areas of the city, slices of life from different areas of the city. And I chose for my pitch, South Central Los Angeles, you know, predominantly black area of town, black brown area of town. I felt like that was a place I would like to focus my story. And so I submitted the pitch by the deadline, which was this past summer in July and I was blessed to be selected. And from there, the idea basically came about because I read a book by Donald Bogle, who's a historian, film and film historian, film and television historian, black man, 
called Bright Boulevard, Bold Dreams. And the book basically encapsulated the history of black Hollywood from the 1920s up until like the late 1950s and all the people in and around black Hollywood and all the businesses and own business owners and things such as that in this section of Central Avenue around the Dunbar Hotel specifically, which was like the hub of black life in Los Angeles up through about the late 40s. You know, in the early 50s until integration happened. And then people started to, you know, drift to other parts of the city to live, to go to clubs on Sunset Strip and other places in Los Angeles, which kind of killed the community. A lot of businesses closed down and things just changed. People moved out of the neighborhood. Things went downhill. Crime got raised up by that. And so I thought of that book and I'm like, you know what? Let me talk about people of that time period the late 50s when things had changed and just give people a, a, a slice of life of a, a few characters from this neighborhood. And so that's where the idea came from originally out of that book and wanting to incorporate that area of the city and incorporate also a little bit of history, not just of that area, but of America in that time period. It's about a black man who wants to be an author who went to Paris and returns from Paris after a year, a year and a half, and finds the wife that he left is not the same woman that he left behind. And so that's the, that's the crux of it. And what happens when he returns and finds that his wife is different, has changed, has been changed by what's going on in America. And her reaction to how he has changed from actually pursuing his dream somewhere else without her and then returning into the mix. I would love for the audience to get out of the play a sense of the time, the late 1950s in this particular community, how things changed in the broad sense how individuals could have been affected in another sense because of the racism of the time, because of the, the blocks, the roadblocks to opportunities, to dreams, and also historical context for what was going on in America in a broader sense. Without giving away too much, part of what's going on in the play is related to the Montgomery bus boycott in Alabama. And there's a plot point that deals with what's happening in South Central and its relation to the Montgomery bus boycott in Alabama. So I want people to get a sense of the time and space, the racial climate, the social climate through these individual characters and how much is relatable to what's going on today. Unfortunately, although a lot of things have gotten better, the undergird of racism has remained. And now it seems like we're going a little bit, not even a little bit, we're going backwards. And now it's become suitable again for the racists to be loud about it. And we have someone in the White House who's supposedly supposed to be the leader of America who purposely, I believe he is a white nationalist, and this is why he does what he does. But at the very least, Curry wants to curry favor with white nationalism because they support him. And because they support him, he doesn't want to do anything or say anything against that. I think that he doesn't say anything against it because he is that. <clears throat> as a Department of Justice lawsuit against him and his father for housing discrimination all the way back in the 70s attests. So that's what I want people to get out of it. How things, the, the climate of the times and how it's relatable to today. You know, the other playwrights, I've known them through the Playwrights Lab, so I know how extremely talented they are. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how they handle the subject matter in their plays. You know, us... Uh, Angela J. Davis, Nana Agrawal, Deb Height, uh, Alex Goldberg, and Steve Surpass. And their, and their zip codes run the gamut from Santa Monica, 
Sun Valley, Pacific Palisades, downtown Los Angeles, and uh, Westwood. And there are various, some are, ma some are magical realism, some are historical, and I'm really looking forward to see how they handled those stories. I don't want to give away their stuff, but I just wanted to mention them because, you know, some, there's some, besides my play, there's five other great plays that are coming to you. I would love for, for the audience to come and find my play and the other Zip Code plays because what you're going to get is a diverse group of voices in age, ethnicity, talking about various characters specific to the zip codes that they deal with and the areas of town that they deal with in Los Angeles. And if you're an Angelino, some things are going to be familiar. You're going to learn some things about areas of the city that you didn't know. And if you're from out of the, out of, out of the city, across the country, you're going to learn some stuff about Los Angeles, historical things that some things I was surprised to learn in other people's plays. And so I, I feel like you're going to get a diverse body, age, gender, ethnicity, and some really compelling characters. And within those characters and extending outward, stories that pull you in. Hey, this is Kari Wyatt, playwright. And I just want you to come and, and, and support the Zip Code Plays produced by Antaeus Theater Company, uh, debuting on November 12th on various podcast systems, Spotify, Apple, and also on the Antaeus website. And you can hear slices of Los Angeles through myself and five other wonderful plays from five other playwrights uh, who are based here in Los Angeles and doing theater here in Los Angeles. And we would love your support. And so I think the arts have a, have a power to make us better human beings and better communicators with ourselves and with those around us. I mean, they, they, it's a cliche thing to say that the arts are a mirror of society, but I think it's a cliche because it's true. So, um, and in terms of supporting the arts, I mean, support can mean a lot of things, right? Um, um, for the, fortunate few, um, it means financially supporting. Um, in this particular instance with the zip code plays, these are being rolled out free of charge to anyone who wants to hear them um, in this audio format. And I do think that, um, again, I mean, there, there, is, there is a gift that is being given 
to Los Angeles through that. It's something to talk about. It's something to experience, even though we can experience it in the privacy of our own homes. Hi, I'm Angela J. Davis. I'm a Los Angeles-based writer, and it was my sheer joy to be one of the authors of the Zip Code Plays. I think what Antias did, um, which I really appreciate, was they looked around and thought, um, so much is happening with Zoom theater, and as, as great as it is that people are doing that, maybe we should try something a little different. And what they decided, I mean, you'll have to talk to them to get their version of it, but from my vantage point, what it looked like they were deciding was to do something that could be done in the COVID environment um, but would still be theater at the highest levels. And so they decided to produce a series of radio plays. And, and they called on members of the lab, the, the playwrights who were already members of the lab to submit proposals for individual plays. And I really owe a debt of gratitude to Antius because I hadn't even, I, I didn't really have it in my head to be writing a play specifically for radio. Um, but when they put out the call, I just thought, oh, this is a great opportunity. Um, around the same time that they put out the call, there were um, massive um, demonstrations about social justice and historical, um, historical wrongs that needed to be addressed, including including with the toppling of statues. And I've always been fascinated by statues. Um, and of course they're all over Central Park in New York, um, but they're also in Los Angeles. They're not as plentiful, but we do have statues in Los Angeles, including um, in downtown LA, in front of the original train station, Union Station in downtown LA, There's a, there was a very large statue of Father Junipero Serra, um, who is a controversial person right now, but regardless of how you view Junipero Serra, it's undeniable that he had a profound impact on California history. Um, practically every city name and state name um, is traceable to the Spanish conquest and Junipero Serra's missions. Um, and his statue was um, toppled by protesters in June of this year. And I was kind of fascinated by the statues in our midst and how they impact our consciousness. And, um, and I was also fascinated by um, the good and the bad that can flow from historical people in history who tried to do good and so what happens in the play is a little bit of magic. Um, around the same time that Unipro Serra's statue was toppled, interestingly enough, there was a comet circling the um, atmosphere called, um, wonderfully named comet called the Neowise. Okay. The Neowise Comet um, was also kind of close to California, right around the time that Unipro Serra's statue was toppled. And it's, it's gorgeous. I mean, if you see pictures of it from called capable photographers, it's quite a scene to, just to see the comet up in the sky looking like it might be headed uh, for Earth. And so in my play, it's a a bit of a fantasy with a kernel of seriousness. But what happens is the comet, in fact, stirs up the particulate atmosphere of Los Angeles and some of the statues in Los Angeles, including Unip Rosera, who's been knocked to the ground, um, come back to life. And, and the play is about what happens next after the, after the statues come back to life. Um, I try to keep it fun. And I will say that um, I hope <laughs> the actors and directors had fun working on it. Um, and um, it's also, you know, it's, there's a kernel of seriousness. I, I think the best comedy 
does have a kernel of seriousness. So I, I hope that that's there and that people see it. Um, and I, I just, you know, I, I hope people enjoy it. It really, this is an embarrassment of riches. I just felt incredibly fortunate to be part of this project. And um, starting with the NTS company, which I've already talked about and which I love and love them just as an audience member, just purely as a consumer, I think they're a wonderful, wonderful company. Um, and I would go to see their plays and have gone to see their plays before I was at all working with them. Um, so the, I'll start with the director, um, Steve Robman, who I have worked with before, um, is just a terrific um, theater director who also has a tremendous amount of experience in television. Um, if you pick any primetime TV show from about the mid nineties onward, um, he probably directed it <laughs> at least one or two episodes. Um, and um, I was the first time that I met Steve, I was actually even a little bit worried because I knew the caliber of people that he had worked with before. And I, I was a little nervous about meeting his standards, um, but he's a, incredibly hard worker. Um, he's got decades of experience in both theater and film. He's also directed at, he's directed main stage productions at Antius and also um, at the Geffen in Los Angeles and at East Coast theaters, including the Long Wharf. Um, and he was also a director at, um, at the O'Neill. Um, National Theatre Institute. So it was, it's a thrill to work with him. And what's wonderful about him is that um, he never ever phones it in. Um, he is a workaholic um, and has the work ethic of a genius who is fresh out of college and working on his first play and making sure he makes a good impression. I mean, he's just got a consummate, terrific work ethic, which is great. And he also reads scripts incredibly closely. Um, I mean, he would call me or text me saying, oh, you, you have this line here and um, maybe you could set it up a little bit better or there, there's an inconsistency and, and just going over the script with a fine tooth comb many times, which is a gift, I think, to a writer. Um, some writers get irritated with that. I view it as this gift to me that a director is reading my script so closely. Um, the actors, uh, um, so it's a cast of three, and um, Abigail Marks, or Abby Marks, plays Clara Shortridge Foltz. I've seen Abby in other productions um, at Antius and also at South Coast Repertory. Um, she's a terrific actress, great Shakespearean actress, and can do comedy and and, and serious drama, which is one thing that I was looking for because Clara Shortridge Fultz was essentially, um, I like to think of her as the mother of the California justice system. She was California's first female lawyer. And so she has kind of a 19th century spirit about her, um, but at the same time, she's very much ahead of her time. Um, she is obviously in favor of women having the vote, but she's also in favor of women being lawyers and being able to be licensed as lawyers and enter a courtroom, which was not permissible. That, that was an avenue not open to women until she came along. She's a true historical figure. That's who Abby plays. And uh, I knew she would be terrific and it was a joy to work with her. Um, Father Enip Rosera, who does come back to life, is played by Tony Amendola, another um, just terrific Shakespearean actor. And one of the things about Father Enip Rosera is I tried to give him his own voice. Um, he is a historical figure right now who's getting attention um, and, and a lot of opinion. Um, defending him, um, attacking him. And there's a lot, you know, there, there's a lot being said on all sides of Unipro Sarah. 
And what I try to do in the play is let him speak for himself and, and try to, I try very hard to, fully, to, 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 to give him a voice um, that would be his own. Um, and and that's, that's kind of what I, I try to do with him. And I also, um, the play begins with him um, having been knocked to the ground and waking up inside his statue. So he's in a little bit of pain and discomfort. Um, he's also been asleep inside his statue for a very long time. So it's news to him that California is no longer part of Spain. Um, so, uh, you know, and I try to give him his own voice. And then there is of course a talking bear. It's Kelly Luis Duarte I, and who's wonderful. Um, who has this um, larger than life, um, he, he is a newer member of Antios and I had actually not known his work before. And Antios suggested him to um, both the director and myself saying, oh, you know, he's perfect for this, he's perfect. And, and there is something about Kelly um, that, that indeed is just perfect for this role because he's a big guy, which obviously doesn't necessarily come across in a radio play. But I think you can sort of feel um, both in the way that he handled the role and also in him as a person, you can feel this sort of solidity and heft. Um, and the other thing that I loved about Kelly is I, I watched a reel of his other work and he can be scary and a little threatening and menacing like a, a giant bear, which this is, but he also has this wonderful warmth about him and this humor and this love for life, which is what the character needed. And I think um, Kelly was terrific in bringing those things to the role. And, he, and I think he was having fun with it, which I really, I mean, I, I hope all actors have fun with my writing, but but particularly a talking bear, you want that actor to be having a good time with the role. And I did notice in rehearsals, he seemed to be um, ha ha having fun with the role and, and really embracing it. Um, and the bear, um, I will say that the bear is kind of the soul um, of the play. And uh, the bear um, um, has a lot to say to the human counterparts. And he has some criticisms of them, um, but he also has some wisdom. He has big ears <laughs> and, and he's been listening to a lot of things for a very long time. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, the bear is kind of the soul of the play and he's, he's a little bit childish. Um, he is an animal, but he's an animal who talks. And uh, the play explains how he got to talk. I hope that they enjoy it. <laughs> um, and you know, if there is a serious message in the play, there, you know, there's, um, there's something that the bear tells the humans to do at the end of the play. And, um, and it's, it's a very simple message. Um, and, uh, you know, the bear is in some ways better than us, right? Uh, you know, I, I, I sometimes think animals are better than humans in their innocence and uh, um, honesty. <laughs> um, I mean, obviously, animals didn't write the ninth symphony or get a rocket ship to Mars. And there, there are ways in which human intelligence and creativity are irreplaceable. Um, but there's an innocence and a childlike um, zest for life that animals have. And this character has that. And I kind of give him a message at the end. Um, and, and also Clara, um, has a little bit of a follow-up message that uh, Sarah joins her in. You know, they, they, they end up agreeing with each other about something. So I, I think in the final moments of the play, there's kind of a, 
a little kernel of seriousness. I, I, I hope that they enjoy it. The play is written to be enjoyed. Um, and there's a, I think a sweet and um, life affirming uh, message at the end. I'm looking forward to all of them. I'm, you know, I'm, I, I have great respect for these other writers and I'm really grateful to be um, among them. Don, I can't wait. I, I feel like I'm an audience member here just as much as anyone else because I have not, I, I, I know as much as you know about the other plays. I've seen the descriptions that are online and I know who the actors are. There are some terrific actors in those other plays and there are some terrific writers and directors behind them. So I'm really looking forward to all of that. Um, the one other thing that I will just mention is um, one commonality through all the plays is Jeff Gardner, the sound designer who is a genius. Um, he, he's done magnificent work and I was thrilled to get a chance to work with him because I knew his work from LA Theater Works and purely, purely as a consumer and an audience member, I absolutely adore LA Theater Works. And Jeff had done, and I think still does, a lot of the sound effects for LA Theater Works and he's just an absolute master. And the way that he does it, you really feel like this moment is unfolding in front of you. Um, and, you know, whether it's the clink of dinnerware or glasses of wine between two characters or a car starting. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking for, I'm really looking forward to hearing not only the plays, but also um, Jeff's work. And there's also going to, there's music going through the plays. I'm really looking forward to hearing that. Um, it was it's, it was really an amazing undertaking. One of the things that was done was because of COVID, the actors were not going to go into a studio, right? Which is normally what you would do if you were going to record professional quality radio plays. You would have them in a sound studio. Um, Jeff built these contraptions, which was kind of like a little box on top of a tripod so that the actor would sound isolated and so that the, the subliminal noises that none of us would ever notice would be identical as between the different actors, even though they were in different locations. I mean, it was, it was really terrific. And uh, there, there's actually a, there's a video on the NTS website right now about that process. And I, I think it's fascinating that they were able to do that. I think that one of the wonderful things that NTS has done here is they have found a way to make theater and to make it at a time when it's very difficult because of COVID-19 and the limitations that all of us have. And it's really um, a gift that they are giving um, to Los Angeles. Um, that to, th these plays are free, by the way, there's no charge for viewing the plays. Um, I believe um, they got a grant from, there was a generous grant from a nonprofit organization that helped them with the professional quality rendering of these readings. Um, but it's really, um, it's really kind of a gift that's there for the taking um, because the, the plays will be available on their website and also um, on major podcast platforms. You don't have to buy a ticket. You don't have to leave your house. And uh, there's some of the most wonderful actors and directors and sound engineer that you can find got together to, to do this. So it's, it's a generous thing that they're doing. Hi, I'm Angela J. Davis. I'm a Los Angeles based writer. And it was my sheer joy to be one of the authors of the zip code plays. And they are going to be available beginning November 12th for free um, to anyone who wants to hear them 
on the NTS Theatre Company website, as well as on um, all major plat podcast platforms. What attracts me to the form of plays, in a weird way, I feel like you, you can almost do anything in a play, um, which is odd because in a film, of course, you can do anything, but you're so removed from it in, in a, with a film, whereas in theater when you go to a play and they do something really theatrical it's it's transcendent it it changes you um and so i love that element of playwriting that said not all of my plays have uh, you know magical um moments um or or amazing theatrical tricks um but they're is something ab about writing for a space in a certain amount of time that things happen right in front of people that feels like a puzzle that I need to solve. And I love puzzles. Hi, I'm Deb Height. And if you'd like to learn a little bit about me and my podcast play, please continue to watch this video. Uh, so when the, the prompt went out to, um, to propose this, um, I felt like I felt really excited. And that was also nice to feel <laughs> excited about an opportunity this year like this. Um, and then to be selected for it was just a lifesaver. When I first moved to Los Angeles from New York, I was working for a while as a uh, organizer, like a personal organizer. People would hire me to come and, oh, it, it ran the gamut. Um, but there was one woman that hired me and she lived in one of those high rise apartments in Westwood and she was lovely. And um, she was probably in her mid eighties, um, had lived a very small but happy life and for a very long time in this apartment. And so she had hired me to help go through a bunch of stuff that she had uh, um, accumulated over the years. Um, and so I got to know her a little bit and I was surprised that she could, to me, it was, she could have been living in any little college town in anywhere. Her, her world really was, uh, limited to UCLA, where she'd worked for her whole career and her apartment. Um, and she was, was fine. She was, 
she was very happy and it was fine. But it was I, it was interesting because I think, well, you live in LA, you have you have this um, broad in all these broad interests, and you go here and go there, and you have all these interesting friends. And her world was very small, and it always sort of stuck with me. Um, and there's a little bit of a running theme in my work of awakening people who have been maybe sleepwalking through their life a little bit um, and fine, but something happens that makes them realize that there is a lot more to life or there's a bigger world out there than they might have realized or they need to be awakened to uh, some aspect of their world that is keeping them from being happy. Um, and uh, earlier this year, a friend of mine had attended a peaceful protest that um, had turned not peaceful. And um, his experience in the aftermath of just um, understanding um, how how uh, volatile the situation can be, um, who are the good guys and who are the bad guys, um, how a movement can be hijacked, how people who are trying to keep the peace m maybe have other motives um, and just how fraught um, those, those situations can be. And um, so I thought of what if there was a, a woman who was older who maybe wanted to get involved for the companionship as much as anything, who wanted, who wanted to feel like part of a bigger movement and really uh, did not understand how complicated things would get. And um, so, so that was sort of the, the kernel of Westwood. Um, and when I learned that the FBI headquarters, an FBI headquarter office is in Westwood, I thought, oh yeah, that's my neighborhood for this play. Um, I felt compelled to write it because um, there's this great saying, if you genuinely need to tell a story, there's genuinely someone who needs to hear it. And this year, I also learned, uh, I, I created an addendum for that, which is, if you don't know what to say, maybe it's time to just listen. So for many months, I was um, not writing. I just, um, just didn't know what to say and um, realized that I had to just listen and try to evaluate and allow for my own kind of um, waking up, coming, you know, coming to terms with all kinds of aspects of, of my life. And um, I, I, it was, it was the story that I really wanted to tell that I felt that compulsion to tell that I hadn't felt really for the, for the whole year. Um, and so I'm so grateful that I had this opportunity to, to tell it and have it be brought to life with such immediacy and also with such professionalism at NT is, um, it's just amazing. So, um, so yeah, I think that it's, it's a big year for people, uh, waking up and it seems like, um, it's an opportunity, even if it feels like a crisis. It's it's maybe both, but it's certainly going to be different going forward. And we we get to choose how engaged we want to be, and can be, and and feel the obligation to be as engaged as we can be. Working with the director Carolyn Radray was so helpful. Um, it it really is such a process. This is another part of theater that I appreciate so much is the collaborative aspect of it. 
film is also collaborative, but in a very different way for the writer. Um, and so I appreciate how respectful everyone is of the process of writing, but also taking what I have and elevating it and making, making it, taking it to, to different places that I hadn't even um, fully considered. It was also a very abbreviated development period um, just by necessity. So I also appreciated working with really smart people who um, can very um, carefully, but with, with straightforward energy, get to the point and say, here's, here's what I think, what do you think about this? And um, it, it just allowed for a great back and forth. Um, and I like to work f quickly, so that worked out. Um, and then when we got the actors involved, I mean, it was, it's always just such a joy um, to have great actors and just hear, hear that, hear the, the words in their mouth. I mean, you can't, it, it always just takes it up a, another level. I keep saying elevate it, but it's true. It just feels like it takes it to uh, a new level. And um, once you start to hear that actor in your head, then when you go back to rewrite, it's like, oh, you can start to really get a feel for um, how they would say it and have a sense of that very clearly in your mind. Um, I think that's some of the music training too in my life of just hearing it and it's just, it's a symphony. And so you're just trying to put in all the different instruments in the right, at the right time and hopefully at the right volume. Um, but yeah, it, it was amazing. The whole team was amazing. Jeff also just um, his magic with sound design. So I'm, I'm so excited for everyone to, to hear it. Writing for a podcast versus a regular play is interesting. And in particular, for this piece, I wanted to not go down the traditional path of what I have in my head as a radio play, but um, more um, present the story in a series of digital files. Um, and by that, I mean, these are all clips that would be in a digital file that the FBI might have on you or me. And so in this world of surveillance, um, that, that could be a file that was taken from uh, someone's Alexa. It could be taken from a handheld recorder. Um, it could be taken from a room mic in an interrogation room. Um, but there's no interstitial information between these two files. It's, it's really just listening to these clips and piecing the story together as it goes. So that idea really uh, appealed to me when I sort of thought maybe the story would work if I could tell it that way. Um, and and fortunately, Antias was up for the the challenge of of putting that together since it is a little bit different. So, um, but yeah, I think in general, um, you know, listening to a story versus having the advantage of seeing it, it's a it's a it's a wonderful way of telling a story. It's very different. So, um, how do you infuse those? those nuances um, just by listening. Uh, it's, it's fascinating and it was super fun. I want the audience to be entertained first and foremost. I want, I would love it if the audience hung on to the story for a while, if it stuck with them, if it, if it makes them think. Um, I don't wanna say to specifically because I don't want to spoil it. Um, but I do think there is, it's, we're, we're at a, um, such a specific time in history and um, how much we get involved in the world around us, even if it's our neighborhood um, and with, with people that we care about and extending ourselves for those people and those things that we 
hold dear those those causes and um, projects and um, I I think it's important for people to evaluate that for themselves um, and make those decisions and then decide how to act if if they choose to act um, so if it makes somebody think about that even a little bit that would be great I am looking forward to picturing each neighborhood as I'm listening to this. Now, I say that knowing that my play is not exactly a travelogue of Westwood. It's not, it's not about Westwood uh, specifics in the neighborhood, although there are a, a, few, a little bit it, it is. But, but I'm looking forward to, there's so many different uh, disparate neighborhoods represented in the series. And I haven't read any of the other pieces. So I'm really looking forward to just listening and, um, and, and, you know, doing a, a mental drive by of all these different areas, some of which I'm not that familiar with. Um, and it's certainly exciting to imagine how, uh, how they might be represented. So I'm, I'm just looking forward to it. People must listen to these because what else are you going to be doing? It's like, why not? They're less than 30 minutes each. They're free and they'll take you away. They will take you away from the mental anguish of living your life, of the stresses of everyday uh, existence these days. It's an opportunity to disappear into another world for a little bit. Who wouldn't want that? Who, who wouldn't want that? I'm Deb Height, and if you enjoyed this conversation, please check out antias.org and learn more about how to see and hear the zip code plays. One thing that audiences can do and you can do, and this is a win-win situation, is when these zip code plays are released is to download and listen to them. Give them your time. They're going to be free. You don't have to pay for them. And in this uh, age and time, something that's free that was fully professionally produced is a gift. But it's win-win in that we need an audience. And we're putting it out there in the ether and we need you to come listen to it. That's how we survive. And it's not about money, obviously, because uh, we're not making it off of this and you're not paying for it. Uh, so it's the ultimate in, uh, in true art.
you're going to get an experience. And so I hope you get to listen to them all and, uh, uh, you know, start with mine and see how you go from there. But then, uh, you know, listen to them all. Hi, my name is Alex Goldberg. And if you want to learn more about me as a playwright or my play annexing the Palisades, watch this video. As for the zip code plays, uh, it was a wonderful idea because in this time, as I call them, coronial times, uh, we uh, uh, don't uh, have the outlet of theater. And, you know, Zoom plays readings are a great option, but I believe we're all getting Zoom fatigue. And, you know, a lot of us are working on Zoom. And then, you know, one of the joys of theater pre-coronial times was you got to leave your computer behind and sit in front of real people. And we're losing that with Zoom. Uh, it's still better than nothing. And I, I do appreciate it. But the radio plays was a great alternative. They're going to take plays uh, specifically designed to be broadcast as a radio play and design it completely. Jeff Gardner is doing the production design. He's fantastic on all uh, six plays. And so it was a great opportunity to create something that could exist as a stage play, but also would be initially performed as a radio play. So they uh, opened up this idea to uh, the lab members, um, the playwrights in lab, uh, uh, of which at the time there were, I believe 40 something. And they said, we're gonna take six ideas. Whoever wants to pitch, you could pitch it. And they you know, commissioned the play from us, contracted it from us. And uh, we went from there. So uh, I was very fortunate that my idea uh, was chosen and I was happy to write it from that point on. My specific play in the zip code plays is called Annexing the Palisades. And it came from a very real and sordid place in Los Angeles's history. Uh, I'm a big history buff. I was an American studies major in college and uh, I've been in LA now for nearly a decade and uh, just love finding out little quirky details in LA like any major city, probably more than many major cities, has a lot of dirt under there. I mean, it's part of the sheen of Hollywood. And uh, annexing the Palisades is inspired by uh, the truthful activities that took place at what is called the Murphy Ranch. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but the Murphy Ranch is a compound in the Palisades that was built in the 30s. And, and this is going to be a bit of a spoiler for the play, but it was built um, by a couple of wealthy uh, uh, people initially from Chicago who were building a compound that was to be self-sustaining. Um, most people believe it was to ride out the war, World War II, they knew war was coming and the chaos that followed it. And because they were um, Nazi sympathizers, uh, they believed that uh, the country was gonna fall into chaos. Some believe that they were actually building a winter home for Hitler. They thought that uh, when the war was over, Hitler would want a winter in Los Angeles. So that was what the compound was gonna be. That's a bit far-fetched, but there's no real proof of that, but it's feasible. It is. Uh, definitely true that these people were among the uh, 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 neo-Nazi movement, the alt-right, as we would call them today. And it was fascinating to me because, you know, uh, racism and anti-Semitism never goes away completely. It gets buried from time to time. Uh, and in enlightened eras, sometimes people do learn uh, about how to not be racist to people. But... Um, it was fascinating to know that even then, even leading up to World War II, there were a good number of people in this country who sided with the Germans. I mean, we've seen it a lot in the recent uh, uh, The Plot Against America series uh, that was based on the great Philip Roth novel um, that covers that uh, ground. But that was the inspiration for my play. And, and being Jewish, uh, you know, anti-Semitism is there. It always is. You hear about it uh, and you you know, you, you hope it goes away, but it keeps coming back. The play is about uh, Winona and Norman Stevens who own this uh, big, big house in the Palisades and they hire a uh, wood craftsman named Joseph Kurtz to come in and uh, give them an estimate on a fantastic uh, balustrade or banister that they're, uh, they want carved that's in their main foyer. So that's how the play starts. And these are the three characters that are in the play. The, the couple wants the banister, and Kurtz wants to build it for them. But then as we learn more and more, it becomes much more of a uh, difficult endeavor. It's always been a joy to work with Antaeus actors and this is no exception. And so um, first off, I was paired up with the great uh, Ann Noble. She's a fantastic uh, actor and director. And 
ironically, one of the first uh, uh, performers I saw when I moved to Los Angeles, I saw her in a, a one woman show about uh, Barack Obama's mother. Uh, and she was amazing and fantastic. And uh, uh, who knew that, you know, a decade later, I'd be working with her. So she was great. She loved the piece. Uh, and we sat down and came up with an amazing cast list and like, well, we can go with this person. We can go with that person. We can go with this person. There's so many great actors to, to choose from. The only caveat was that um, because of the nature of the recording, we couldn't use real life couples because they were going to be recorded on these fancy systems that were sent to their houses. And you could only have the bandwidth one person, you know, at a time in a house. So we had, so um, our lead actress is uh, Nikki Dukas and she is uh, really marvelous and fantastic. She's also an actor director who nailed the part. When she did a first read, I thought she must, it felt like she'd worked on it for a month. She was, she was really fantastic. Playing her husband is uh, Harry Groner, who's uh, one of the original founders of Antius. Another one of my favorite actors. He works all the time in really wonderful stuff. Uh, like me, he spent a lot of time in New York uh, before coming out here, but uh, uh, just a really fantastic actor. He was great. And then uh, our third actor is uh, Adrian Latourell. And um, I had not uh, known him before, but I'd seen him perform and I was just taken by his, um, his ability to, some actors can really show a lot of, uh, of gravity and emotion while not really giving you anything. You know what I mean? Like you, they're just fascinating to look at and they have such depth without uh, uh, giving you too much. And he, he is like that. You watch him and you are uh, mesmerized by what he's doing. Unfortunately, you won't be able to watch him, but uh, you'll be able to hear it in his voice. He's really just a, uh, he carries a lot of gravity with him and it's fantastic. The benefit of doing this production as a podcast is that it gets to be experienced in a fun new way. Now, uh, radio plays are not new and podcasts are not new, um, but to be able to stage a show where the environment is completely created around you, be it uh, in the example of my play, uh, construction in the background, and not just construction, but what does construction sound like in 1939? And uh, music, there's music worked into the play itself. Uh, there's an old radio from the 30s that uh, uh, gets uh, some use. So to be able to bring in these elements and have it be heard the way it should be heard in a very organic way is a just a wonderful experience. And it was a great joy to write with that in mind, to be able to not only just write a play that can stand up on its own on stage, but also to think about that element, that sense you're hearing. You can only focus on hearing, what do you get to hear? It was a great challenge for me and a lot of fun and I look forward to uh, hearing how it turns out. And of course, we have a composer who's tying all of the uh, uh, pieces together, all six uh, plays, and she is doing, you know, altering themes for each play and stuff. But like, that's going to be great. Just compose music to go along with it. It's going to be a fun experience. I would like the audience to take a few things from this play. One, hopefully to be entertained by it and to feel the gravity of the moments as they unfold. But two, also to realize that your neighbors may not be who you think they are. I think everyone has skeletons in their closet. Some of them are obvious and some of them are not so obvious. And, you know, when you think about upscale neighborhoods like the Palisades, you have certain uh, uh, ideas in mind. One of it is wealth and uh, great taste. And that does come into play here. But then there are other things which you may not have considered. And hopefully you'll think about that more after the play is over. There are a few things that excite me about this entire zip code play series. One is I love LA and uh, I love hearing about the neighborhoods that I don't know things about. You know, I, you, everyone has a cursory knowledge of certain neighborhoods. Some people who've been there their whole lives or, or for decades have, you know, much more in-depth knowledge, but like you, you think certain things about neighborhoods, you know, oh, there's this, uh, there's this type of food here. There's these type of people who live here, that sort of thing. But looking forward to learning more, digging in deeper. And the other thing I'm looking forward to is just hearing from the other five immensely talented writers. There are dozens of great writers in the Antaeus Playwrights Lab, dozens. And um, making this decision must not have been easy. And the other writers they picked are fantastic. I wanna hear what they have to say. I can't wait to hear it. And it's gonna be in their voice. They're not is not going to be a uniformity to the storytelling between all six stories, other than the fact that there's a time limit. 
and the a radio play. But otherwise, it's going to be I'm going to you know listen in and be like, what's what's uh, you know Carrie going to say? What's uh, Angela J Davis or or Deb or Steve or but like what are they going to say? I can't wait to hear. Audiences must listen to the zip code play to get good storytelling and to give their eyes a break. We are all looking at screens all the time. If it is not your computer screen right now, it's uh, the TV news, which is certainly a fantastic soap opera in itself right now, but this is a little more escapism and this is just your ears. You're gonna listen to a story you can do it on a walk. You can do it in your car. You can do it at home. I mean, you don't need me to tell you where to listen to podcasts, but you get to hear a fully fleshed out story with fantastic actors and great design using just one sense. Hi, my name is Alex Goldberg, and I am the playwright of Annexing the Palisades, which is part of the Zip Code Play series at Antaeus Theatre Company. You can find the podcast and download it for free at Antaeus.org. I think why must somebody listen to the zip code plays? I think it's, uh, for me, as somebody who's been writing plays for a good amount of time now, it sounded truly novel, which is, it's, I think if that's hard to come by is, you know, there, there's lots of good ideas and ideas that have a, you know, a light different bent to them or a slant. This one really just struck me both in its medium, in its um, structure, in um in, in, in all the ways that um, when you tell a story, it's like, wow, you really are telling a story that is going to be informed somewhat by the parameters that are suggested to you. So for example, um, one of the things that I really loved about this piece, because it really stretched my writing muscles was um, if there's no visual cues, right? It's a podcast, but beyond that, there's no stage directions. So things that I would take for granted that could be explained or that could be somewhat, you know, I guess stage directions could be kind of a crutch in the way exposition might be uh, when you're writing. Um, you had to do away with that. So it really activated the characters. I went through a lot of changes to see like what um, made sense because when you don't have, you know, the visual cues um, to help support the audio cues, it can be confusing to um, a listener, an audience member. So yeah, I think that for me um, is a reason, is, is like probably one of the most compelling reasons to um, listen to the zip code place. Hi, I am Nina Agrawal. If you wanna learn more about me, my play Plucker and the zip code series in which Plucker takes place, please stay tuned.
So my play for the Zip Code Plays series with Antaeus Theater uh, called Plucker uh, is um, loosely based on a true story where I was kind of brought to justice <laughs> um, in that uh, there is an association that kind of gently polices those who pick flowers or fruits or uh, what have you. And so I had plucked a lemon um, from an, a tree that was hanging over into an alleyway and uh, somebody brought it to my attention that they're hosting this meeting. And I um, went to the meeting uh, to be kind of gently reprimanded. It wasn't even a reprimand, but I thought it was actually a great um, excuse to meet people and meet the community, but I'd never been in a space where there was so much attention paid to something that felt so harmless and even humorous to me. Um, I came from um, North Hollywood, one of the neighborhoods where we constantly had police patrolling our streets at all times. There was all sorts of illicit activity happening on my block in particular. So to come to a neighborhood that was um, as focused on um, issues such as fruit plucking or flower plucking just really, really uh, tickled me. And I thought it was very specific to uh, my uh, initiation into that community. So I kind of took a hyperbolic look at it in Plucker. So the arc of, of Plucker is essentially a character, a female protagonist who is new um, to Santa Monica, um, is kind of going through an initiation or a hazing of sorts in a uh, kind of serio comedic way where she's been caught on um, CCTV or somebody's um, security camera plucking um, some fruit and is being formally reprimanded by the Flora and Fauna Association of Santa Monica. Um, and it is becomes a very much a conversation in the Downton Abbey form of the us versus them, those above, those below, all over some fruits being picked. And so on along one side of this beautiful living room in which it's beat this, that these trials are being hosted are the perps um, or the pluckers. And on the other side are those um, who are the plaintiffs and or the harvesters. Um, so the idea is to kind of, you know, gently poke fun, but also take a look at the things that we value in society and um, how there's some common ground, but also how these things can sometimes push us further apart. I think it's my first time writing for a podcast format. And it was, it was really incredible one, because it was trying something new, but also because of the pandemic, um, all the steps that you have to take that are somewhat unconventional um, in that all the actors and I, you know, we met by zoom um, and the sound designer and, and everyone involved, uh, the artistic directors, you know, the, the, the sound uh, equipment would get sent to each actor's home and they would have to kind of set up their own, you know, simulate a sound space and um, the sound designer would walk them through what's the best space in terms of acoustics and what have you. So just learning that and seeing how this operated um, in a time when I think uh, the pandemic has really turned how we operate on its ear um, was just really, it was really fascinating, it was really interesting. But again, to underscore the point about Antaeus and my experience with it, just very community minded. Everybody wanted to make everybody's job a little bit easier. And it wasn't just about what is my specific role as an actor, as a writer, as the director, as the sound designer. It was how can I help this actor or what would make it easier for the sound designer? And it's very much, I think, speaks to theater, to community, and to um, the mission of Antaeus Theater. Marcello, Virilin, Covey were all uh, actors in um, in my in my piece, and they I I knew of their work even beforehand. I I didn't know them all personally necessarily, but I um, I knew of them and I'd seen their work, and so I was just delighted. As I you know as I said earlier, Antaeus really brings together people who have been professionally acting forever have these incredible credits and plaudits to their name and. Um, are so committed to furthering um, 
theater or professional community both either. So I was I was really excited about the diversity of their backgrounds, their experiences, um, and that they would you know give their time and talent to this project. Um, my director was just lovely. Um, Jonathan is somebody who's been on my radar for some time, and so when the artistic directors kindly involved me in selecting a director, I, like them, was 100% gung-ho on, uh, on Jonathan. And he, just like everyone else, did so much with so little. And um, yeah, I'm really excited about the final product. I'd love for the audience to get a good laugh out of the play. I think, um, you know, beyond the play, the series, and beyond the series in Taya's Theater, I think it's a moment to really reflect, especially right now with, all that's happening in our world um, with the election, with all the natural disasters in California, it, the fires in particular come to mind, um, with the role of theater and what that can do and just the human condition. I, I think that this series is very much about, um, you know, where you are physically, you know, being present in the moment um, and, Every, I, as somebody who has lived in five or six neighborhoods in LA in the five years I've been in LA, I can tell you it's, you know, every neighborhood as we, as we know is so distinct and creates its own space and sense of self and sense of community. And I'm hoping the zip code plays, you know, really bring that to the forefront and hopefully make us all feel a little bit more heartened and inspired by people's experiences, fictional or otherwise. Um, and my personal wish would be that um, we share um, we share these stories with others in a way to connect and further community. I would be honored and delighted uh, to see the zip code plays um, produced. I think uh, when we when I met with the playwrights and all the actors and the collective, like we all had a kind of a Zoom chat. It was so lovely to hear everyone's experiences. And I think we all laughed about all the um, the unconventional takes and the scrappiness of things that we had to do to make this happen on finite budgets and resources as, as one is probably used to in theater anyway. But I think this just felt so special because of, again, um, this kind of unprecedented time in our world and any limitations that has imposed and hampering theater and um, its ability to be seen, heard, experienced. So I, I really, really enjoyed it. And yeah, if there's an opportunity for it to be produced, I, I think I would just be, I, I would just be so enchanted by that. Hi, I'm Nana Agarwal. Thank you so much uh, for joining me in this conversation. Please visit us at anteus.org to hear the zip code plays and looking forward to staying in touch. Why must viewers listening to the Zip Code plays, why they must listen is because this is a unique pairing of this particular company's great actors 
and uh, sound engineer, Foley artist, sound design. It's a unique kind of blend of fictional storytelling uh, paired with playwriting. And uh, I think it's unique in that way. I don't, I don't feel fictional podcasting going as far right now as non-fictional podcasting. And this lays a claim to being a very unique, uh, winnable and very wonderful way to sort of stay on the fictional side of things and give people an experience that they'll want more of. So the, the zip code plays idea was an idea that was um, sort of born before to when the playwrights lab was just when they were in another space in North Hollywood to bring together the playwrights lab and the actors in mass. So it's something we've done before in a much more casual one night environment, invitation only environment. Um, and it was something um, that worked out really well. It was really kind of rambunctious how many people were involved in it the first time. It, um, and so I wasn't surprised when they brought it back. Of course they brought it back because the pandemic prevents us from producing plays uh, in person right now. How can we still stay strong and tell stories together while we're apart? And so they reintroduced the zip code play idea with a call for entries, meaning any pe person in the lab, the playwrights lab could submit an idea by deadline this past summer uh, to participate. I'm like, well, let me pick something else, you know? And uh, I think when you think of a zip code in LA, there's many that seem like the obvious choice, maybe Hollywood or downtown or Santa Monica or the beach or wherever you want to pick. And so I always, triangulate off of the least obvious choice. Like what wouldn't people pick? And what do I find out about that? And, uh, you know, I threw a couple of ideas at him. You know, I almost wrote about Descanso Gardens and La Cañada, you know, and there's so many things I think you could throw into to the uh, Descanso Gardens up there. But we decided with Sun Valley because I had just been to the auto junkyard up there uh, to find parts for a car I've been putting together over the summer. It's been a hobby of putting this car together. I, I bought for a few grand and I've just been putting money into it all summer. It works. It's great. We're taking on vacation this, this week. Um, and um, like anything, sometimes of the moment, you put together uh, things from ideas in your current life. And then the play, as you may have read, the log line of it is is about two people who have low vision, who could barely see, um, who end up going to find uh, a part for a car that they want to drive in this auto lot. And I, I, I wanted to present the idea of working with people with uh, who are a visual impairment because I work for the Braille Institute during the day. Um, and, you know, there's not enough awareness of what we can do in our lives to eliminate barriers for people who have low to no vision. You know, um, it's you know, people, you know, and it also hits people when, when, it, when they lose their vision later in life. There's all kinds of things that people go through that are emotional and you want to hang on to the things you were doing. And so I took some of those ideas and uh, I said, you know, what? You, there are still some people who lose their vision who still have a car license, who still probably want to drive those few last times that they have a car license. And like, wouldn't this be funny and odd to do this meet cute of people who used to know each other through um, the center? Um, I can't, use, I didn't want to use Braille in, the, in, in, I wanted to be like an, um, a blind center where one taught the other and one was blind back then and now the other's blind and then they go in together and use their skills in this unique friendship to find a car part. So um, that's kind of how that came together. It's just kind of some quick alchemy of things that were in my life or as Viola Spol and others might say objects in the immediate environment. So, and it goes deeper. It's a friendship. 
it's a teacher and student relationship that gets flipped. Um, and you don't know it's also as they talk, um, because it's, it's really Martha's story. Uh, it's two people in their early 50s uh, who's newly going blind, Bef comes back to meeting Billy, who she taught years ago when he was first going blind in his early 20s, and she was a little older than he was. And his life has just gotten better and hers has gotten worse <laughs> in certain ways. And uh, it's just kind of what's shared and what's known in the disability world is access intimacy of somebody who could be almost a complete stranger who only knew you once, um, who gets, gets you, gets your, your vibe, the way you need to stand, what you need to get, be productive, how, you know, what you need to walk with a cane through a junkyard um, and uh, they may only be in our life for a short period of time, but um, that's kind of what we're investigating in the piece. Uh, our play opens and um, Martha, who has been waiting patiently in front of the junkyard uh, in Sun Valley, um, is waiting for her volunteer. Um, and she when she meets uh, Billy, um, she doesn't quite remember that she's known him before, but you can tell she's a, maybe a bit of a cynic or a, grim, or, or, or a grump, I guess is the word, you know, it just wants someone to come in and fill this purpose or she's driven to go find uh, this knock sensor for a 1998 Subaru Impreza she has. Uh, and um, she used to come to the junkyard herself and then just going blind, it's hard to see. So she is, it's even more taken aback when the volunteer arrives in the form of Billy, one that she knew him before, but he also has part, only partial sight. Um, and his, his uh, orientation and mobility as it's called, um, is a lot better than hers and his daily living skills are, have been sharpened over time. And, and he's a musician and he's a musician because she taught him. And so that's kind of woven in through as they walk through the junkyard to find this part, you know? Um, and uh, so it's a lot of catching up, but it really is about, can they get this part or not? Can she get back and start the car before a license expires? There's a little bit of a time cap. And then what happens when they find the car finally, you know? I uh, met them over Zoom. Um, Gigi Birmingham, I have seen uh, act. She's a wonderful company actor and is a, um, a teacher and just known just in theater circles of how great she is. And, uh, she, and um, she plays Martha. And then John Chafin, who I had not seen before, um, who's also incredible, and he's a lot of he's done TV episodics and um, a lot of stage work, uh, just has so much finesse and so much um, heart in what he does. Um, both of them, this is the first reading, and I was I was only in on a couple of rehearsals because it it soaks up time to have so many rehearsals on Zoom, and they were on a on a, on a union schedule. Um, the, they just had had it down. They had such electricity. Uh, they seem to really like these these uh, characters. And I hope you guys do too. I think they sort of present them in a great way. So what do I want the audience to get out of this play? I think what I get out of it, what I, I want the audience to get out of it is that no matter what the obstacles you have in life are to stay open to things changing, to stay open to being surprised um, uh, because life does and things do. And I think that's kind of the thing to remember. And um, we see it in the play with people who are losing their vision, which is some of our greatest fears and you can have your greatest fears realized and still come out the other side. You can still live your life. I'm excited about all of the zip code plays. I want to hear just the uh, tapestry is probably too cliche a word, but I want to hear all of the different sounds and rhythms 
that um, the whole bunch of us have come up with, because I know it's, it's going to be different. I mean, mine has like a sort of a musical naturalism to it. And I know a few of them are surreal. A few of them are kind of bizarre histories and uh, earnest histories. And um, just as I sometimes just enjoy a great podcast this summer, I want to listen to them all and I want more. Um, I want, I want everyone who comes to this to just want to hear more zip codes, you know, um, this is Antius Theater Company's fall production and they've made good on it with some amazing people working on it. And I think we're all going to be amazed. I mean, they're, they're going to be between 20 and 30 minutes. So like podcastable lengths, they're not like these long things. They're, they're, they're stories about our city. And I just want people to sort of look at, to see how Antaeus is just trying to stay in touch with its audience through pandemic. And um, my play, I hope you guys, I, I don't know what order they're going to present them in. Um, I think they're just going to be a surprise. There's, and so it's all going to sound so great, such like a perfect package. I mean, I hope that this is like season one of the Zip Code plays and you're coming back here next year to interview the writers who are season two because it's such a joyous idea that, uh, you know, I hope, you know, people have listening parties, people uh, uh, tell people about, you know, it, it's, it's shareable and it's also a nice solo experience. So that's, that's what I think is going to happen. So season two of the Zip Code plays, we wanted to continue looking at um, a variety of uh, parts of LA County, um, different geographical areas, and we wanted to uh, look at different styles. So uh, first up, we have uh, 90069 West Hollywood, where we have a, a very uh, a funny story, uh, Brunch Interrupted by Sean Abley, uh, which is uh, looks at issues of colonization and gentrification in, uh, in uh, West Hollywood. Um, and I'm, of course, partial to that one because um, I get to play a role in it. I actually have a, an acting part. So uh, I, I enjoyed that one very much and the awesome co-stars that we have on that. Um, so we open the season with West Hollywood. Next, we have 90026 Echo Park, uh, $10 and a tambourine, which looks at... Um, uh, the Early Days of Los Angeles with Amy Semple McPherson uh, and uh, Mr. Mulholland, uh, uh, who built up this, uh, this city in their own individual ways and um, takes a look at uh, the challenges that uh, she faced as a woman um, in Echo Park, uh, building up uh, Los Angeles when it was really just starting out. Um, it's a great play, and that is written by uh, Mildred Inez Lewis. Then we have 90303 Inglewood, The Vig by Paula Sismar, which I love this story too. It takes place um, in the last days of the Hollywood Park racetrack, um, and it's um, uh, in a bit of an old-fashioned story. I, I, what I love about it is it sort of tells that uh, the story of people who 
come to Los Angeles searching for a dream, um, which is a lot of us. Um, often you see that kind of in a showbiz uh, context, you know, some young person off the bus uh, from wherever they come from looking for uh, Los Angeles to answer their dreams. And in this case, um, it takes place in a different setting, but uh, ask those same questions about chasing chasing dreams as a young person coming here. What? How do you make it in this this world of Los Angeles? Then we have a nine one three three one Pacoima Golden Shine, and that's by Kari Wyatt, who wrote our uh, South Central uh, episode in season one. He's back. Um, this is a uh, it's our first ghost story. It's a, a kind of a haunting tale of. Um, uh, of a professor who's uh, haunted by the past and looking to move forward in the future. Uh, it's a little spooky and uh, a little um, resonant about the times we live in and uh, where we're going. It's, a, it's an awesome story. Then we have 91601 North Hollywood, end of the line. Uh, North Hollywood is where NTS used to be. That's our where our former, former home was. That is uh, Pepper Chambers' play. Um, uh, and that has a very interesting structure. It's kind of in two parts. The first is a, uh, a bit of a comedy about a woman who um, wants to start her own detective agency. And um, things take a more serious uh, turn in the second half when she witnesses something that um, uh, that actually is a problem, an ongoing kind of crime that's happening. And she witnesses that and then has to deal with the consequences. And then we finish out the season with 91754 Monterey Park. Bingo Bitches by Elizabeth Wong, which um, is very, I love this play too. I love them all. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of all of them. This is a, is a story of um, some older women at a, uh, uh, a bingo uh, hall at their local community center in Monterey Park. Uh, and it really asks questions about uh, whose place is, is this? Whose land is this? It's about taking one's own space and owning one's own space. Um, but set in a very, very funny uh, uh, bingo hall. Um, and those are the plays of uh, The Makeup Season 2. So we created um, some additional programming around the Zip Code plays, and that's the Zip Code Play Tours. Um, what we decided to do was choose uh, landmarks, uh, historical highlights, uh, architectural gems, uh, points of interest in each one of the zip codes, um, and make a, a, an audio tour of them. And these are tours that you can do um, uh, virtually, digitally. You can um, uh, follow them along, uh, or you can actually go to the zip code and drive around and, um, and look at these. We have um, uh, great actors from within our company narrating the tours. So much like when you go to a museum and there's an audio tour that you listen to as you go around the museum, these audio tours will uh, bring you uh, throughout the zip code, each, each individual zip code, and you'll learn about the, uh, the, the sites and, uh, uh, of that spot. And they're really interesting. I've gone and done them all. So, uh, you know, as a test case, and, you know, there are parts of uh, Los Angeles that I don't know and I was not aware of at all. And so the chance to drive around them and get to know those places has been a real treat. And whether, you know, whether you live on the west side or the east side or wherever you are, there's probably a part of town you don't know so well. So uh, Pacific Palisades was a place I had really didn't know very well. And Pacoima is another place I did not know very well. So um, we, we go all around Los Angeles and um, it's a chance to get to know these places. When we first uh, released them, it was uh, right during um, a lockdown that had, had come up. So we were recommending to everyone that they do them uh, virtually and uh, give them a listen. And you can see pictures and um, and listen to the, to the to the explanations of the places. But I think now, you know, people are are um, careful and and take uh, take caution. They should be able to go around and do these in person as well. And we also uh, were able to hook up with individual um, independently owned businesses in each each of the zip codes. So, you know, there are, are stops for uh, uh, coffee or uh, uh, snacks uh, along the way. So we recommend that you uh, um, uh, give those places a try and uh, uh, get to know the neighborhoods. It's a good way to, to get to know Los Angeles. And, you know, also when you, it's been interesting now that we have quite a few of them to see how much, um, you know, one architect who worked in, in this neighborhood turns out did something over here and turns out they did something else over here. So there are a lot of uh, connections that start to, to happen um, if, you, if you take advantage of the entire, the entire program. And those are the Zip Code Play Tours.
I think the thing I want people to take away from the entire Zip Code Play project is um, a sense of what Los Angeles is and who we are and uh, what this city is about. You know, it's a big, sprawling, unwieldy city. Um, we know that. It takes uh, hours to drive across from one end to the other. Um, and it can be a place that is isolating in some ways. Um, you know, you don't run into people necessarily in the same way you do on the streets of New York or something. Um, and, uh, but when we put all these pieces together and you hear now, we have 18 uh, zip code plays, when you hear them in their entirety, um, you start to really get a, a, a sense of how this city is uh, as a whole and all the unique pieces that make it up. And, um, and as a theater that wants to serve our community here, I think it's really important that we, we get to know Los Angeles better. And I think this will help people get to know Los Angeles better. I think people need to hear them because, uh, well, for one, the talent um, and the caliber of the, the writing and the casts are um, incredible. I don't think anybody will be disappointed. I think anyone who listens to one will want to hear another. They're uh, a maximum a half hour long. So it's a nice bite-sized piece uh, for, your, for your walk or for your uh, cleaning the kitchen or the garage, um, folding the laundry. It's a perfect, it's a perfect way to uh, spend a little time immersed in another world um, and yeah, there's no reason not to and they're free. Hi, I'm Bill Brocktrip. I'm the artistic director of NTS Theater Company um, and we invite you to uh, check out our website and everything going on at nts.org and, um, and become a part of uh, what we're doing. Uh, thank you so much. You should listen to the zip code plays because we've been apart from each other for too long. And this is a way of bringing yourself back into the place that we live or a place that we know because there've been listeners uh, from all, literally all over the world. Um, LA is a world city. And the stories that you hear are gonna, no matter where you're sitting, are gonna remind you of people and places you know. And if it works the way that we should, you'll feel encouraged. You'll feel love, tension, hate, revenge, you know, um, and it, I hope, will start you on the journey of thinking about your neighborhood and your street and the stories that you might be missing, the stories that you want to tell your friends, lovers, families, kids before those stories disappear, because that's the connective tissue that will prepare us for the next pandemic, the next challenge, and make us a stronger people. Hi, I'm Mildred Lewis, and if you want to learn more about my zip code play, $10 and a Tambourine, as well as the Antius Theater Company, watch this video. I first heard about the Antius zip code plays as a listener.
I honestly just, I, I had been to the theater, but obviously we were in a pandemic and nobody's going to the theater. And I just simply stumbled upon it and I was blown away. The first thing, uh, first uh, play that I heard was Carrie Wyatt's play about South Central. My godmother lives in South Central. And I was like thrilled, first of all, to hear a depiction of a community that I love and feel so close to represented in a way that was interesting and not stereotypical and luscious and the thing the other thing that struck me was that the sound design was so on point um i used to teach audio techniques years ago and i love sound i still play the cello and piano and so when i'm listening to work on you know whether it's plays for us or you know theater works i really listen to the sound design and i thought these are people who are taking great care and understand the difference between like what would work on a stage versus what has to work in the theater of the mind. So once I heard that, I was hooked. And I didn't think that we'd have an opportunity to submit. And, you know, when the call went out to uh, playwright member, playwright members, I would playwright unit members, I was like on it like like uh, like a flash fire. I'd always wanted to do a piece about Amy Simple McPherson who's been around, you know, sort of lately, you know, um, she's such an important part of LA history. And I thought, what if I could write a radio play that sums up all the complex feelings that I have about Los Angeles? And, you know, they gratefully accepted it. We developed it. The main story arc for $10 and a Tambourine uh, is Amy Simmel McPherson. And I wanted to tell a story about a woman who was torn uh, in two directions. First of all, she's this huge celebrity, actually much bigger than sort of the mega pastors or the televangelists that we know today. She sort of set the template for that. But she was involved with politics. She was an amazing humanitarian. I mean, she founded one of the major Christian denominations, the Foursquare Gospel, that's still in operation today. Um, her charitable work, you know, um, there's an Angelus Temple still on 54th Street near Crenshaw, which is where I get my car washed. And you still hear some of the old timers talk about how she provided charity to their parents and never made them feel less than, never made them feel like they lost their dignity. And I thought, who is this woman, you know, who has meant so much to L.A.? And so I, I wound up doing a play about her being torn between her mentor, who at this point is dead, he's the ghost, um, and that is Reverend Seymour, who is a one-eyed black preacher, uh, extraordinary man, comes from the South, goes to a black Baptist college, leaves because it's, too conser it's not conservative enough for him, comes out and founds this Azusa revival which goes on for years. And he invites Amy Simple McPherson, who at that time was having trouble in her marriage, to come out and preach and was a sort of mentor figure to her. So on one side, we've got the Reverend coming from beyond the grave saying, hey, listen, you're too into this celebrity stuff. You're, you're mixing around with like Charlie Chaplin. Her church in Echo Park wasn't too far from the original Hollywood. You know, Max Sennett and the Keystone Cops used to literally like drive their motorcycles into Echo Park Lake. So Seymour comes back from the grave and he's like, got to do better, no celebrities. But then the threat comes, William Mulholland, who we know from Chinatown. And his thing is, you know, I want a city uh, that reflects my engineering expertise. I mean, he's the one who was uh, largely responsible for us having water that allowed LA to become what it has become. Um, but he wasn't a perfect man. And he had a vision for LA that was a little bit rigid. And he's coming and saying, you know, we don't want all these faith healers, snake charmers, people like you. I don't mind you doing the charity, but I want you to do it less. And I want you to sort of take a step back. So the play is really about this flamboyant, amazing woman being torn between these two characters and then deciding to fight on in her own way. When you're thinking about radio and thinking about podcasts, you have to think entirely differently than you do for the theater um, because they're not going to be able to see. And, and that seems like an easy thing, yeah, that you just like can translate one thing to another, but it's not easy at all. Uh, you really, because a lot of things that you might see on stage, you have to find a way, an analog for that with sound. So I think that 
what the company did was absolutely brilliant. They assigned me Gigi Birmingham, who's a wonderful actor who is also a director. Uh, but the first conversations I had were with Jeff Gardner, who, you know, recently won recognition, uh, decade recognition for his excellence in sound design. And those things were absolutely essential because what it allowed me to do was to sort of, I had written for radio before. Um, years ago, I had something WBAI in New York. And in the last three or four years, I had two plays done on KPFK Pacifica. So I'd written for radio before and I, and I knew, you know, and I taught sound techniques. But it's a different thing when it's really your play and you're, you know, you're excited and thrilled and, you know, you, and, you know, sort of over the moon about, you know, this being your first major outing with a new company. Jeff really helped me refine my ideas about the complexity of sound. So that by the time Gigi came on board, we had something to hand to her that was really rich in terms of its soundscape, really sophisticated. Um, Gigi came on, added some wonderful ideas, making Mulholland much more of an antagonist in the piece, sharpening the conflict. And then we had three terrific actors, Eve Gordon, who I knew from ESTLA, the wonderful Mike Machane, um, who's just a terrific, terrific actor, and Leonard House, who's got this wonderful voice um, and understood the spirit of Reverend Seymour, that he is both conservative and playful, that he is a mentor to Amy Simple McPherson, but he's also a rival. So everybody brought something new to the table. Um, two extensive rehearsals with a terrific stage manager, Nicole, Nicole Samsel. And then um, they they actually hand delivered the sound setup to each actor. So I think you can see that I put my play into the hands of people who had really learned from the first round, who were completely committed to giving us a, a, a prof not only a professional a process, but a process that really deepened the art. You know, we've I've heard so many plays on on radio where you can tell it was just a play recorded for radio as opposed to a play that was written and conceived for radio. And that's the difference that this process made. I want them to think about themselves in relationship to Los Angeles. I want people to mostly get out of it. Here we are in this moment, in this now hopefully receding pandemic moment. Um, and we're talking about three people who were at the birth of a great city. One who, you know, two who bring religion and spirit, which have been always important to Los Angeles, and one who represents the business sector. All of them well known. You know, um, Reverend Seymour during the Azusa Street revival, literally thousands of people coming, you know, 24 hours a day for, for months on end. Simple McPherson owned the radio station where the play is set. Uh, she was the first woman in California to own a radio station, um, served literally hundreds of thousands of people, reached millions, had her own magazine, you know, literally a media empire before we understood what media empires were. William McCall uh, Mulholland sorry, is, you know, such an, a significant figure and such a complex man. When we meet him in the play, he's lost his wife and everyone agrees that that was a, a signal break as it is for most people. But it's before the Francis uh, River Dam uh, disaster. So he's both personally devastated but has never had a higher reputation for his success in bringing water to Los Angeles. So I want people to think about all the forces that bring something like a Los Angeles into play. But more than that, I want them to think about the forces that are operating on them and how they negotiate um, the challenges of their world with humor, with grace, as uh, Simple McPherson does, and, and how they preserve their integrity because in the end, of course, Simple McPherson does not win. You know, she dies very young of a barbiturate as, um, overdose, not sure whether it was accidental or a suicide. But ultimately, the pressures that she was under brought her to a dark place. And I think there's never been a better moment to think about that as we're looking at what's happening in, around, in the world around us. One of the things that we did is we worked as a team, which I think is so important. And we swapped scripts early on and not so much to create like an intentional link between them, but so that we'd have a sense of what the larger universe was and obviously to make the plays better. I'm really excited about um, Inglewood. I literally live um, like 
not even a quarter mile from the old uh, Hollywood racetrack. And it's such a great story uh, that Paula Sismar has told. Uh, West Hollywood, I, I used to work at City 10, you know, the uh, city uh, cable channel. And so to see a story set in West Hollywood with so much of Shauna Abley's heart, I mean, you know, you think of him as a horror guy, you know, he's written so much uh, for, for film and, and television in that world and in reality, but, you know, he does such a great job with this couple and, and this encounter they have with a, a, a new gentrifier. Um, you know, Pepper, I think has done an incredible job. I mean, I'm, I'm just so excited for all of them. I mean, Elizabeth Wong is writing about some bingo players like in the, you know, in the Asian parts of LA. And what I, I think we've done is to provide a non-stereotypical glimpse into aspects or places of LA that we often don't give too much thought to. One of the things I, 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 I sort of believe about Los Angeles is that we think that there's no culture and think that there's no history, but what we're living in an extraordinary place with many, many stories to tell. And things like the zip code plays are almost like these delightful appetizers that just give people a sense of like, you know, this is where we are sitting. You know, we're sitting on, you know, land that has not been seated, of course. And we're sitting and, and building on the legacies of all these people who we really ought to know. You know, um, and building in communities. I mean, people talk about feeling isolated, but you think about the mahjong parlors and the and the bingo parlors in, you know, uh, I mean, not Chinatown now. I mean, but more Monterey Park, you know, Alhambra and so forth. Um, and I think if we can plug into that, especially after this pandemic finally fades, we're going to be stronger people because we face some really significant challenges ahead, and those can't all be solved by theater but theater can play a role in how we understand and frame those experiences. And not just in a teaching way, but in a way of bringing us together as a community. And radio is great for that because nobody has to go anywhere, you know, um, and it's the theater of the mind. And these plays can all be enjoyed by like the whole family, which I think is awesome. I mean, essentially Antius is doing what Pixar does. <laughs> <laughs> you know, where the kids can get one thing out of it, like in $10 in the tambourine, my play, there are lots of really cool sound effects because they're in her radio station, you know, and there were a lot of cool sounds that were happening in those early radio days. You know, they were inventing the radio format at that time. So I think a kid or teen could get into that aspect of it, along with the ghost aspect of it. I think when we go to uh, West Hollywood, there are things to enjoy. Pepper's Peace in Pacoima. I mean, how often do we make it to North LA and, and, you know, which is still so rich and so vibrant and changing like crazy. So I think it's adults. I think it's kids. I think it's people who want to enjoy the theater of the mind. And I think it can be deeply restorative. And I, I honestly think people should listen to the, the first season, you know, to just kind of prep themselves for season two. I think the zip code plays are a blast. It may have started as a way to just keep the company active during the pandemic, but I think it's grown far beyond that. I think that the, the, the sort of tours through the areas of the city are something that, you know, we're going to be looking at, you know, for a long time to come. Um, and it's a way if you, if you want to get your family into what is South Central like? What does it feel like to be there? I've heard so, so many scary things or Pacoima, who goes there? I think when you listen to the play and you look at the companion material, you're going to understand that we are part of a city. This is not just a megalopolis. This is not just a region, but we're a part of what's going on. And at the same time, you'll be deeply entertained. I mean, you, you can't get better actors than we have, you know, I mean, and, and it's not just that these are actors that you'll recognize from big name theater productions or film and TV productions. Of course you will, but it's more the commitment and the quality it's going to sing for you. And the company, I think, speaks for itself. I mean, not everybody's going to be into a classical mindset. I, I understand that. I accept it. I respect it. But I don't think we can afford to lose track of that. That's something we need to bring forward with us. You know, for me, it's about expanding the canon, you know, making it so that we respect and revere more work so more people have the opportunity to become regarded 
as classical authors, as the voices for our time, rather than, you know, sort of bifurcating ourselves. Um, and yeah, if, if, if we do that, if we abandon the classics, if we abandon the classical sensibility, I think we lose something very vital. First of all, I enjoyed this conversation. I hope that you enjoyed this conversation as well. I really need you to go to Stage Explorations. It's on YouTube. And I need you to do what you know we all need to do. Click like and subscribe. It'll give you the opportunity to hear from so many theater makers, many of whom are doing amazing work that you might never have heard of, that might have just gotten lost in the noise. And you're going to see that there are dozens of videos, makers who uh, you might not have heard of, but as soon as you see them, they're people that you'll want to follow in the Los Angeles theater community, on television, on film, and in the digital space. So please go to Stage Explorations. They're on YouTube. Click like and then subscribe. If you enjoyed our talk as well, consider uh, following what Antius is doing. We're on Instagram. Uh, we're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Uh, you can go to Antius, A-N-T-A-E-U-S dot O-R-G, and see if it's something that you might enjoy. We would love to have you as collaborators, audience members, and just part of our broader community. Uh, we're here to serve you. And if you get engaged with us, we hope to earn a repeat visit and maybe a little bit of collaboration. You have a lot of choices when, you know, for your entertainment these days. And there's, you know, 500 channels on TV. And even though the movie theaters are closed right now, they are, you know, you can still watch every movie that's ever been released, and every TV show. And there's what you don't have a lot of choices, chances to do, or just at least fewer, is to support theater companies. And, you know, theater has taken a real hit over the last year. And so this is a really easy way to support a company who's committed to keeping artists employed. And so there's that. You can do it from the comfort of your own home. You can do it in your car. You can do it wherever. There's also just the fact that how often do you listen to radio drama? How often do you really listen to radio drama? Um, and now you've got the perfect way to give it a try. You know, we listen to books on tape and we listen to, you know, like the murder podcasts and all that stuff. But, you know, these bite sized 20 minute or so um, full plays, beginning, middle and end with really great actors. Um, you know, why, why not? It's 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 a great way to spend some time and support a theater company, expose yourself to a different artistic uh, medium. And, and they're really good. Hi, I'm Sean Abley, a playwright. And if you want to find out more about my zip code play, 90069 West Hollywood, Brunch Interrupted, watch this video. One of the things that is really great about Antias is that as I've been in the company, even in the short time, I've, well, like three years, they have instituted more and more outlets for the playwrights to create. So we've been doing some 10 minute play festivals internally, and they have a reading series called Lab Results. And once the pandemic started and basically live theater shut down, they were looking for ways to keep all the artists, the playwrights and the actors 
you know, employed basically. And they came up with this, instead of Zoom theater, they came up with this great idea for radio theater. So it's not, not, we're not like compromising our work by putting it on Zoom. We're actually writing for a medium correctly. <laughs> So the so they did round one of the they just reached out to the lab and said who wants to be involved we're going to pick six writers and we'll go from there and so I wasn't in the first season as they're calling it um, and then the second season rolled around and I I threw my hat in the ring and they chose me and honestly um, having heard the first season I'd never written for radio before uh, or you know radio drama um, it. Really, I'm glad that I wasn't in the first one because the, the 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 playwrights they chose for the first one were so good, and and the 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 post production and the sound was so amazing that then I had the advantage of having all of that as an example. So yeah, so I just I you know they reached out to us and we said yes. My piece is called Brunch Interrupted. I lived in West Hollywood for ten years. I watched the city during those ten years change. And then I, I live now in Hollywood with my husband and we've lived in this um, place for 17 years now, um, but still, you know, connected to West Hollywood and I'm, I'm there a lot. And a thing that's happening with West Hollywood is it's being sort of colonized by straight people. You know, it was a city that was formed uh, with gay interests in mind. And it was, you know, where um, the majority of gay bars were in the Los Angeles area and they had, you know, domestic partnership early and, 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 you know, the city council is, you know, queer people. And so it was this sort of thriving gay metropolis. I mean, people know it all over the country. When you say West Hollywood, they immediately know what you're talking about. But what started happening was it was the city started getting sold to the highest bidder and development started happening in the city and it wasn't necessarily queer centric and, and and queer businesses were closing because they couldn't afford the rents anymore. I mean, the, the church, the, the gay church moved out of its West Hollywood location because it couldn't afford the rent anymore. And I just thought that was a shame. And so when it came time to write a play about an area and it, you know, and I'm always sort of looking for an angle where it can be something more than just a play. It can maybe, you know, be a statement about something that was forefront in my mind. And so the, 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 the kickoff of the play is, you know, people at a gay bar being confronted by a straight woman who has moved into West Hollywood complaining about noise at a bar. Well, you know, the gay people aren't complaining about noise at the bar. Like that's our, you know, that's our thing, right? Um, and then the, the next thing that I wanted to do is, you know, being a, a responsible and um, responsive artist to what's going on in the world right now, I wanted to try to make space for um, characters of color and, and, and artists of color that could be involved. So after initially sort of looking at this problem of straight colonization in West Hollywood, it sort of came to me that if, you know, West Hollywood is a pretty white city, let's be frank. And if you were one of the few black queer people living in that city, would more white people coming to the city really make that much of a difference? Like, would it matter that they're straight? It would probably matter matter more that it's just more white influence in a place where you are outnumbered. So, you know, treading very carefully, I decided to make that sort of the, the crux of my story, that that the white character is, you know, their, their limited experience says, oh, a bunch of straight people are moving into the city and that's bad. And the black character saying, there's a different viewpoint here that you're not considering because of your limited experience. And, you know, and that happens in a couple. And I wanted to explore, I wanted to explore when a, a white person is asked the tough questions, how do they respond? And because I can't do it from the black perspective, because I'm that's not me, that's not my lived experience, but I can certainly do it 
from the perspective of a white person who has been challenged and feeling defensive and not knowing how to answer the right way and then further sort of be of service to the solution. So I set that challenge for myself <laughs> in this, you know, 20 minute radio play. Um, and, you know, I, I reached out in that, I reached out to a friend of mine, Michael Shepard, who is a, uh, a director and an artistic director of the, the gay theater in town, Celebration Theater. And he's also a black man who I have collaborated with for many, many years. And my friend Parnell Damone, who's a black actor who I've also collaborated with. And I was like humbly like handed them this work. And I'm like, please tell me, you know, what, am I on the mark? Am I out of my lane? Like whatever. And I think we, um, I think, I think we like, I don't know. It's not, I, I don't want to say it's a perfect solution, but I feel like it's a good start. So the story of Brunch Interrupted is, uh, it begins in the parking lot of the Gold Coast Bar, which is, if you know the Gold Coast Bar, you know that they host this red dress party every year, or they did, unfortunately they've closed, uh, but they used to hold a red dress party in their parking lot every year, and it was a charitable event, and you know, it got pretty raucous. Um, so what's happening at the beginning is the, the two main characters um, are, uh, Joe and Moses, a couple, uh, interracial couple, are setting up for this red dress party. And there's music playing in the bar. And it's loud music. And a woman, a, a white woman who lives in the neighborhood approaches them to complain about the noise. And turns out she's complained several times about the noise, about this bar. And thus starts a conversation with this woman and uh, her entitlement to ha living in a quiet neighborhood in a city that was not necessarily built for her. They have an argument and the interracial couple, you know, they sort of settle it in the moment and the couple goes off to go have brunch. And while they're at brunch, the two of them start talking about this in invasion of straight people into West Hollywood. And Moses, who's the uh, black gentleman of the couple, uh, is not so, you know, worried about more straight people. He's actually more concerned that it's just, city's just getting whiter. And Joe, his partner, thinks that he understands, but he's quickly uh, sort of disabused of that notion that he, he, he is making the right considerations in this argument. And while they are, you know, as a couple sort of working through that, the woman shows up at their brunch. So once again, she's sort of invading gay space. And uh, the three of them have a discussion that it doesn't solve all the problems because, you know, these are messy issues, but it does help them all understand a little bit more about who's affected and what the stakes are. I am blessed with an amazing team of people on this project. And I, I, I pinch myself on quite frankly, um, when I was writing it, I wrote, I wrote this piece for certain actors. So I'll just start with Bill Brocktrop, who is the art co-artistic director of, uh, NTS theater company. And I, you know, I, in my head, I always had his voice as I was writing this script, but you know, he's the co-artistic director and he's making the decisions, you know, sort of who, who he's, who's doing these things and who's getting cast and stuff like that. So he wanted to be very careful not to be like, you know, I'm going to take this plum role for myself, but I really, I was just like, I, I got to have you. I really got to have you. And I, you know, I've been watching Bill for decades and he's so talented and I've seen him on stage and I've seen him on screen. And I mean, just like a plus, for casting for this and I, I got him and he is great. Um, and, and part of the way I got him was Michael Shepard, who I have worked, who's the director, who is also the artistic director of Celebration Theater here in Los Angeles. But we've known each other since our Chicago theater days 30 years ago. Uh, so we've known each other forever. And you know, he was my first choice to direct this. And when we got him on board, 
this is before we cast anything. I was like, I want Bill. And he's like, I think Bill would be perfect. And Bill was like, I don't know. I may, you know, and we're both like, no, 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 we have to have you. And so he relented and I'm so happy he did because he's so good. Um, so yeah, so Michael, I've worked with forever and, and, and I knew that if I handed something like this to him as, you know, a black theater artist who has been fighting the good fight his entire career, um, he would not be shy about telling me where maybe this didn't hit the mark or, you know, was I just completely out of bounds, like even trying to write this, like, you know, he would, he would be honest with me. Um, so, you know, already now we're, we've, we've established like a chunk of the dream team playing opposite bill is another friend of mine playing Moses, uh, the black half of the interracial couple, uh, is Parnell Damone. And Parnell is also, I met him through celebration theater and, um, I don't know. We've just like, I don't know. We've hit it off ages ago. Right. And so, um, I've had him like when, when I write a script, Frequently, I'll just like call actors to come in and like read just so I can hear it. And he, I've had him do those things. And um, so, yeah, it was really great that we could like get him and he and Michael have worked together forever. So that was, you know, again, it's like old home week with this. Like there was no surprises. I got to just work with these people that I've known and respect so much. And Parnell also good friend. And I trusted him to like, you know, tell me, tell me the truth about this piece. Um, and then... <laughs> So the woman in the piece, there's three actors. The woman in the piece is an older white woman who lives in the neighborhood. And there is this amazing actor at Antias named Angie Bird. And if anybody has like worked at Antias or anybody in the Playwrights Lab that's hearing me talk about this, they are right now nodding in agreement that she, I mean, she's magnificent actor. And I write for her when I write, like every time I write a little 10 minute piece or anything, I write for Angie Bird. And, you know, the competition's stiff in these things. There's six playwrights that are trying to cast their play. And, uh, you know, when I wrote it, I had her voice in mind and I was like, I need this actor. And I got her. <laughs> I could not have been happier. She's so good. So yeah, so then at that point, I'm like, well, I just, I can't lose. Like this is, you know, front loaded to be amazing. And then the first time they read it was like, ah, uh, yeah, magic. So, um, and then the sort of, you know, the icing on, I was gonna say the icing on the cake, but actually it's not the icing on the cake. It's like the cake, everything else is the icing. Um, Jeff Gardner, who is the sound guru, uh, he does so many things. I know that like each one of them would have a name for the position, for what it is. But since he's like doing it all, you know, sound guru, sound wizard, sound magician, and, you know, I didn't know him personally before I, you know, listened to the other, the first season of these plays. Um, but I've heard his work um, uh, on the various, uh, like, uh, stage readings and things that, that are broadcast around town. And I didn't know who that was, but then I heard his work on the previous Zip Code plays, and somebody said his name, and then I met him, and I'm like, and he started talking about his credits. I'm like, oh my gosh, I've just, I've heard your work for years in Los Angeles. And the meeting with him, when we just went through the script and he would bring things up and I'm like, oh, right. That has a sound to it. Yeah, he just, he just had such like, I mean, why am I saying he's a pro? Like, why would I even think differently? But um, he opened my eyes to like the choices that you need to make when you write something like this. So of the, in this whole process, the biggest education I got was from him in how to write toward the medium and then think creatively within that to sort of get past just footsteps, you know what I mean? Or just like doors opening, like think of the smaller details that really create a world in radio theater. I actually went into this thinking, you know, if you're writing a radio play, it's a stage play and you put in sound. Like I thought that was like the brief and that's not true. <laughs> uh, it's somewhere between writing a screenplay and a stage play. It, my process anyway, was writing, just writing it, 
here, here's the story. Here's the narrative, you know, beginning, middle and end. Then going back and taking and looking at all the stage directions where I have movement or things like that and thinking about, oh, people can't see this. Like what, oh, well, here's a big thing. The big thing in my play is it is a, there's, it's about race on some level. How do you let your audience know that one of your characters is black? They can't see him. And you can't presume that somebody will like pick it up through their voice, or maybe even you can't presume that somebody will pick it up through the dialogue that you give them. So you have to figure out a way that in a medium where you can't see the performers, how you translate that. And um, that was one of the places where, when we were rehearsing this, that I looked to Parnell and Michael Shepard um, to sort of guide me on what would be sort of acceptable language wise, reference wise, who would say it, like that kind of thing to establish that character. And that was, I really love that challenge specifically. Um, but yeah, so there's, so, so there's that, but then there's also um, uh, knowing that when you change locations, like how does that manifest? Because you don't have lights up, lights down. You don't have set pieces moving on and off. All you have is sound to, you know, let you know where you are. Um, and so we had some talks about <laughs> how do we get from play, you know? So it's interesting. I, I came in writing one thing and then my second draft was I'd, I'd gone to radio play school courtesy of Jeff Gardner and um, and went through and, and refined or changed certain elements, visual elements into sound. So one of the things, you know, when I, when I wrote this play, I, and, just, and this is just particular to me as a playwright, I'm always, I always have my eye on something having a longer life than just the one production. So even though this is sort of specific for radio theater um in my head as soon as this is done there'll be a version of it that can be done on stage so i'll you know it'll i don't want to say it'll be take a step backwards but it'll be you know figuring out how the stuff that i felt needed to be translated to sound can then be sort of switched back to visual for the most part and yeah i mean i would love to to see it like you know, it's kind of kind of killed me not to actually be watching them record it. Um, so yeah, I would love to. I would love to see it on stage at some point. Uh, one of the great things about being involved in this project and just having the Zipco plays exist is um, getting to look at the Los Angeles area where I've lived for over twenty years. I've lived here longer than I've lived anywhere else in my life, but I haven't. You know, it's so spread out. I haven't seen it all still. And uh, one of the great things about the, just the fact that they exist is that I get to dip into all these areas that I may not have, you know, be super invested in already, but also the, the Antius's commitment to um, diversity and inclusion in the artists involved means that I get to hear people's work, both playwrights, actors, you know, sound directing um, from a really broad spectrum of, people of creators and you I get to have it all in sort of one place and I think that's really exciting so one of the things that NTS is doing is these walking tours of the zip codes that are in the zip code place and I would love for one <laughs> for West Hollywood certainly there are some um fun places to like discover in West Hollywood and certainly there are some places that Let's just say that the straight world may not be quite as privy to <laughs> in West Hollywood that I would love to let them know about. Um, yeah, it's, it, you know, like I, I said earlier that there's something about West Hollywood where it's sort of in a, a medium state of crisis in that the, the culture of it is slowly being eroded. And so any way that we can keep that, record that, like preserve that in amber would be great. So um, yeah, a walking tour. I think um, what I want the audience to get out of my my zip code play is it sort of, it changed from when I started writing it to 
today. And I think the the big thing I want to get people to get out of it is that it is a person's personal responsibility to acknowledge another person's lived experience, to acknowledge that that is valid. It's not your responsibility to understand it 100%. It's not your responsibility to live it. It's not your responsibility really to do anything other than acknowledge that it's real. And in doing that, you give that person the space they need to move about in life um, with your support. Now, there's obviously action items. I feel that you know we can do as allies for each other, um, and those are situational, absolutely. But I think the, the the one main one is you just have to acknowledge that someone else is real. And just because you don't understand it and you haven't lived it doesn't mean that it's not valid and not important and possibly not more important than your own. Um, so that's what I would hope people would get out of it. And, you know, if it's, you know, everybody wants like, oh, I hope it starts a conversation. I hope it starts more than a conversation, but it'll start with a conversation. I'm not necessarily looking to change the world, but I am sort of looking to change people's minds. If you liked uh, listening to me prattle on about my play and various other things in theater, uh, you can check out my zip code play and all the rest of the zip code plays from both season one and season two at antias.org. There's also a lot of ways that if you want to support our theater that you can donate and you can sign up for our newsletter and we'll let you know the minute you can walk back into the actual building. But in the meantime, Please enjoy uh, the Zip Code Plays Season 2 wherever you get your podcasts or radio dramas. Well, you should listen to the zip code plays because they're going to be beautifully performed. Uh, the sound will be amazing. I already know that in advance. And the stories are good. And if you have any interest whatsoever in, you know, in humanity and human nature or in theater, that's exactly why you would listen to the zip code plays. But the more important fun thing is, again, that you get to see uh, little corners of Los Angeles that you might not see on a normal day. That, you know, a lot of people who are, Longtime Los Angeles residents or even native Angelinos don't get to all of the little corners of this city. It's, you know, the city is geographically huge and uh, spread out. And, you know, it's, you could live here for 10, 15 or 20 years before you realize, oh my gosh, there's this little neighborhood that's tucked here between, you know, Eagle Rock and Echo Park. And I never even saw this before. And it's, um, it's, you know, it's an absolutely fascinating city where from block to block or, you know, uh, from, or, you know, from half mile to half mile, you're going to be in a completely different temperature zone and a totally different architectural zone. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. And the zip code plays give you an opportunity to not have to drive and sit in heavy traffic and get to see these neighborhoods and see the people in them. Hi, I'm Paula Sismar. I'm one of the writers of the Zip Code Plays, season two from NTS Theater. If you want to know more about the 
uh, plays that we're doing. And if you want to know more about Antius, please go to their website and learn about the plays and how you can watch them. They're all free. And uh, you can watch this video to learn a little bit more about the VIG, uh, which is from Inglewood 90303. Well, the zip code plays were announced to Playwrights Lab members as an opportunity to explore various neighborhoods of Los Angeles and, you know, check out what's going on in some of the far reaches of LA and some of the hidden neighborhoods. So uh, we were all asked to um, pitch a story if we were interested in participating. And um, I uh, pitched the Englewood uh, idea to Antaeus and fortunately I was selected. And, you know, the idea I think is to look at this city in terms of what it actually is, which is, is this is not a single monolithic city with one culture and certainly not with one ethnic group or one racial group or even um, one geographical terrain. This is a very, very different kind of a place. And it's very exciting in that, in that regard. So um, I was looking at some of the neighborhoods that I really like and some of the neighborhoods that don't get visited often or talked about um, often. The, for the first iteration, I think I pitched a story in East LA um, that one did not get selected. And then um, this time around, I remembered um, how much I loved Englewood and the old vestiges of Hollywood Park. So I pitched that one this time and fortunately, you know, got to be one of the people writing one of the zip code plays. The idea for um, The Vig, which is my zip code play for Englewood 90303, uh, came from a lot of different sources. And that's pretty much true of um, the way I work in general. It's generally not one idea that occurs to me. It usually becomes a kind of uh, confluence of multiple ideas. So I had been thinking about a story for a long time about um, uh, based on my uncle who ran away when he was like 16 years old from home and eventually kind of became a uh, racetrack tout. Um, and then I was also thinking about Inglewood itself and the area near the airport and again the far reaches of Los Angeles. And then I was also thinking about the time when my husband was teaching at the UCLA paramedic school, which at the time was in Inglewood. And since I teach at USC, sometimes I would drop him off at Inglewood before I would go off to teach at USC. And it was usually too early to um, go to teach my classes. So I would grab a Starbucks and I would sit in the parking lot um, behind the Target on Century Boulevard where you could overlook um, the Hollywood Park racetrack and you could actually watch the exercise riders in the morning. Um, so it was always fascinating to me. It's usually very early in the morning, 7.30, 8 o'clock. And the exercise riders at that time were usually just finishing up their rides. And um, to watch them, you know, run these magnificent animals around that track, you know, not during a racing time, but just at the time that they were working out and, um, you know, having the horses experience this, um, this uh, place and, you know, getting to, you know, run their legs off, it was just really just kind of magical to me to, to just be sitting there with my cup of coffee early in the morning and watching this activity. So um, when the zip code plays were uh, announced as an opportunity for Playwrights Lab members, all of these ideas just started to come together in my head. It was like, well, suppose we have um, a character who works at the track or no, I don't really wanna do that. Suppose we have a character who is looking for someone who works at the track. And then I thought of my uncle. And then I thought of the days that I used to watch the exercise riders at the track. And it all just kind of coalesced. And on top of that became this question of why do people come to Los Angeles in the first place? Why do they come to California? You know, we usually come from other places. I know there are a lot of native Angelinos. I'm not one of them. I'm an adoptee. Um, but you know, it's very, very much my home. I, I can't imagine being anything but a Californian now. 
And so the question becomes, why do people come from other places and make their home here? And why is it such a place, you know, where so many people are accepted and rub elbows with each other? And would I really want to live in a place that wasn't as diverse anymore? And so I started to think about, you know, what it would be like to be this um, young woman who comes from a place that's totally alien from LA, who comes in search of her uncle who has, you know, made a place there. So that's essentially what the story is about. It's a, a young woman whose mother has just died, who comes to Hollywood Park to try to find this long lost uncle who has been secretly supporting the family or sending her mother money, but has not been in contact with his family for a very long time. So I also started to look at, you know, what it's like to be the outcast of a family and the one who doesn't fit in and the one who feels a certain amount of shame and doesn't want to be discovered by his family. So um, it's, it's a difficult uh, decision for Gio, one of the main characters to make to accept his past and to welcome his niece into his life. And in fact, um, that is the struggle of the play. Well, the, uh, the team for the zip code plays is just pretty amazing. I mean, and Tia's actors, as you know, are just uh, really wonderful, you know, absolutely incredible professionals. And uh, the uh, designer of all of this uh, sound insanity is Jeff Gardner, who it's, to me, a genius. So he is the one who's in charge of uh, the sound design, the, you know, creating all of the sound effects, doing all the Foley work, making sure that the actors all sound good. And um, then I also worked with an amazing director, Bernadette Speaks, who I adore, and three really incredible actors. And um, I'm really, really happy to uh, say that it's, you know, a diverse cast and a diverse team because I really wanted it to reflect the faces of Los Angeles. So, you know, I'm a white playwright, but I didn't want to write a play that was just all white people because that's not the way we live in LA. We live in a diverse world. So uh, the, the cast reflects that, the team reflects that. And the wonderful thing about it is, um, you know, as I started to think about this play and I started to think about what could you do in a sound only environment and what could you do that would be uh, possible in an audio play that you actually couldn't do on stage. And I started to think, well, horses, you know, you can hear the sound of horses. We can't really do this play on stage because you would miss the horses. You wouldn't, you know, you would have to have a character who is miming riding the horses or a character who is miming, you know, grooming the horses. But in an audio play, Jeff can create the sounds of the horses running. He can create the sound of the horses snorting. He can create the sound of, you know, the horses being, you know, washed down and groomed. So uh, it just became really exciting to me to kind of write in this fourth character, the, the horse who we hear only as a sound effect. So that was, that was part of the fun. But, you know, it's, it's, uh, it was just a really, really wonderful experience. I collaborated a lot with the artistic directors on rewrites. They gave great notes. Um, I was able to uh, be at rehearsal and hear the actors and hear their questions. And it's, you know, it's wonderful in play development when you can work with another uh, group of people who are creative and imaginative in their own right and they can actually contribute to the development of a play. So um, I had a really wonderful time. I think what I would like the audience to get from this play is a, a sense of melancholy for a certain kind of loss but also a, a sense of hope for how people can make connections. I should say that one of the things that gets addressed in the VIG is the fact that Hollywood Park doesn't exist anymore. I set the play two weeks before Hollywood Park was about to close down in December, 2013. And um, as you know, it's being, that entire area is being developed, it's being turned into a stadium and condos and restaurants. And that's something I think we have to think about, not only in Los Angeles, but in many of our cities. And that is, um, you know, what happens when we try to um, create 
a new place. You know, it's not that I'm totally against um, urban development, but unfortunately that usually leads to gentrification. And so we might get something shiny and new in its place, but what happens to the people who are living there? So that's one of the things I wanted the audience to think about when this play was over. Um, who, where, what's gonna happen to these people? Where is everybody gonna go who's now been displaced? because the exercise writer and um, the uncle who also works at the track are not going to have their jobs. They're gonna to have to move on and find a new life somewhere else. And the young woman who has come out to Los Angeles to look for a new life is not going to be able to find it there because this place is closing. So what are the, what are the trade-offs of so-called having progress and, um, and then displacing the people who've lived someplace for for years and years. And then what about the loss of relationships and what kind of loss is there when we leave our families behind? So all of those questions I think are, you know, one of the things that I was hoping the audience would think about when this play is over. And those are kind of melancholic and regretful things, but I also wanted them to leave with a sense that new connections have been made and that um, people are very resilient and will just keep moving on and going forward. So I, I'm kind of hoping for a you know complicated response. And also I'm hoping that people will have some fun. As I said, you know, you get to imagine that you're at a racetrack and you're hearing the horses running and with any luck you'll feel as if you're riding the horse yourself. One of the things about the zip code plays is that they're just fun. You know, um, it's it's not it's not a a burden. I mean I I am uh, largely uh, guilty about writing some plays that are intense and heavy and bleak. Um, and the good news is the zip code plays are not that. They're, they're fun. They're short. Um, you can uh, go to many different locations and hear different voices in a not particularly long time. You can spread them out. You can uh, listen one at a time or listen to all of them in a great big, you know, uh, clump. But they're fun and they're they're different and each voice is very, very different. Each of the playwrights selected write completely and totally differently from the others and have taken on topics that are completely and totally different. So it's this wonderful wide array of not only uh, writing voices, but also of reflections of uh, the stories of the people of, the, of this community. So, um, and it's fun, it's not, it's not intense, it's not heavy. This for a change is not, you know, me in a bleak mode and the other playwrights also have, you know, made sure that the experience is, you know, um, insightful, but fun. If you enjoyed this conversation about the Zip Code Plays and NTS Theater, please go to their website and learn about the plays and how you can download them. They're all free. And also uh, go on the walking tour. It's fun. I think you'll see a lot uh, about the city of Los Angeles that you didn't actually know. So I do hope you have fun and enjoy it. What I'm looking forward to in season two of the Zip Code plays, um, just really basic. I'm just, first of all, looking to just hear a good story. I'm looking to go for a good ride. And I know the writers who are involved will give us that. 
but also how they're able to, within that ride, incorporate the history of whatever zip code they're focused on, whatever zip code that they brought to the table, you know, because there's stories that I know I don't have any clue about that I would be totally surprised to learn of. So that's what I'm looking forward to on this go around, just like last time. I think any listener should come and hear the zip code plays. One, you're going to be entertained. I mean, you know, that's the first thing. People want to be entertained. They want to go for a ride. Just like I, I spoke of before. You know, I want to go for a ride. I want to hear a good story. And I want to hear good performances. And that's why they should come, first of all, because they will be entertained. But secondly, because you're going to find out history that you didn't have any idea about. You're going to find out about these little places and some of these people uh, in L.A., in the L.A. County area that you didn't know about before. And again, the history and how it relates to today will be there for people to pick up on. And so I think not only will it make you entertained, but it will also leave you with the ability to gain knowledge that you didn't have before. And in gaining that knowledge, actually making yourself better in a, in a certain type of way. Because when you have knowledge, then you can seek out more things that you didn't know existed before. And that knowledge will make you even a better person than you were before you came into it. Hey, I'm Kari Wyatt, author of Gold and Shine. And if you uh, want to learn more about my podcast audio play, watch this video. The idea for Gold and Shine uh, came about. I just was looking for an idea because they were accepting pitches for Zip Code Plays 2. And I was thinking I wasn't even going to submit. And then I thought, well, you know, let me just walk around, live my life see if anything came to mind. Uh, eventually, I just happened to be online and I found something about the gold rush. And I was like, hmm, the gold rush, that could be interesting. So I started delving deeper into the gold rush and I discovered that the actual first gold in California wasn't found up north. It was found in Antelope Valley down here in Southern California. And so then I was like, wow, that's an interesting history that most people don't realize. And I, in, in researching that topic about the gold rush, I discovered that uh, slave owners from the South came out here also to strike their fortune. And they would bring some of their slaves with them. And sometimes those slaves would run away <laughs> and, and, and gain their freedom. So I was like, you know what? All of that could be very interesting history to incorporate to this audio play, along with the fact that Pacoima itself was really one of the only places in the valley where black people could live up until like the early 60s because of housing covenants and general discrimination black people weren't living in various parts of the city it was either south central or Pacoima was also another point another point in the uh la county where a lot of black residents lived and then once housing covenants were broken and dis you know different uh discriminatory practices were stopped then black people started to move into other parts of the valley and other parts of Los Angeles in general. So I said, you know, all that is an interesting history. And even as far back as in the 1800s, Pacoima, before it was even called Pacoima, was a place that was very diverse, whereas other parts of L.A. weren't. But Pacoima was always that. So I said, oh, you know, I need to set this here because I didn't know that about Pacoima. You know, I've driven past Pacoima, I've driven through it. I, I didn't know there was this history of diversity. Okay, the main character is a, a college professor named uh, Dr. Lachey Fair. And she is a professor at a fictional local university who's disaffected uh, by her job and by something that's happened at her job. And she is thinking of leaving the profession. And she runs into a man named Samson who is in her neighborhood walking through the neighborhood who has a mule and they have some interaction and <laughs> that interaction leads to some things. I won't get too far into it because I want it to be surprising. And she also has a friend who's a part of the story named Nona, who's also a college professor. The uh, team is uh, Sandra McLean. She directed it. I was introduced to her through our uh, associate, uh, through our artistic director, actually, Bill Brockstrup and uh, Kitty Swink, and uh, they uh, put me in contact with Sandra, and she did a wonderful job. She was excellent to work with. She was very insightful and gave me some good feedback. 
that uh, helped me make the story better, helped me make the story just a little bit more poignant than it was on the first draft I had written. Karen Molina White plays uh, Lachey. Tamika Kate Donegal plays her friend Nona. And Dale Turner plays Samson. And these are all Antius associated actors. They're in the company at Antius. And so I didn't have to go far to find talent. What I would like for the audience to get out of the play, what I would, actually what I would love for the audience to get out of the play is really not just the sense of the history of the gold rush or of what Pacoima was in terms of uh, a bastion for black people in a certain time period in terms of being able to live there. I would also like people to understand uh, how the university system itself is not just a place of education. You know, universities are corporate, are big business. They're not, they're nonprofits officially, but they're really big business. They have investments like, like, you know, they have investments like a corporation would have investments. You know, they are trying to make money in their way and people can be victimized by that. I'd also like people to get out of it that we are connected to our history. History is not just something that happened back then. History is always present. The things that happen in history don't just disappear. You know, the tendrils of it float through throughout time and space. The things that happened in 1860s are still happening today. You had that you had that uh, riot, that insurrection at the Capitol on January 6th. You had many of those people who would say blue lives matter, but they killed they killed a police officer. They assaulted police officers in that same insurrection. You know, the response to those people was much different than the protesters for Black Lives Matter who had been in the city just in June. The presence of the police, the tactics of the police force were totally diametrically opposed. So and the FBI has informed Congress on a couple of occasions now that domestic terrorism, specifically white supremacists, are the biggest threat to our national security. This has been true for over a hundred years. So when you talk about the history of the Ku Klux Klan, you talk about the history of uh, Nazis, of white nationalists, we're still talking about the same things today. So because something happened back in the history, you know, doesn't mean it's over. It just happened back then, but you can still see a hand from back then into your, in, in your present day. So I really want people, if nothing else, get that. And the things that people have gone through to get you to where you are today. I want people to really appreciate that there are people who came before you that help you to get where you are. And that you don't live your life for that. You have to live your own life for the way you want to live it. But there is some honor that needs to be paid for those that paved the way for you to get where you are. I mean, really, the art is the spiritual backbone of any community. It's the spiritual back backbone of your nation. The things that are happening, it's a time capsule, right? The things that I could go look at a play from Eugene O'Neill's time and find out what, what was going on in part of this country at that time period. You know, so on throughout the ages, that's what art serves to do. It, it shows us ourselves. It helps us connect to ourselves. It helps us connect to other people. It helps us to have experiences that we might not have had ourselves personally. It creates empathy at its best. You know, even if it's not an experience that you've had, somebody has had it and you see it played out in a dramatic form. And usually I would say when people see art, art connects in, with people in a way that a politician can't, com can't connect with a person. It connects in a way that an activist can't connect with a person. It really seeps into your soul, whether you want it to or not, because that's what art is. It reaches inside you when you see it or when you hear it or when you look at it. So Antius, like I've said, puts forth such quality work. So there's a lot for you to be moved by. There's a lot for you to learn from. And Antius does it at a, a high level with many different kinds of people. And if you were going to support a theater, Antius would be one to support because 
is really coming from that place of art being pure, art making a difference in a person's life. Hey, I'm Kari Wyatt, playwright, Golden Shine, a part of Zip Code Plays too. And if you've enjoyed this conversation, please go to Antius's website and support the theater in any way you can, whether that's volunteering or whether that's a cash donation. All help is appreciated. People should listen to the zip code plays because of actually many different reasons. LA is super, super diverse. Um, and I don't know that people always get a chance to experience that. And what I mean by that is literally, um, you know, we get into our routines and we sort of, you know, you don't go to Echo Park, you don't go to North Hollywood, you don't go to Westwood because it's too far for driving or this or that or this or that. And we tend to only peripherally examine or no, peripherally kind of get a, get a feel for what neighborhoods are. And more than that, the people that live there and more than that, the people that kind of created those neighborhoods. And so I, I hope that through this art that you get to get deeper, that people will get to get deeper into what the neighborhoods are. And, you know, even for my North Hollywood play, I've got, I've got like one section of North Hollywood is what I'm examining. I'm not, I don't even talk about culture. I don't talk about like who, you know, who founded this area. I don't talk about the inhabitants. You know, there's just so much richness going on in LA and and I, I just hope that these give a little bit of a piece where people feel like, oh, I, I'll go explore that. I will be, look into that community, not just go and take from it, but, you know, like go there. And if you do have a coffee, sit down and talk to people and look who really lives there and, and just, you know, soak it up in a way as opposed to this sort of, this like consumer way that we have of either like driving through a town and making opinions about it, or maybe grabbing some food and taking it home and not really getting involved. Um, it was a roundabout way of saying, I hope that by listening to the zip code plays that we learn more about each other and about community. I'm Pepper Chambers. If you want to learn more about my play, The End of the Line and Antias's zip code plays, please watch this video. I heard about the zip code plays uh, because I am in another theater group, uh, Circle X Emerging Playwrights Group, and Kari Wyatt is in that group. And he mentioned that he had the zip code plays. He sent us the link to it. And of course, my mind was blown. It's like, oh my gosh, it's a radio play. And like, ah, you know. And so I listened and I loved it. And but that's how I was introduced. And I, and I knew I had to give it a go somehow, some way, be a part of it. So my play, End of the Line, started out as a 10-minute play, also for um, Antaeus. So they were doing um, submissions for a 10-minute play. And again, this was all during pandemic. I was like, I'm going to write a story. So I wrote a story that's, of course, loosely based on myself and my husband and this couple sitting on the porch getting drunk on a Tuesday afternoon and, um, and she starts to lose it because he's not listening to her and, she, you know, and, and then, but they laugh and they hug and they kiss at the end. So... I had that in mind. And then I also um, had a more serious topic in mind. So I am very close with the folks over at Lower Depth Theater Ensemble. And right before pandemic, um, 
I forgot the month. Let's just say it was September, October of 2020. They did a play called Safe Harbor by Tara Palmquist. And that was through their, uh, uh, their they have a commission series on uh, violence. And the topic was on sex trafficking and human trafficking. So I was a part of the development process in terms of literally just helping and being there and going, listening to Tira's words about these two girls who are trafficked. And through that, we also had experts coming in and talking to it, talking to us about it. So since last year or 2020, I'll say it was very much on my mind. How do I get involved? How do we watch for signs? And Literally, like I said, I live in North Hollywood and there's a, a coffee shop over here. And one day I, there was a woman there and I just, my instinct was like, I know she's being trafficked. What do I do? And it was this terrible, awful freak out moment of not knowing what to do and seeing she's in this situation and feeling absolutely helpless and terrified at the same time. So um, in that moment, I was able to kind of get her, you know, a coffee and talk to her a little bit. And so that experience is what I brought into my play. And I know that many of us, you know, we see these people on the street, these people meaning not those people, but people on the street, and you're just not certain sometimes of what is going on in their lives, you know, and you're sitting there with your coffee and, you know, your sunglasses living this life and everything is not maybe great for you, but something is really going on with them. And so I just wanted to shine a light on awareness and being aware of what's going on in our community and also finding the tools to actually help people that actually need our help. So end of the line, the, uh, the main story of it is there's a woman, she's having some cocktails on her porch with her husband here in North Hollywood. And all of a sudden she hears a commotion downstairs and she runs down there and she tries to help uh, this woman who's in trouble. And it turns out that um, she learns, you know, she has the thought about herself and, and who she's really trying to help, if it's the woman or herself. The, my team, our team, the team is fantastic naturally. So our director is Greg Daniel. And again, he's uh, one of the uh, co-founders of Lower Depth Theater Ensemble. So I got really lucky in terms of uh, Greg is already associated with Antis, and so I got lucky that he said yes, that he would direct this uh, this wonderful piece. So Greg came on to the piece and then the rest of the actors are obviously from the group. And so we have, we have uh, Tamara and we have Rob and we have Millie slash Mildred. And um, so Tamara and Rob are the couple and Millie is the woman in trouble. And they are absolutely fantastic just in terms of the, this, like the, 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 the essence, the essence of the characters, because, you know, it's so, it's all audio and they really understood what I was trying to get across in terms of not just the humor, because you have to have humor, even in these tense moments, but also the love of the character, the love between the, the husband and wife, and then the delicate intimacy and another type of love for these two black women that are in very different economic and just sort of um, life situations and how they connect. So all three of them are just fantastic, which you'll hear. And then how about the audio? So Jeff Gardner, as everyone knows, he, man, I learned so much, so, so much, like little things like, uh, okay, so if you're, you know, if as a writer and you, if you want someone to take a sip, you know, not just the sound, but when do they take a sip? So do they take a sip before? And then I said such and such and such and such. Or is it I, I such and such and such and such? You know, and Greg, I'm sorry, Jeff was like, okay, so if you put that moment here, it sets up this type of drama. If you put it here, it puts a space. So I learned so much about the technique, but also the storytelling that comes that is that is in sound, you know, that it's I don't even know how to explain the excitement I have <laughs> of working on this and the knowledge that Jeff brought. He's so brilliant. And it's just it, it's a, a art form that I feel is sort of lost, you know, and I feel like he's got a great handle on it. And it's great at communicating to all of us, whether direction for Greg to direct the actors or for me and how to write it into the script. And then, of course, for the actors to execute. So it was 
absolutely fantastic. So the difference that I'm finding between be, between writing a, uh, a regular stage play and, and a radio play is that um, you're thinking of it in a literally just in a different way. So you're thinking about the sound effects. So literally you're writing in SFX, like sound effects, and you might say, um, heels walking on the concrete but then you get into what type of heels like is it a chunky wood heel is it a spiky heel because you think like those make different sounds and also we know that that type of heel is going to be related to your character so like if you're in the spike heel is it a woman that's like you know in a business suit and blah 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 or if it's a chunky heel is she kind of uh you know like grungy woman walking through this through the city so you get really specific in the type of sound and then where you want it to go and how you want it to be used and so that's just one part is the sound effect and then within there you're thinking about how sound uh informs your audience about what's going on so for example then i have a cafe scene and there were things like um um like we put in the bell of the door, you know, for the door opening and closing. So then you would know, okay, you have this feeling of like, this is a busy cafe. Uh, there's people coming and going. Um, and then the sound behind us, we have the sound of a, a chair scraping, scraping across the floor. And that got really specific. Is it a wood floor? I'm sorry, is it a wood chair on a concrete floor? Is it a metal chair on wood? You know, and you start thinking about those sounds. And as you're writing for that medium, your imagination just explodes in another way. So I still may have written for a stage play, I still may have written that, uh, you know, they're sitting in a metal chair, but now for the stage play, I'm thinking, I'm sorry, for the radio play, I'm like, ooh, when do I want to hear that specific sound and why? And is it fast? Like, is, it, is the character mad? So, you know, you get a quick sound or is it, is it slow because someone's creeping in? You know, there's just all these things that you can, that you can bring in and play with and, but it's specific, it's specific. Like you have to, you can't just be willy nilly with it. You have to say, like I said, the metal chair on the wood, because that says something It tells you where you are. And um, you just get a, another toy box of specifics to play with in this medium. I would say, yes, it is another character, the sound and the audio and the directions. I want the audience, after listening to End of the Line, what I really want, is for people to have an awakening, to have an awareness and to, to really pay attention to community. I feel that we are literally, we are all here, you know, we're living on, especially in a big city like LA, like we're living on top of each other and we're not brushing each other like we are in New York, but we're all together, this microcosm. And instead of just sort of putting your blinders on and walking like this, I just want people to, open up and to pay attention and to, and to look at our biases and biases, biases and, and remove them when we can and understand when they are at play. Um, and I just, I just want us to have a human, can, to make our human connection deeper. And that's what I hope people will feel when they listen to this play. And I'm, I'm laughing because there's humor too. So I do hope that they get a couple chuckles in the beginning. I am Pepper Chambers. And if you enjoyed this conversation, please walk your way over, get your way over, run over, click over, do whatever you need to do to enjoy the zip code place and everything else that is offered with this lovely theater company. Thank you.
people should listen to the zip code plays because, um, well, they're fun. So that's the most important thing. They're fun. They're really fun. Um, many of them are lighthearted, like bingo bitches. It's comedy. Um, and also, uh, to tell you the truth, because all of us playwrights, we're very diverse. We come from different backgrounds. We have different ways of telling a story and we have different perspectives that may be interesting to an audience, uh, may be challenging for an audience, uh, may bring an audience something that they've never known before about the place where they live or places that they visit or places that they just zip past through on the freeway and never give a thought about. And it's a chance to really, you know, enjoy the city that we live in. I mean, Los Angeles is a remarkable city. It's like nestled in the arms of the San Gabriel mountains. And it's an opportunity to really, you know, enjoy the love song that is the zip code place. I mean, it's a, a love fest. And who doesn't like a love fest? So, yeah. That's the reason why you should listen. It's fun. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Wong. And if you want to know more about my zip code play and about Antius Theater, watch this video. Uh, the zip code plays are fun to listen to because you really get to focus on the words. And, you know, for a playwright, that's like warms the cockles of your little heart. You know, it's like, oh, I love that because you're listening to words, and I love words, new words. Um, uh, that's one of the joys of the audio play. And also it's uh, asking the audience to fill it in. To, instead, so you, you doing the audience, the listeners doing the work of creating the world that they see as inspired by the sounds that they're hearing, by the words, that are being spoken. And I think that is just another way of, of, of reaching into the heart of an audience um, through their ears. The inspiration for my zip code play, 91754, Monterey Park, Bingo Bitches. Um, I had to write it because the title, <laughs> the title, Bingo Bitches, <laughs> that was inspiring enough. Um, but the seed for the story um, actually came from a random woman, a Latina. I was standing um, in front of her as we were waiting in line at a grand opening of a new business in Monterey Park. Uh, this business was giving, uh, giving away swag to the first 100 people in line. So I was in line waiting for the swag bag and I love free stuff. So what can I say? I went and I met this lady as we were waiting in line. And we got to talking and she told me that after she finishes up getting her swag, that she was going to go play bingo. And I thought, oh, okay, so you're going to play bingo. And she told me how cutthroat uh, bingo at the senior center was. And then she told me that there were really big payouts at these bingo games. And at once she won like about $200 at a bingo game, one bingo game off of the seniors. So... <laughs> This uh, uh, seemingly innocuous encounter in a line uh, germinated in my brain for a while because I had that encounter for a while. And sometimes that's just how playwrights' minds work. The writer's mind works. You just kind of file it away under maybe, maybe something can happen with this. I don't know. And then, so while it was on the back burner, uh, the Antius uh, Theater had this opportunity and I pitched the uh, idea. It was just like a line, like Cutthroat Senior Center Bingo in Monterey Park. That was it. I didn't even know what, what that was going to be. I just had the one line. I wrote it like I got the email that uh, was a call for entries, for submissions. I wrote three ideas like bada bing, bada boom, just really fast. And I sent it. I didn't even reread it. <laughs> and then uh, I hope that there wasn't too many typos, but um, so that from that, from the moment they said yes, is the moment I started thinking, um, okay, now I'm committed to writing this. What is it, what is it gonna be? Uh, how can I 
uh, make it fun and also explore the world of what it's like for senior citizens and bingo and what that means to them. And uh, that's, <laughs> that's, that's how the story began. It began with a, it began with the lady in line who is, you know, going to play bingo and describing how vicious it was. And then me filing that information away until I was able to secure a commission. And then, you know, was as an outgrowth of that commission was forced and focused on writing the play. Antius assembled an awesome team of really uber talented artists for this play, my play. Um, there was uh, Jennifer Chang, who is an actress, director, artistic director of Talk Repertory Theater, which is located in Atwater Village. Um, she's uh, a theater professor down in San Diego at UCSD. She won the LA Drama Critics Award for um, her directorial work on Viet Gong, which was a production at East West Players. And she was my director and kind of at the helm of this. And she was also very good uh, with dramaturgy and she read the play and was able to give me some fantastic notes for the play. You know, I originally wrote the play with kind of a bittersweet ending, kind of a, you know, this, the height of the pandemic. So I was feeling very, very annoyed. And I put that annoyance, I suppose, into the play. But then Jennifer actually reminded me and also some of the, uh, uh, and Bill, um, Kitty, uh, Anna Rose, they, the management at Antias gently suggested like uh, maybe a happier ending. And, uh, you know, after thinking about it and, and listening to their comments, I actually uh, reworked the ending so that it's an uplifting ending. It's an ending uh, of hope. It's an ending that uh, actually serves my purpose and the play uh, more beautifully than uh, I originally imagined. So it was very definitely a beautiful collaboration of artistic minds that helped shape the ending of the play. I don't want to give it away though. And um, Antias also uh, really wanted to bring authenticity to the characters by casting, you know, Chinese uh, actors by casting an Armenian actor. So um, there was Cece Lau, who is a longtime actor and uh well, she's the former first lady of Monterey Park. Her husband, David Lau, was a ma mayor of the city. So, um, and Cece was great at really helping me with the Chinese language in the play. And she was very supportive and also, you know, really supportive about a happy ending or a or uplifting ending. And she was so right. You know, sometimes playwrights, when we're in a mood, you know, we write reflecting that mood, but actually it wasn't serving the play very well. Um, so getting the feedback from uh, fellow artists helped me see that, ah, to look for a way to, to be, um, be funnier. <laughs> So, you know, bingo bitches, hello, comedy. <laughs> um, so, and there was also Jade Haikush, who is a uh, actor who I didn't know at first, but she's a veteran actor who is recommended by an NTS member, uh, Rhonda Aldrich. Um, Jade, she was fantastic with putting Armenian in the play. She, you know, I told her I really wanted to put languages and I love hearing the music of other languages in my play. So I put that music uh, into my work and um, I'm, she was great with some of the colorful uh, Armenian phrases, if you know what I'm saying, <laughs> colorful. Um, and uh, so I thank her for that. And then uh, finally, last but not least, there was Karen Huey who plays um, uh, a character who is sort of based uh, well, uh, a little bit like me, <laughs> although I've never played bingo. Um, but Karen Huey, she is like the voice over queen. I mean, you can hear her work in all the Star Wars movies, um, Deadpool, um, Good Trouble, the TV show, which is one of my favorite shows. Um, she's voiced over 1500 uh, like films and TV shows. And she's like the voice of the character Eureka in that popular video game. Um, uh, Ghost of uh, Tushima, Ghost of Tushima, and 
Karen supported my application, like I told you, to the NTS Playwrights Lab. And she's also a playwright. And uh, in fact, I've taught her plays. Uh, song, uh, I taught Song of Harmony, Songs of Harmony uh, at um, Boston Conservatory at Berkeley, which is where I teach. I'm teaching uh, contemporary Asian American plays and also script analysis uh, at uh, BOCO. And uh, I was able to, uh, uh, bring one of her plays to the students and introduce them to her work as a playwright. Um, but most of all, she's my friend. And um, this is the first time I've ever had a chance to work with her. So that's always a pleasure to be able to work with your friends. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's really great to be able to work with your friends after all these years of, you know, promising and thinking about working together. And at last, Thanks to Antias, we got a chance to do it. And that was really awesome. Um, so that was the cast. That was the director. And also I should mention someone who I work closely with, Jeff Gardner, who's like won a bazillion awards. And he helped and develop the, the Foley and the soundscape, the world for Bingo Bitches. Um, I mean, he was an absolute joy to work with. He honors the script. Um, he honors the words. He knows how to enhance as well as, you know, just let the characters speak. So he, he's one of those rare people who knows like sound when it helps and sound when silence is best. And it's just great to work with someone um, who's so collaborative. And he was a lot of fun for me to uh, work with and bounce ideas off of because this... This is my first audio play, my first one. So it was great to have some guidance from Jeff. Difference between a normal and regular play and an audio play obviously is uh, that the audience cannot see that the actors are 80 years old. You know, that if we were on stage, if we were on stage, you would be able to see that I am, my characters are all in their 80s. They could do that with costuming. They can do that with lighting. They do that with their acting um, sculptures in space with their bodies. You could see that in a play. But in an audio play, you don't see that they're really uh, 80 years old. They have to, I have to tell you that they're 80 and hint at their life to hint at their timetable in their lives. Do you see what I'm saying? That, and um, so the actors have to do, so the actors, I have to work with an actor, thinking of the actor, how do I um, let the audience know through the actor that they don't see. So my work is different. I have to actually try to find a way to take things that would have been obvious were you to see it on stage um, and I would have to write it in a way, finesse it in a way that isn't expositional. So I don't want exposition. So I'm gonna have to try to hide it, but still find it. A way to tell you that they are older, they have different life experience that um, uh, over many, you know, 80 years, I have a character who's like over a hundred. So they, because they're older like this, um, you have to talk about, they have to discuss life experiences. And that actually informed the play. It gave the play its connection, the, their historical connection that people who are older may have from the life that they lived, the history that they have seen. So that history that they have seen, that history that they have lived, the things that inform who they are play out in my play. So it's a comedy, but it is also uh, how people connect through their histories, not only personal history, but also uh, world history. So that's one of the ways that uh, you have to think differently when you're writing a stage play versus an audio play. Um, and also, as I said, sound is a big, I mean, uh, you create the world, you don't see it on stage. Uh, 
of a bingo parlor or a bingo hall at the senior center. You don't see the bingo um, uh, cage. You don't see the cards or the little dauber that they use to um, mark their uh, numbers as it's being called. Uh, you don't see that on stage, but you hear it in an audio play. And then you, the audience, can imagine what that place looks like. And your place that you imagine in your mind is gonna to be totally different than the place that I imagine in my mind, or even in a stage play, because they give you the world that they imagine, the set designer imagines. So you, you don't have the benefit of what the set designer imagined. You have your own imagination in an audio play. And I think that's the, the, the wonderment of an audio play. And I'm just thrilled to have been able to write one finally. In a lot of ways, our plays also dovetail because I don't know how that happens, but it's, it's weird how that happens, that the synchronicity that we all kind of uh, found a way to modernize um, and make vivid something that was happened in the past, that was in the past, a history from the uh, uh, maybe unknown history or forgotten history from the past. And uh, both Wyatt and I do that uh, in our plays. And the other plays do it too, to varying degrees. So it is kind of amazing that there is some kind of weird uh, psychic uh, subconscious uh, thread that we all kind of like dove into the uh, cosmic idea pool and then kind of got out and then started writing our plays. And we all have little uh, suggestions that interrelate to one another. And I was surprised actually that we all did something in that was so, that, that the tendrils from the past kind of informed the present of the play. What I want the audience to get out of uh, Bingo Bitches is just pure enjoyment. I just want to uh, make your life a little lighter, uh, to make um, you smile when you hear the play, um, you know, I'm not gonna lie and say I didn't sneak some sneaky, serious things in the play, but um, for the most part, my purpose was to uplift and to uh, uh, offer enjoyment and pleasure and to introduce uh, audiences to a community that they may not know about. Um, the city of Monterey Park is a very interesting city. It's a primarily Asian community, but it has been always in transition. Uh, people from all kinds of uh, backgrounds, uh, racial backgrounds have lived in this city and uh, they pass the city down to each other as uh, they move on through life. And um, so, and you see vestiges of that heritage uh, in the city, um, you know, Monterey, Monterey Park used to be, uh, the, you know, the Gabrielino, uh, Shoshone Gabrielino Indian Territory. And then it, you know, moved on to um, a, a Spanish, uh, uh, Latin, uh, white, uh, Asian. I mean, we all live here. Or we all have a, a heritage that, um, thanks to the Gabrielino uh, a tribe that used to live here that we, that were by their graces living on this property. <laughs> I'm living in this city. Um, you know, and I wouldn't have known that unless I started uh, the zip code play uh, journey. And uh, in my research, uh, as I was trying to figure out what to write, you know, you learn things. And that's, that's one of the benefits for me as I, I learned about my own community um, and I want to share what I learned and what I enjoyed and what I what insights I have uh, from living here um, with uh, with my with the listeners to the Zip Code Play. So uh, I think that my first and foremost, though, is to offer um, entertainment uh, and joy, and that's so important to me, especially. Uh, with the pandemic uh, having taken a year of our a year and a half of our lives and so this play was written last year and was very you know uh, or started the germination of it started last year and 
I just wanted to offer up some laughter and some pleasure and some joy to listeners and audience uh, audiences. And that's the reason why I didn't um, set the play during the pandemic. You know, oftentimes as a playwright of conscience, I would have probably in the beginning wanted to set the play uh, during the pandemic, but I soon learned that, uh, I don't know, I just, I was just sad and I wanted, I was just uh, wanting to set the play at a time before the pandemic when everybody could get together. And, and uh, that's, that's why the play starts um, before the pandemic, before COVID ever hit, that you um, get a chance to uh, remember what, uh, what it was like. And I'm so happy that, you know, now it looks like uh, things are normalizing and we can start seeing one another again. You know, I think that's the reason why I picked the senior center too, because it broke my heart that a lot of people could not even see their grandparents. Um, I know my nephews could not see their grandmother, my mother, um, during the last year. Uh, and that saddened me. So it had a lot to do with why I chose the senior center as a location. You know, the pandemic had a lot to do with why I wanted to laugh more and to forget my troubles, to write a comedy. And that's what I want audiences to take away. I just want them to laugh. Antias needs to be supported because theater is hard work. It takes a lot of money at the level that Antias does its theater work. So, um, Support is greatly appreciated, not only in terms of finances, but just butts in the seats. Um, that's the most important thing, is having uh, people come to the theater to engage with the work, to be, you know, to laugh, to cry, to question, to be uplifted, to be transported, to feel the magic. And, you know, that's, why Antias is so important to this community and to the artistic community, and it deserves your support. So why not do it? <laughs> Write a check. <laughs> Come to the theater when it opens and sit in the seats and just watch and be delighted. And it's worth it. I mean, this reason why we are all going to work so that we can, you know, go to concerts, go to, go to movies and go experience the communal uh, experience that is the theater. So Antius is an important part of that in Los Angeles and, you know, get your butts in the seat and write a check. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Wong. I'm a playwright based in Los Angeles. And if you've enjoyed this conversation, please go to the Antius website and check out the Zip Code Plays, my play, of course, and also there are other productions. Thanks for listening. So season three, we are very excited to um, finally have a play in our very own hometown of Glendale. This is set in 91201 Glendale, The Six Pianos of Miradero, and that is written by Alex Goldberg, who wrote our um, 
our Pacific Palisades show last uh, in season one. So he has returned uh, for us to open up this season in Glendale, our hometown. And this is a little history play about um, Mr. Brand, who um, Brand Avenue is named after. Our, our theater is a, you know, just around the corner from Brand Avenue on Broadway. Um, this is the story about uh, his uh, wife, his will, and his legacy in Glendale. Um, the Six Pianos of Miradero. Uh, then we go to 91505 Burbank for True Sound by Steve Apostolina. Um, uh, you know, Steve is a, a writer and actor, but he also makes uh, his living working in um, uh, post-production voiceovers, doing uh, looping and uh, uh, Walla groups. And he knows that world of post-production uh, very well. And this play is set in a Burbank soundstage late at night where a, uh, an apprentice and a master of the uh, art of um, post-production sound meet and uh, things get a little dicey. Uh, that's called True Sound. Then we will go to 90262 Linwood, Blue Like You, written by Ann Noble, which is a story of a mother and daughter uh, coming together after a very long uh, time being apart. And it is a very funny, touching, gentle play about uh, the importance of names and what we call ourselves and who we are. And that is Blue Like You. Uh, then we are going to uh, 90027 Griffith Park, uh, where Pepper Chambers, who wrote our North Hollywood play in season two, is back with The Fire in Between, which tells the story of uh, a couple ambitious young men um, uh, and uh, Griffith Park and an incident that happened in 1933, a true story um, that, uh, that takes place in the park, which is a... Uh, um, you know, we're very lucky to have a huge urban wilderness in the middle of Los Angeles, um, and that's Griffith Park. Uh, then we will go to 90039 Frogtown for um, Anaxorus Boreas, which is a uh, story about a gentrifying neighborhood um, and uh, some <laughs> a bit of a, a biblical plague uh, happens, uh, happens there as uh, new residents of the community are faced with um, some unexpected neighbors. Uh, oh, I should say, A Frogtown is written by Daniel Hirsch. And then uh, Diana Burbano brings us 90028 Hollywood, Marie Dressler, Good Gal. Um, a look at uh, uh, the early days of the film industry in Hollywood, where, um, you know, which brought so many of us to, uh, to town uh, to pursue that film and television world. And uh, Diana Burbano looks at Marie Dressler, a character actress from the uh, from the beginning of Hollywood, and her sort of struggles and uh, triumphs, and how she makes it in this uh, in this early days of the silver screen, which we thought was an appropriate way to um, to wrap up season three. So we created um, some additional programming around the Zip Code plays, and that's the Zip Code Play Tours. Um, what we decided to do was choose uh, landmarks, uh, historical highlights, uh, architectural gems, uh, points of interest in each one of the zip codes um, and make a, a, an audio tour of them. And these are tours that you can do um, uh, virtually, digitally, you can um, uh, follow them along uh, or you can actually go to the zip code and drive around and, um, and look at these. We have, um, uh, great actors from within our company narrating the tours. So much like when you go to a museum and there's an audio tour that you listen to as you go around the museum, these audio tours will uh, bring you uh, throughout the zip code, each, each individual zip code, and you'll learn about the, uh, the, the sites and, uh, uh, of that spot. And they're really interesting. I've gone and done them all. So, uh, you know, as a test case. And, you know, there are parts of uh, Los Angeles that I don't know and I was not aware of at all. And so the chance to drive around them and get to know those places has been a real treat. And whether, you know, whether you live on the west side or the east side or wherever you are, there's probably a part of town you don't know so well. So uh, Pacific Palisades was a place I had really didn't know very well. And Pacoima is another place I did not know very well. So um, we, we go all around Los Angeles and um, it's a chance to get to know these places. When we first uh, released them, it was uh, right during um, a lockdown that had, had come up. So we were recommending to everyone that they do them uh, virtually and uh, give them a listen. And you can see pictures and um, and listen to the, to the to the explanations of the places. But I think now, you know, people are are um, careful and and take uh, take 
caution. They should be able to go around and do these in person as well. And we also uh, were able to hook up with individual um, independently owned businesses in each each of the zip codes. So, you know, there are, are stops for uh, uh, coffee or uh, uh, snacks uh, along the way. So we recommend that you uh, um, uh, give those places a try and uh, uh, get to know the neighborhoods. It's a good way to, to get to know Los Angeles. And, you know, also when you, it's been interesting now that we have quite a few of them to see how much, um, you know, one architect who worked in, in this neighborhood turns out did something over here and turns out they did something else over here. So there are a lot of uh, connections that start to, to happen um, if, you, if you take advantage of the entire, the entire program. And those are the zip code play tours. I think the thing I want people to take away from the entire zip code play project is um, a sense of what Los Angeles is and who we are and uh, what this city is about. You know, it's a big, sprawling, unwieldy city. Um, we know that it takes uh, hours to drive across from one end to the other. Um, and it can be a place that is isolating in some ways. Um, you know, you don't run into people necessarily in the same way you do on the streets of New York or something. Um, and, uh, but when we put all these pieces together and you hear now we have 18, uh, zip code plays, when you hear them in their entirety, um, you start to really get, a, a, a sense of how this city is, uh, as a whole and all the unique pieces that make it up. And, um, and as a theater that wants to serve our community here, I think it's really important that we, we get to know Los Angeles better. And I think this will help people get to know Los Angeles better. I think people need to hear them because, uh, well, for one, the talent uh, and the caliber of the, the writing and the casts are um, incredible. I don't think anybody will be disappointed. I think anyone who listens to one will want to hear another. They're uh, a maximum a half hour long. So it's a nice bite-sized piece uh, for, your, for your walk or for your uh, cleaning the kitchen or the garage, um, folding the laundry. It's a perfect, it's a perfect way to uh, spend a little time immerse in another world um, and yeah there's no reason not to and they're free hi i'm bill brocktrip i'm the artistic director of uh, nts theater company um, and we invite you to uh, check out our website and everything going on at nts.org and um, and become a part of uh, what we're doing uh, thank you so much Viewers must, audiences must listen to the Zip Code Plays because it's enriching. It's an enriching experience that is uh, unique. 
you know, we're listening to a lot of podcasts these days and all of that, but uh, as a radio play, it has its own place, its own feeling, its own thing. And um, all of these stories have something unique to say. So I would say it's a must because um, to kind of give yourself something different to do, like literally creatively, but also to support. Um, I, I mean, man, like so much work has gone into this and it's, it's theater and going through us having no theater, you know, this is what we did. And so I think it is a must. It's a must to support and, um, and be there for all of us. My name is Pepper Chambers, and I am the writer of the zip code play 9027 Growth of Park, The Fire in Between. And if you would like to learn more, please listen to more of this conversation. So writing the second uh, zip code play with Antius, the experience having gone through the first to the second was that I knew, I knew the value, I guess, and the beauty of what sound can do and can bring. And so uh, that particular play is called The Fire in Between, and it's about uh, the Griffith Park uh, zip code. And so I, making the short story, is there's, there was a fire that happened in 1933 in Griffith Park. And so as soon as I learned that, all I could hear was the sound of the fire and like how much how much fun, for lack of a better word, that Jeff would have with creating that world. So it really, what I learned for sure was like, oh my gosh, how just the tool, I guess, like what the beauty of what sound can do and, and wanting to write to that. You know, other times you're writing for the actors or you're writing for the story, but man, I was like writing for how can we make the sound be gorgeous. So the story for The Fire in Between for Griffith Park it came from, um, at the time as well, you know, in Los Angeles, we're, we're kind of constantly um, having stories, headlines about fires. And so I thought, oh, well, I literally Googled, I believe I Googled what was the worst fire in Los Angeles. And that came up and then blew my mind. So um, the story is that, again, it was 1933, October, and there was, this was during Santa Ana, there was a Santa Ana that day, and it made it a perfect uh, storm, unfortunately, for this fire that happened in kind of a, a, a valley within Griffith Park. And uh, it was during the Depression, and so these men were a part of a work relief program, and they were there, you know, just trying to work. They weren't, they weren't like forest people, they weren't firefighters, they weren't anything, they were just men from all backgrounds working and then this fire started, unfortunately. And so the reason I had to tell the story is because as I dove into learning more about the men who lost their lives, I learned about them. So I learned that there were black men, there were Russian men, there were, you know, like all these, there, there were um, men from Puerto Rico and, but on their birth certificate, I found their death certificates and on their death certificates, it just said um, Mexican. And so this concept of like, these men were people who lived lives and I wanted to just do what I could to show who they could have, who they were, you know, with the, the time and space that I had. So it was important because it's a Los Angeles story and it's important because I, you know, the, the identities of these people, I, I wanted us to know about them. So the main story arc is that these two gentlemen meet um, on their way to, to the job site and one gentleman is Mexican and one gentleman is black and they're, they're driving through Los Angeles. So from, um, from kind of like Inglewood area and coming through Los Angeles and you get this feeling of driving through the city and getting all the way to this park that many of us, you know, like how often do we even go to Griffith Park? We, we kind of take, take, uh, take it for granted that it exists. So it, it is kind of the story of two men getting from different backgrounds, getting to know each other and seeing their similarities and their differences, like recognizing both of those things, and then getting to the site and having to deal a little bit with racism. I didn't want that to be the main thing because we know it exists, so I didn't need to talk about it so much, but show that they are dealing with racism at the time, but also the humanity of being people. And then also I brought in the um, element of nature. So I wanted to pay homage to the, um, um, I want to say indigenous, I hope that's correct, the indigenous people of Los Angeles, which is the uh, uh, Gabrielino um, tribe. 
And so I brought in the, that culture along with us respecting nature because we know too that these fires are happening because we're not respecting nature. So this, it's this concept of, of, of life and friendship and then of course um, death. The audience knows the identity of my gentleman because I do talk about it. So I, um, there's one part where I have um, um, the black character, he's trying to speak Spanish and the guy's like, you know, we don't need all of that. And so I try to creatively show who these people are through moments, you know, and then with, um, with the other gentleman being black, um, he, yeah, he says it. <laughs> you know, so I was, I was pretty much like kind of say it, but then, um, and then I talk about their experiences more than like the color of their skin or, you know, anything like that. So I just kind of bring up what they're going through to identify what their, what their ethnicity is. So the actors, the director and the tech behind this play, they're all, of course, fantastically amazing people. And, and everyone brought something so special to it. So my director was Ron Drell McCormick, and he goes by the name Drell, like you can call him Drell. And it was our first time working together and he has paired us and oh my gosh, this guy, he's, he's so introspective down to, you know, thinking about fabric, even though it's a radio play, like what kind of clothes were they, would the gentleman have been sitting on in the bus on their way to, to Griffith Park? And he was so into detail in the way that I'm in the detail. And we completely clicked and just fantastic amazingness. So Ron John McCormick was insanely fantastic. And then our cast was Peter Mendoza and uh, Gerard Joseph and Mark Dorr. So Peter played, um, you know, the, the young man that he's, he's, a, he's, he's, a, uh, uh, he's married to a woman that wants to be famous. Gerard has a baby on the way, but he doesn't know that this is what he wants, but he just wants to live life. And then Mark played uh, the, 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 um, the captain guy, oh, and, and he's the one that puts them to work, but he's, he was in the war before. So he's got this concept of what it really means, like life and death and fighting and battle. And so I bring these three men together in, in a moment where, um, again, I talk about humanity a lot, but where they really needed to be people in order to look at their own survival. And one other thing too, is I, I try to always bring women into my story. And so this is kind of one where it was this all male cast and, and um, I don't know, I'm just bringing it up because I do, I do, I am cognizant of having female characters. And then I'm like, well, I guess I'm the one representing for this one, <laughs> but those guys were great. And, and we cannot forget about Jeff Gardner, who does our sound. And um, he's a sound designer and just, he, he does a lot with NTS and actually around Los Angeles a lot, quite a bit. So he's just one of those sought after people that is so insanely talented at what he does. He just understands bringing in layers and beauty and, and using sound to the best that can be. What do I want for the audience? What, what I want for the audience to get out of this particular zip code play, The Fire in Between for Griffith Park is uh, two things. One is, is history. You know, Los Angeles has so many stories. And this is one, you know, I lived, I moved to Los Angeles in 2004, and I'd never heard about that story. So that's one thing, just knowing that this is another thing that happened in Los Angeles, as tragic as it was. And the other thing is that, um, you know, with my art and the way that I write, I do try to shed light on, on topics. So this one was about definitely about um, race and, 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 you know, because of where we came through, through 19, 2019, 2020, 21, and everyone being so polarized and you're this and you're that. And I just wanted to be like, we are, we are different and we must be different, but we have so many more similarities. And let's just please focus on, on, on the goodness of each other. Um, and that's what I want people to take away from this as well. When I listen to the third season plays for with uh, the zip code plays for NTS, I am listening for I'm listening for all the fun technical stuff. So I'm really listening for like, oh my gosh, what did that writer write, and what were they trying to accomplish with the sound? You know, the sound. And then I'm also listening to how the actors are interpreting this very brief moment. I mean, the recording has happened so fast. I think you get like to one rehearsal maybe, and and you go. It, you know, it's a very short process. So I'm listening for how quickly they are able to adapt to what they've been given 
and just shine in their talent. Like the talent is, is, is so incredible. It really is. Uh, and that's one of the fun things to listen to. Again, I talked about imagination earlier and it's so fun to hear how people are, you know, in this booth, and just using their imagination to make things come alive. So I'm listening for that creativity and I'm listening to uh, what the writer, you know, what they probably intended for us to experience. So if people don't know that the Antius also creates the zip code tours. So for each season, there is a tour that you can take that is related to the particular play. So the, it is super cool because you're on it and then you're learning different things about the area. And again, I talk about us knowing, you know, what we know about Los Angeles and the things that we don't. And these tours are so much like, oh gosh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. And, and it's, it's fascinating. It's just the coolest thing. I think it's so creative and what a great idea. What a great accompaniment to get to hear this fiction. Some things are fiction. Some things are, are like mine based on real things. But then you get this also, this um, tour that shows you the, the real things that you can just, you know, go there and do it. And it's, it's, I think it's fantastic. Viewers must, audiences must listen to the zip code plays because it's enriching. It's an enriching experience that is uh, unique. You know, we're listening to a lot of podcasts these days and all of that, but uh, as a radio play, it has its own place, its own feeling, its own thing. And um, all of these stories have something unique to say. So I would say it's a must because um, to kind of give yourself something different to do, like literally creatively, but also to support. Um, I, I mean, man, like so much work has gone into this and it's, it's theater and going through us having no theater, you know, this is what we did. And so I think it is a must. It's a must to support and, um, and be there. This has been fun. My name is Pepper Chambers, and I am a playwright with Antius's Zip Code Plays Season 2 and 3, thankfully. And um, please go listen. Please visit the website. Please listen to all of the plays. You will not be sorry, and you will learn something, and you'll be entertained. And when do you feel safe? When you feel good? Please, please go back to theater. People should listen to the zip code plays to um, get a slice of the Los Angeles life and to learn more about Los Angeles writers, something that I'm incredibly passionate about. I feel like here we don't support our own writers. And so um, it's really wonderful to listen and hear what Los Angeles writers are capable of. I think it's a really talented and, and um, brilliant community and definitely could use more support from the public. Hi, my name is Diana Burbano, and I'm one of the writers of the Zip Code Plays at Antaeus Theater. If you want to learn more, you can uh, listen to this conversation. So I've been aware of the Zip Code Plays um, uh, from the beginning because I, I've been in the company since they started doing um, the Zip Code Plays. I just think it's fantastic. I've always loved radio plays, radio drama. I still listen to old time radio drama whenever I can. You know, old Jack Benny and um, Dragnet. We listen to a lot of that. Um, because I, I just love the idea of listening to things. I actually get really exhausted watching plays on Zoom. I shouldn't say that, but it's true. So I generally don't watch and I just listen. And I get everything from just listening to it. Even, even though there aren't any of the, the special effects or anything like that, I love listening to work. And so the zip code plays is all uh, these beautiful little dramas and comedies, but it's all sonic and it's just a place to breathe, I think. And it, I, it's so magical and they've been so interesting. And the fact that it's all about LA, I mean, it's a complete hook for somebody like me who's lived in LA for so long. And I absolutely love it here. Um, even when I find it makes me a bit um, kooky. <laughs> So my piece is um, Hollywood 90028 and Marie Dressler, good gal. Marie Dressler was a, um, she was a performer in um, 
she was actually a performer for a very long time. She uh, was in vaudeville before she was in silence, before she was on Broadway, before she was uh, in the talkies. And she's one of few actors who actually made the transition from every level of that um, that thread. I mean, she started in vaudeville, right? Which is a whole, which is, a, I mean, if you're a stage actor, you know, there's something about being on stage and the vaudeville having to control an audience. I mean, especially if you've ever done children's theater, it's like, you have to be so vivid and so alive and so like almost uh, out there to control an audience like that. So Marie, Marie does that. And she, uh, but somehow she also manages to transition to the world's, the smallest acting that you do, which is on stage in the talkies, you know? And she, because she becomes a box office, um, number one box office star. Now the thing about Marie, she's not what you would call conventionally attractive. She was always a character woman. Um, she was uh, always considered sort of funny looking and always joked about the fact that she was ugly, that her, her father kicked her out of the house for being ugly. Um, but audiences adored her. And for me, especially during the pandemic, especially as I'm looking at my career as an actor, which I still, you know, I have a massive love hate relationship with. I just thought to me, character actors are really special actors, right? A lot of the times they don't get the same kind of accolades. They don't get remembered. They, they're maybe less of the, of the history. Um, but the character actors are the ones who make the movies. They, they bolster the leads. They have, they carry the plot, they move the story along. They tend to be the ones that the audience can connect with more than these beautiful glamorous movie stars who are in the center. It's the character actors. I've always thought that. And so I wanted to write about this particular character actor because I've always loved her. I've always loved that period of time. I've always loved um, early movies. I, and because the, the zip code plays are about Hollywood and about Los Angeles, I really, I propose that as a way to, you know, let's look at our history, you know, cause sometimes we in LA are like, we don't have history. Well, we do, we do. I mean, I could go on forever. The, the history of Los Angeles and the movies is so interesting to me. I, in 1910, when the first, it was D.W. Griffith did the first silent short here. Um, I think it was called Old, The Old Californian. It was a 17 minute short. That was in 1910. And then by 1914, uh, Cecil B. DeMille makes a full length movie. And then by 1918, it's a conglomerate. It's like eight years, eight years is when Hollywood became Hollywood. And um, there's just so much about that period to mine and to look at and to poke around in that uh, I've always just been excited by it. I was thrilled, thrilled when they, um, they said, yeah, write about that, write about early Hollywood through, through the, the character of Marie Dressler. The main story arc of, of Marie Dressler, Good Gal, it's about this character actress, Marie, and she is filming a movie. Uh, she's coming to her dressing room to take a break and she is, um, she's talking about her life. It's very much sort of a, a, a biography. She, she just goes through what I just mentioned about the early Hollywood, about being a vaudevillian actor, about how she feels about it. And um, there's a secret that's revealed at the end about why, why she's compelled to tell you this. And, uh, she, Marie, it's a, it's a one person piece. It's a monologue. And in it, Marie is looking for an ear, looking to leave some of herself um, behind, looking to make sure that people remember who she is. The main actress in this piece is Julia Fletcher, who is a really fantastic character actor um, with a, an amazing sort of smoky uh, voice. And um, I think she wasn't doing an imitation of Marie, but she embodied the things that I most loved about Marie, which is the humor, the, the self-deprecating humor, the self-knowledge, but also like the self-worth that, that Marie had. So Julie was incredible in the part. My director, Cameron Watson, um, shared with me a love of old Hollywood. And I think that's where we sort of bonded right away is that Cameron and I could talk about old Hollywood, I think for a really long time. And I hope someday I can actually meet him in person and we can sit across from each other and just gab and gab and gab about um, all the stuff we love about Hollywood history. Cause I would love that. But uh, which was, it was just a treat to have somebody who really knew that subject matter direct it because um, you could feel the love in the direction. Um, 
And I do have to say that the most incredible thing was our, um, our sound. I think one of the strengths of the zip code place too is Jeff Gardner, who does all the sound. It's a, um, a masterclass in how to build uh, a set sonically and, and to bring the, um, the audience into a space when they can't see it. And it isn't really described, is it? It's, you, it's only, you only hear it. And it's such a masterful thing to be able to do to create a world um, just with noise and sound and music. And I think my piece is fairly simple, but it's so clear and so in the period, which was important to me and to the piece, you know, the actress smokes cigarettes, the, the walking shoes are, it's a certain kind of shoe that she wears. So when she walks, you really hear that. There's a certain kind of a sound that, that the movies used to make when the lights came on that they don't make anymore. All that is in the piece. And it, I think it, it really just enhances for me and I hope for the audience that feeling of you're in a different time. Going from normal playwriting to writing a radio play, I... I loved it. I've, I've actually, this is my second one. I wrote one um, called The Vertical City, which was a science fiction piece for um, Actors Repertory in Portland. I really like the form. I like everything about it. I like the, um, the fact that it takes a lot of imagination. Like the audience has to work as hard as the actors do um, in a way to, to make the world come true. And one of the things that I love the most about it is that Unlike seeing a play on stage, it's never the same for the for two people, right? One person imagines one thing, another person imagines another thing. They imagine what it looks like um, just in their heads. I love that. I love that it's not, I've always loved that I don't have full control about how people either interpret or, or hear my work because I think um, the magic of an audience is their participation in, um, in the work. I would love the audience to, uh, um, once they've heard the play and, and they're maybe driving on, maybe I would love for them to just sort of remember the character actors, just just think about them. Maybe not only Marie, but also all the other ones who are great contributors to movies that you've loved. Um, th there's just so many people. And the thing about actors theater actors more than movie actors, but even movie actors, because I've done a lot of research about there are so many people who have been in movies and we forget them, right? It's such a transitory thing to be an actor. You don't have the same, um, you don't leave anything behind. And I know it seems like you do. There's a lot of movies where people do leave things behind, but there's also so many movies that nobody watches anymore that have been lost. Even recent movies have been lost and don't exist. So for me, it's always like a little, uh, that whole Clarence gets his wings thing, where if you think of an old character actor and it makes you go and look them up and maybe see if you can find one of those movies, then I think I have done my job. I would say if you're interested in um, the story of Marie Dressler, that you should go out and check some of her movies, um, especially uh, Min and Bill and, um, oh my gosh, the Garbo movie and uh, Anna Christie. There's some really wonderful work going on in there. And it's always fun. Sometimes you think your students don't even go as far back as maybe the graduate or maybe even the godfather, golly, maybe even working girls sometimes, but it's always worth to go back and look at other things and look at what other people were doing. You learn so much from watch, just from watching actors. What do I look forward to when I listen to zip code plays? I just, I love being immersed in story and I love, um, I love just taking a moment for myself, taking the time for myself to listen to something wonderful and, uh, I'd much rather do that. And to be honest, I'm in the car so much that the plays like the zip code plays just make it easy to get from one place to another because I'm in another world, but I can still drive. <laughs> uh, places like Antia's Theater Company are local theater companies for the community. And um, I think it's important that we have the voices that are right in there in the community for people to go and access and see. I mean, if we don't support our smaller theaters, then we will lose a pretty important voice. And um, because the smaller theaters are the ones producing uh, more diverse playwrights and more diverse stories, stories you're not going to see on the main stages, uh, stories by women. So if you cut off the small theaters, you're going to cut off a lot of voices. So they're always worth your support. And uh, 
I would say, even as an audience member, you can get involved, you know, you can get involved. You can start, come be an usher, come work the box office and then decide you want to write something, go take an acting class. I tell everybody to take an acting class. Not only will it be the mo most fun you'll have in your life and you'll meet some wonderful people, you might spark something. And I, I love acting. I love theater. It's really fun. It's just a fun thing to do. I won't lie. So maybe it's not the most noble or, um, you know, it's, we're definitely not curing COVID, but we are bringing joy to ourselves, um, which sounds maybe sounds a little bit selfish, but I, I wager that a lot of us could use a little bit of joy right now. Hi, everybody. I'm Diana Burbano, and I am the playwright for uh, the Zip Code Plays 90028, Marie Dressler, Good Gal. And I just want to invite you all to take a listen to the play and to listen to all three seasons. I think um, you'll find them really exciting. And as a matter of fact, we've been up for a, an audio award for best podcast. So we're all super, super excited about that. And I think you will be too. See you at the theater. I think people should listen to the zip code plays uh, who want to hear great stories that um, really explore every facet of living in Los Angeles, which is one of, you know, in the four years I've lived in Los Angeles, I've really come to appreciate just incredible complexity and strangeness. It's a very strange town. Um, and, uh, and it's got such a rich history so many different people have passed through here. So many different types of communities are like, are rubbing up against each other in Los Angeles. So it's this, it's real, it's this real stew. Um, and I think sometimes the best way to know a place is to like explore the fiction about it. Uh, and the Zip Code plays are a group of plays by contemporary writers really trying to get their hands and minds around one particular part of LA. Uh, and so it's, it's just a really great exploration of the city and its people and its drama. Hi, I'm Daniel Hirsch. I'm a playwright and screenwriter uh, who wrote for the third season of Antaeus Theater's Zip Code play, plays. Um, and if you want to hear more about the Zip Code plays, listen to this interview. I, I heard about the Zip Code plays the you know the first season um of them and i gobbled up season one uh and yeah again was just so um such i love the format you know i used to do a little bit of radio in college i've always kind of been a fan of radio dramas um and i'm also someone who loves learning about different neighborhoods in a city loves learning history uh so it, it felt like such a great format to illuminate different parts of LA, sort of unheard stories of LA and different histories. Um, and also like a fun format to work in. I hadn't really written a play strictly for audio. Um, so yeah, I was really, really excited about the prospect of collaborating on this and, and working on, on my own uh, script. Yeah, I knew right away as soon as I heard that they were doing this, that this was something I, I wanted to participate in and come up with an idea for. So I actually recently moved to the zip code. Um, I'm not technically in the neighborhood that gets called Frogtown, but I'm like right across the street, basically. Um, and it's such a fascinating neighborhood. It's so, there's something so LA about it. There's something very strange about it. Um, it's this very geographically isolated neighborhood, like um, basically the five freeway is one border and the LA river is the other. So it's just like this little sliver of land between Silver Lake and like sort of Glassell Park, Glendale, um, Atwater Village. Uh, and it, so it's like very geographically isolated. And it's also a neighborhood experiencing like massive gentrification right now. Um, you know, it's historically been an overlooked, sort of an overlooked neighborhood. Um, 
uh, but like much is happening and changing there, including these like big ecological changes. Um, so that section of the LA River, there's been all these efforts to um, revitalize it, regreen it. Um, there's plans for like big parks, a la the High Line in New York, in Frogtown, which I'm kind of lost track where they are in the development. And I think the pandemic probably threw things off. Um, but yeah, so it's a neighborhood that's experiencing massive change that is both sort of sociological and ecological. There's really, there's really an effort to um, deal with the river in a new way. Um, and so I've always been, I've been really fascinated with this neighborhood since I moved, since I heard about it when I moved, first moved to LA. Um, so I knew I wanted to do this zip code when there was a call for proposals from Antaeus. Um, and then I just started I just Googled, I just hit Wikipedia, um, read through old LA Times articles to sort of find an interesting nugget about Frogtown's history um, to try to really figure out what my in was. And I I came across this article, I think it was from KCET uh, about where the name Frogtown came from. And the name Frogtown truly did come because every year there would be a seasonal infestation of these little frogs or toads. People aren't quite sure what they were. Um, and, uh, and I was like, wow, that's crazy. What happened to these frogs? Um, and like, uh, I think about in the eighties or nineties, the suddenly there was no more frogs every spring. Um, and it's unclear exactly why. Uh, and I just thought that was so interesting. That was like a, like a perfect little nugget of neighborhood history um, to dive into and explore. Um, and yeah, I'm thinking about um, the massive sociological changes and ecological changes happening in the neighborhood uh, and thinking about this history of Frogtown, where it came from, the development of the neighborhood, those like things all merged together. Um, and and landed on this play about new homeowners. My zip code play, Frogtown 90039 and Naxius Boreas, is about two new homeowners who moved to Frogtown uh, only to discover shortly after moving that they are um, ex- about experiencing a massive biblical scale infestation of tiny little amphibians of these frogs um, uh, inhabiting their new home. Uh, so we kind of watched this couple, Issa and, um, oh my God, uh, Hannah. <laughs> um, so we watched this couple, Issa and Hannah, uh, navigate this bizarre ecological occurrence while at the same time navigating uh, a kind of challenging relationship with a an, an longtime neighbor, um, or the, he's their new neighbor, but he's a longtime resident named Bernard. Um, and it's kind of a comedy of manners uh, between this new couple and this new neighbor. And then also a sort of surreal, overwhelming plague of frogs. So I was, I had a great crew of collaborators working on um, my play about Frogtown. So the actors were Rebecca Tripp, Caroline Ratteray, and um, Alex Alfaro, who are Antian actors. Um, And I I think they just brought so much to the roles. We had a really short rehearsal time, um, but they just dove in and inhabited these characters and made really great choices. and then uh, my, my director was a uh, director named Sarah Lyons, who I actually know from graduate school. Um, and they, um, again, like with limited rehearsal time, really deconstructed the material and built it back up again with, with the actors. Um, yeah, because I mean, all of it took place on Zoom. Uh, so like you have to, we have this in the center of the play, there's a long-term relationship and you have to feel the long-term an intimacy of their connection very quickly in, in the course of the play. And so um, that all happened on Zoom in like a very short rehearsal time. Um, and then Jeff Gardner was uh, our incredible sound designer. He designed all the sound uh, for all of the zip code plays. Uh, and and uh, yeah, I mean, I like, when I was writing this play, I was sort of nervous. I, I was like, is this too big? Like there's, 
at some point there's frogs coming through the walls there because like the there's they're so and and um and there's a huge thunderstorm in the middle of the play um and i i was leaning on that stuff because i was like this is what audio drama can do that maybe like a stage play can't it can do these big sound effects and put you like in a really in a different world um and so it was a little sheepish when my first draft and the um, Bill and Anna, the the producers of the Zip Code play, and Jeff were like, "No, go big! Like, like we want this. We like this play because it's taking, it's leaning into sound and doing something big with it." Um, so, and Jeff was totally up for the challenge of designing a gigantic swarm of frogs um, in in this little bungalow in in Frogtown. So I think there's a lot of things that are really different about writing just for audio versus writing for stage. But I will say the core element of like knowing who your characters are and knowing what the story is, is, is shared universally throughout all types of dramatic writing. So in some ways it was really, um, you know, as working with a set of constraints, you know, I was like, okay, three characters in somewhere in LA, like, and, and that is very similar to writing for a stage. Like you're like, okay, I have a cast of four and like limited sets. Like what can I write? Um, so in some ways it was very similar. And then in ways it was like really different. Um, I think the freedom to explore sound and uh, create big special effects uh, is something you, uh, I think I would shy away from on stage. You know, I'm, I'm an emerging writer uh, and, you know, I'm often pitching plays to like young companies that don't have gigantic budgets. So on a stage play, I think I would be, feel pretty shy about being like, okay, in the second act, there's a gigantic infestation of frogs. I need the roof to collapse and, um, I need it to be like flooded with like swamp water. Uh, I would never write that or like, I would be very careful about including that in a stage. Cause I. I think at this point in my career, I want um, plays to look producible. I want a theater company to be like, oh, this is within our ability. Um, but with sound, I could go, I could go kind of ham. I could, I could go big with it uh, because Jeff Garner, our incredible sound designer, has a whole library of sound effects that he could layer in. Um, he could amplify, he could make strange. Uh, so that was really fun to just to get get the chance to like have special effects uh, in my work. Um, and yeah, and then, I mean, I think, and then there's like little things that are, um, I didn't think about when I first started writing that I learned about as I was going along and when I was getting feedback from Jeff and that's just like, like placing people is, is like a thing you have to think about when you're writing an audio drama. Um, so like if I had a scene where these two characters in a room, like, I, as the writer sort of had to figure out like how far away they were and um, when they came together and when they like were apart, just because like it impacts the quality of the actor's voice. You know, if they're entering a room, um, they have to lean back from the camera and then push in. Um, so like just getting like a little granular about like space and location um, was definitely different as as um, a playwright who's just like they enter they're on stage like the, you'll figure out where they are in the room eventually but as I was writing it like really figuring out entrances and exits for were a thing I had to think through um, yeah and then just I think also uh, you know I had a theater writing uh, or uh, my mentor in in playwriting often said like if there's a piece of a vital piece of information in your play um you should probably say it twice because like what if someone coughs the first time an actor says it and i think in the world of audio dramas it's almost three times just because you only have your ears to hear information um there's nothing visual to like undergird it uh so you really you really and there's no there's no way to catch up sometimes when you're listening to an audio drama. So I think um, just being really clear about relationships, about stakes, about story points. Um, so the person who's 
on their Peloton listening or walking their dog or doing laundry um, won't get left behind in the story. I hope that the audience uh, who listens to my zip code play walks away from it um, really thinking about, yeah, these big forces changing LA uh, and that's climate change, ecological change um, and gentrification. Uh, and and the play asks a lot of questions about what it means to enter a neighborhood as a newcomer. Um, and not just a neighborhood, but like on a larger scale, like an ecology. Uh, what, what is your responsibility to the place that you come to as a new arrival? Um, what do you owe the natural world? Uh, what do you owe the original inhabitants? Um, and then it sort of also asks like, who, what does it even mean to be an original inhabitant? Because I think um, the real original inhabitants is, is the earth. Um, and, uh, and so the play asks a lot of questions, um, ethical questions and sort of, um, yeah, a, a, about that kind of responsibility. So I, hope audiences leave the play thinking about that, thinking about their own role in whatever ecologies they're a part of. When I listen to the zip code plays, I really look forward to getting to know a new slice of Los Angeles, uh, getting a glimpse into a piece of history. Um, and then of course, like I look forward to just these rich, fully embodied performances. Um, I think the, all of the cast do such a good job inhabiting these roles that are just voice. Um, and so I really, I look forward to spending time with like fully embodied characters uh, that are just, that are just voices. And yeah, and just like all the, I, I love the use of sound and I love hearing how Jeff and the whole creative team me, makes a world um, that feels like totally immersive and grounded in reality, even though it's all sound effects. Companies like Antius is so important uh, because they're hubs of community. Um, and when you have a theater in a downtown Glendale, people are gonna go to it. And then they're also gonna go out to dinner. And then they're also gonna congregate in your public spaces. Uh, and without that, you have a void and you have like, there's not places for us to get away from Zoom, get away from um, our homes. And, and I, I think in the last two years, we're like in a mental health crisis because people are trapped at home. And I think we've seen how vital it is to um, congregate, to uh, commune with others and spaces like NTS that represent a wealth of voices uh, can be that communal water and hole, that place where people congregate. So I think supporting theater, supporting local theater uh, is so vital for community health. My name is Daniel Hirsch and I'm a playwright with Antaeus Theater. Uh, and I encourage anyone who hasn't done so already to listen to season three of the Zip Code Plays. See you at the theater. People should listen to the zip code plays because it is in the NTS tradition, we are calling forth a theatrical experience from the past and highlighting and illuminating how it can be done today. That anything we do as humans, any way we create art is never lost. It is only transformed or adapted, but we stand on the shoulders of those who've gone before. And I think it's important we do not forget that. There are so many artists that their only medium they had was radio. 
and nobody thinks about them, but now they are. So I think these zip code plays do what Antius does best, which is call forth the past and say, and now, why now? Why do we need to hear this now? We need to hear it now because we need to take this old art form that we've kind of forgotten about and bring it into the present to highlight what is going on in our world today and in the way this project also highlights these zip codes in Los Angeles, the historical precedence of these neighborhoods, how they've changed, how they've been lost, or how they've remained exactly the same, unbeknownst to anyone. Um, our history is important. And it, lest we forget where we've come from, whose land we're really standing on, whose, um, you know, whose hard work we are benefiting from. And we forget that. We get very caught up in our present day and the future, but we must remember where we've come from. So I think people need to listen to the plays just because they need to know like how cool Los Angeles is, but also how amazing radio plays are. Like just what you can really discern. Um, and maybe get off your screen for a while. Like maybe stop looking at this black mirror here and maybe listen and sit in space with someone, maybe listen together. My name is Ann Noble. I am an actor, playwright, director, arts educator, jail chaplain. I'm with Antias Theater Company and I'm the author of the zip code play Blue Like You, which takes place in the women's jail in Linwood, California. That's in Los Angeles. Please come to um, Antias to listen to it. And also please listen to this interview if you want to know more. The story for Blue Like You uh, and Linwood came because um, I'm actually a jail chaplain. Um, so I have been visiting the LA County jails for, gosh, going on five years now. I've been um, part of a group called Prism Restorative Justice, which was founded uh, by two Episcopalian monks. Um, their monastery is called the Community of Divine Love. And I got involved with them through a very long security story through All Saints Church, through theater, through Boston Court, this amazing story. Um, uh, but I've worked with um, incarcerated youth for a decade doing a theater program through NTS Theater Company. Um, and I started going into the jails as a chaplain, just sitting with people, doing church services, doing spiritual work, reading poetry, creative work. Um, and it's a call. Um, I feel at home in the jails, which uh, is, may sound crazy to some people, but it's where I find it's just my home. And um, so when I've never written anything about my experience in the jails, I've written poetry, but not anything that's really, um, been in theatrical dramatic form and um when the zip code zip code plays started um i you know the zip code plays actually started because of ed napier that that writer i told you about that started the playwrights lab he was the one that came up with the idea of it and we did two versions of it back in person at antias a while ago and um and i participated in both of those um i wrote a play set in um uh in burbank and i can't remember where the other one was set um but i did burbank airport um and so i knew what the zip code plays were about and then when we decided to do radio plays for COVID, i thought oh this is brilliant um and i didn't submit initially to write one i was busy doing other things and then when the second round came about i pitched linwood i was like nobody knows that this women's jail is right in the heart of linwood and you know where the rodney king riots were and and the women's jail was the first jail I went into um, and I had a profound experience there um, and so I've been going in there ever since and um, I'm now one of the I'm the actual program director now of prison restorative justice the monks have moved up to San Luis Obispo, Obispo and um, are working in the jails and prisons up there and so I'm working with a woman named Sharon Crandall now and we run the program and so I'm going to very shortly become the senior chaplain at CRDF, which is the women's jail in Linwood, California. And so when the zip code play 
they asked for pitches for a zip code. I just, I, I was like, I have to, I have to write this um, piece. And I wanted to write a piece about a mother and a daughter um, because in the women's jail, it's always that story. It's always a mother's incarcerated and her daughter's outside and doesn't understand, or the daughter is inside and the mother is outside and doesn't understand. And um, I think we don't think about, when we think about the incarcerated, we think about criminals. We don't think um, about the life circumstances that may have led to some of that criminal activity. We also don't think about how it tears families apart and that um, what it means to a child to lose their parent to incarceration and how difficult it is to visit, to see, to contact, to reach out to an individual who is incarcerated. It is unbelievably difficult to remain in contact with them. Um, and everything's observed too, everything's watched. So there's no private contact. Um, so if you just think about that, like think about what it's like to, um, you have something going wrong in your day and you can't have a private conversation with your mother or your sister or your daughter, it's always watched. And we know that that's like a little bit, you know, our surveillance state we have right these days where everything's being listened to and watched, but we don't really think of it. But um, I, I felt I had to write about this because people don't know what's going on in there. Um, and while I can't speak to everything that goes on in there, I can tell a story. I can take the experiences I've had through the women I've met and I can um, highlight and maybe illuminate some of what goes on in there and who those people really are. They're people, actually. They're not the other. They're actually just people like us. And um, and so I, I felt it was important to illuminate what was going on in there and illuminate um, the courage I see, um, the humor I experience, and the sorrow. And I, uh, so that for me was really important. And I was just so grateful that, um, that um, it was selected and chosen um, um, to be a part of it. I was really excited. It's a, a mother who is incarcerated and um, she's normally um, visited by her mother. Um, every week or so the mother comes as a regular visit. And then this time um, it's actually her daughter that shows up instead. And so it is a mother daughter reunion and they have not spoken for quite some time. And there are some very hard feelings and some misunderstandings. And it is a story that is about two women who should be connected or should be family who don't feel like family, but discover they are family. Um, and it also, um, part of the zip code plays mission is to highlight the zip code is to highlight this location in LA that maybe people don't know about. So it also talks a little bit about the history of Linwood itself, the city where this jail is sitting. And a lot of people don't know about um, because the characters lived in Linwood as well. And so it's a mother daughter reunion, I guess is the best way to say it. It also um, does highlight some of what goes on in the jail, some of the rules and what people have to deal with there. Um, and some of our misconceptions about what goes on in there, but it's all told through the eyes of um, uh, the mother and daughter, but the play is also set from the perspective of the mother. So a lot of people don't think about this, but um, in a radio play, you actually have to think about the camera. Where is the point of view? So in the play itself, you will hear that Mercy, the mother, she's clear. Her voice is clear. Her daughter's voice is through the visiting window and through the phone. So her daughter's voice is always different. It's not fully clear because we are in fully in the mother's point of view. So we are incarcerated in this episode. So it's a very subtle thing that not a lot of people picked up on, um, but it matters. Uh, again, a shout out to our amazing sound person, Jeff Gardner, who um, produces this whole thing and does all this stuff. He is 
adamant he talks to all the playwrights and directors and actors he says this we have to know where the point of view is we have to know where is the camera where are we looking to it matters with sound where the voice is coming from where we hear it um and because i directed one of the first zip code plays i got the lecture <laughs> i got the lecture about point of view in a radio play which i had never thought about as a writer and so i had a little pre-training so when i sat down to write the play i knew to make sure i had a very clear point of view who was our lead character you know um and so i wanted to put it on the side of mercy um named that for on purpose um but I wanted to put it in very clearly in her point of view so that we would have that feeling of what it feels like to reach out to our loved one and their voice is always a little different and never quite clear. And the sounds, those really oppressive sounds that are in the jail um, that people also don't think a lot about, um, you know, it sounds different. And, uh, and a radio play is an absolutely perfect way to highlight how foreign the environment is for someone who's on the outside. Jeff Gardner, our, um, who produces and does everything, all the sound, he, um, he's been a Foley artist and he's worked with LA Theater Works, so he knows how to do live sound like in the moment, make things sound like what they sound like. Um, and he's done, you know, he's also done, I can't tell how many sound designs for, um, for theater around town here in Los Angeles and elsewhere um but he really creates a world and he invites the playwright to think about the world itself as well so he doesn't he does this beautiful thing where he is not something that's added on even though yes we record it and then he puts the sound in afterwards he invites the writer he's letting the writer create the world and then in, uh, enhancing it. So not so much he's like frosting on the cake, he's part of the cake. He very much is there to serve the piece and create the sounds and the quality of the environment to illuminate the play. So he is, I think, um, yes, he is another, his work is another character in the play, absolutely 100%. And um, he's just a master. He just knows how to do it, a sense of rhythm and timing, uh, what works, what doesn't work. Um, he's so helpful. He can tell you right away that that's something we can't do, or this is, yes, we can do that, or I'm not sure if we can do that, let's try. Um, he's an artist in the highest sense of the world word. Um, and then the director, um, uh, D Jonathan Munoz Pru, I have worked with him before. He directed a play of mine, a reading of a play of mine uh, at Courage Theater. And um, I was introduced to him through that theater company and we just got each other. We just got along. He gets my writing. I have a very, um, my plays appear to be just how people talk, but they actually have a very specific rhythm to them. And he gets that. And he is, he's just an extraordinary director. He is loving and firm and clever and brilliant. And he works so well with actors. He's just, he's, He's got that perfect balance, what I call the mothering instinct, that perfect balance where he can love people, but also let's do it better, you know, and he's just so wonderful. And it's a very short rehearsal time we have, and he knows how to work in that frame as well. Um, he's just, you know, he is also a brilliant artist and also um, just a total pro. Um, so when they selected this piece, um, I was asked which director I'd like, and he was the first name on my list. I wanted to work with him and he was available and said yes um so that was just a joy um the actors Juana martinez and claudia elmore claudia um was in the reading that jonathan directed of that play so and that's how i got introduced to her as well um she also then um when i was casting for antias i brought her in um and she was in our production of caucasian chalk circle she is she's just a dream she is just such a beautiful artist and um funny and powerful and her voice is so beautiful and i just absolutely adore her so that was um what they say a no-brainer um and then kwana um i've known kwana um through antias for years um we actually um were double cast in the same role in um hedda gabler produced back in the old space um uh, at antias in north hollywood um so we got to know each other 
you know, when you double cat, when you're double cast with another actor on a role at NTS, which is how we used to do all our productions, you get to know each other really well because you have to go through creating this character together and it can be hard. Um, so you, you really get to know each other. And I just, um, Kwana is, um, just such a powerhouse. She is, uh, but she's got this really soft, mushy heart and that it was just perfect casting for Mercy. She's got to be tough and strong and but she also just has this little mushy soft heart that is just so beautiful um and you know she's just an again another pro i just i knew the plays we don't have a lot of rehearsal time and we just need people who can bring it and can bring it quickly and powerfully and beautifully and professionally but who have that heart that is going to make it so um that can bring that vulnerability. And I know people who can work really, really fast. And I know people who can bring the heart. It's sometimes you don't always find those two to go together. And we just found it. We, it was lightning in a bottle. Um, and when I got back the first, um, we, I'm, I was there for the first read through and it was beautiful. But then when I got the first rough audio recording, I was just, uh, I was so excited. It was just beautiful. And then um, everybody just came together so beautifully. I could not be happier with it. It's absolutely what I heard in my mind's eye that it would be. So the process was just, I was so blessed to have such incredible people. You know, for me, the difference between the radio play, the podcast versus an actual stage play, I mean, again, you can't see it. So you have to imagine it. Um, But I actually would, it has a, slightly similar quality to writing a screenplay because when you write a screenplay and I'm, I'm talking about the stage directions, right? The action lines, you have to write something that when people read it, so I'm not talking about what you'll see on the film. I am talking about when someone reads your screenplay, they have to read it and see it. So for me, I thought a little bit about when I write for film, television, new media, like but they're talking it it's not just obviously you can't see the stage directions but i thought about i have to get people to see what they're saying and so it it it, that's kind of how i thought of it um the difference is obviously you can't you're not communicating the story visually in what we see you're communicating the story visually through what you hear. So I really thought about how much words and then the lack of words convey. So again, you can't just talk about stuff like for me, you know, oh, look at that pencil you're holding. You can't do that, right? You can't, you don't want to do that. That's talking down to your audience. But if you know, your character says, I'm going to write that down. And then you just hear this little scribbling of the pencil. We'll know what it is. So there's a trust of your audience you have to have. And um, I love words. I love, I will sit and listen to characters talk forever. And I also, when I, even when I write my plays, they're really more auditory than they are visual anyway. Um, I'm not, I don't, uh, think in a visual way, like a Julie Tamor way. That's not, I don't think that way. I think in how words carry meaning and, um, and not even words describing what we're seeing, just the way people talk, the way they run on their sentences and talk over each other. And they're really, really fast. And then they'll slow down because something happened or they stop talking and there's a silence. So for me, it was taking really paying attention to rhythm, silence, and the tone of voice. So how people are talking, not just what they're talking about. And, um, and again, I think my skills as an actor, putting myself in the actual situation, like I act out all my plays when I'm writing them, I'll sit there and actually act them out. So I'll pick up the phone and talk. Um, and as Jeff Gardner told us, you have to, it, people are in space. We're just recording their voice. They're in space. And I think we don't realize how much we're conveying by the, our tone of voice and what we say and what we do. 
I mean, if you really close your eyes and listen, you pick up more, a lot more than you realize you do. You know, we're so dependent on our eyes, but we don't realize how much we're actually hearing. I think the Zoom world has actually highlighted that because the Zoom, even though we can see each other, the video quality is kind of flat. And sometimes you can't see people, but they'll go off video, but you can hear them. So um, I've taught a lot of acting over Zoom and people get very frustrated because they sometimes can't see each other. If they're looking at their script, they can't look at the other person. And then I say, well, why don't you listen? <laughs> why don't you listen to their voice? What do you hear? I encourage a lot of my acting students to do their rehearsals over the phone or to turn off their video and just listen. So for me, the difference was very subtle and it really wasn't that extreme. I felt it was sort of right in my wheelhouse um, because it's maybe again, because of my auditory nature, but it's how I like to write as a playwright. I like words to convey. I also, I guess it's a little bias I have for theater versus film. We can't compete with film in the theater. You know, we just can't, we can't set it in Arabia. We can pretend, which is its power. But so my feeling is why try? Let's watch what the human body is doing in space, how they're transforming the world around them, but their voice. And the, by the voice, I mean the whole body, but words, just words. I'm, I have a bias for it, I guess. So I think there, there's something in the theater about the human voice, the way we express our words and they become poetry. I think of it like we, you know, like I, one of my favorite musicals is Hamilton and I've never seen it. I've only listened to it. But I, I know there's amazing choreography. I do know that. And I know visually it's beautiful. But the auditory experience, I was fully immersed and I was fully there. So for me, um, using our words in rhythm and poetry and um, telling a story just with words, I'm, I'm down. So I didn't feel it was that much different for me. I felt it kind of really settled in. There was a couple things I was like, oh, gosh, I have to think about how I'm going to do that. But again, because I knew the environment I was writing in, in a jail, I know what that's like. I know the sounds. And you have to be very alert when you're in the jail. You can't just be hanging out. You have to be very attentive and your eyes only go one direction. So you have to listen. It's really important. So I knew that environment and I knew Jeff Gardner would be able to make it sound good. So um, that carried a lot of weight itself. Well, I hope when the audience listens to the play, I hope um, they maybe think a little differently about the incarcerated, about what that experience is like. Um, I hope they recognize themselves um, in their own relationships with their family. I hope um, it tenderizes their hearts a little bit. Um, I think those, you know, two things, if we can recognize ourselves in the other, we have a chance to not other the other. And so for me, um, the play is not there to say, you should go into the jails, you should, vote a certain way you should do something that i think you should do that's not my job my job is to hopefully allow the audience to recognize themselves in these characters or this situation and that that will open their heart which will then open their mind and their eyes or their ears to see and hear in a different way that for me is the only way anything's going to change because that inspires a human to start to make good decisions as opposed to this is what you should do. I really am not in the game here to tell anyone what to do. I don't think that's healthy. Then it's you acting out something you think I should, you should do because I told you to. And I don't think that makes for good human beings. I think what makes for good human beings is a freedom to choose wisely. And, um, I think we only are at liberty to do that when we see ourselves in the other. Because if we don't see ourselves in the other, then we're always under threat. And when we're under threat, we make very poor choices. We make 
close-minded choices. We make fearful choices. But if we can open our circle a little bit, then maybe we can make some braver choices. We can maybe be willing to step out of our comfort zone. Maybe we could consider helping somebody that we didn't think about helping before or listening to somebody we haven't listened to before. You know, I think a lot of us, oh, I'll donate here and I'll donate there. And that's important. But I encourage everyone to go to the places you're donating to and to actually have a physical response and feel what it's like to be in a circumstance where you there that you've not been in before. I that's what I hope. Um, and that for me um, is the only way I've seen people change is when they feel, um, you know, the old Coleridge quote, what comes from the heart goes to the heart. And that's what I hope. I love listening to zip code plays. Um, first of all, just because I can listen while I'm stuck in traffic, right? Like I can actually just I can listen anywhere, which is so beautiful. But I also um, I love you're just totally immersed. So the auditory experience is completely surrounding visual experience is only in front of us. You know, everything behind me right now. I mean, I can see it on my zoom screen, but everything behind me right now is gone. It doesn't exist. Not until I do this. But auditory is three dimensional. It's 360 degrees. It's immersive. And sound is very important to me. As I said, my vision is terrible. So for me, what I hear is so important. Um, and I also, I love that I'm not looking at something and I'm immersed in it. It's, it's, it's just so powerful to me. I also love listening to my fellow artists and what they come up with. I just like, I listen to some of these zip code plays. I'm like, I never would have thought of that. Like I would never write a play like that. That is amazing to me. Um, I also don't know a lot about these zip codes. I'm not from LA. And I think when a lot of people move to LA, they move to LA for the business. And so they get very um, uh, caught up in that. We get like a, on an agenda, on task. I'm here for my career. And we don't look at this incredible, beautiful city we have around us. Um, it's unbelievably diverse and exciting. And there's all these little pockets and corners. And because it's so spread out, we just don't go there. We tend to stay in our little safe neighborhood, our little clique, or if we do go somewhere, we're going for an audition and then we come back and we don't have time to explore. And so this project is offering people a chance to explore their own city that, you know, we get so busy, we just don't have time to. So I just, I love them. They are so funny and weird and unique and every single one is different. Even some we've had repeat writers, they're totally different. I just, it's incredible. Um, I love it. They're just, they're so beautiful. I love the way they're orchestrated too over a season. I, I really do try to listen to them in order and hear how they progress and how they've been put together. Um, and I love listening to Ramon who does the narration in between, who's a very dear friend of mine. Um, he also worked with me with incarcerated youth for years. And um, so he's a dear friend and I love listening to his contribution um, and how they're really crafted all together. You can listen to one, but you can also listen to this whole evening of plays or afternoon as the day would go on. Um, so I just, I love it. I absolutely love it. And it's opened my eyes to things I did not know um, about the city and about my fellow writers and all these other, um, some actors I've not heard of. I've, I was like, who's that actor? I didn't know them. That's ridiculous. I should know them. Um, and also putting together the different actors. Like we have some actors in the company I've known for years. So the one I directed, the Pacific Palisades, I know Adrian, Harry, Nikki, I've known them forever. Um, and then to then hear actors together who've not known each other. So Quana and Claudia in my play, they've maybe met a couple times at Antias because Claudia did a show there and Quana's always there, um, but they didn't really know each other. So they had to build this mother daughter relationship like that. And so that's also very exciting to me, putting together new actors who've not been together before. So um, yeah, I just love them. I'm so proud that we've done them and it was such a wonderful, thing to lean into during COVID, especially early on when we were, I mean, things are uncertain now, but 
it was so uncertain and we just didn't know what was going to happen. It was such a beautiful place to lean into during those uncertain times. And I'm just so proud of all of us for doing it. I love them. Yeah, I love them. And people can listen all over the world. I mean, I have friends all over the world. I can, they can tune in and listen. Theaters like Antius are, well, all theaters are so important because we need a place as humans to tell our stories and to tell them in a form because otherwise it just becomes a bunch of Facebook posts. So what we're getting in our world today through social media is a lot of uh, posting. So I'm expressing myself. The problem is my expressions are not being received in a way that I can actually experience. So I get little likes or thumbs up or someone screams at me back because they don't like what I said and then it becomes an argument. So we're broadcasting, but no one's really listening. In the theater, it's not merely expression, it's conveyance. So as an artist, I'm not, as a human being, I don't feel connected until I am experiencing conveyance. Expression is one thing, I'm, that is important. But when it's received by another human being and I see it being received, whether they like it or not, if they're like, ew, oh, wow, wow, why, why, ooh, why didn't you like it? That's when we feel human. And that's what a theater does. A theater is a place of conveyance of human expression. And if we are not experiencing conveyance, I think we die. I literally think we die. I think we starve and we die. And we turn into what we are experiencing in our world where we're yelling and no one's listening. And so because no one's listening, we yell louder. But when you are in a theater experience, a storytelling experience, someone's listening, someone's talking. And then after it's over, it switches. And the audience talks to the artist. I loved how you did that. I loved how you did that. And the artist is like, oh, interesting or interesting. It's an exchange. And we're not exchanging right now. We're just screaming into the void. And what a shock, we don't feel heard because we're not being heard. And a theater experience, again, forces exchange. We have to sit and listen to each other. And then you listen and then I listen, and then you listen and then I listen. And um, I think people are hungry for that and I think they're starving for that. So every local theater needs to be supported by the community because it's a place to go to practice that, to stay human, to stay present, to stay in the here and now. And theaters that have community, uh, communities that have theaters do better. They do better. People are kinder. There's less crime. There's more thriving. There's more sharing. There's more understanding. Wonder why. So I encourage anyone you have an extra 50 cents throw it at uh, your local theater go find your local theater it's there you don't realize it's there it's above the pet shop you know you don't know what are all those people with white pieces of paper outside talking to themselves oh it's a little theater it's a little studio go there see what's there you know it's so vital it's so important it's so important we're starving and we need to feed ourselves, and that's how we feed ourselves. I'm Ann Noble, and I'm a very proud member of Antius Theatre Company and its Playwrights Lab, and I encourage everyone to come and listen, antius.org. Listen to all the zip code plays. You will learn a lot about Los Angeles. And I would also encourage you to pay a little more attention to the incarcerated, to the houseless, the people that are looking um, for homes out on the streets and the people you may not have such a fine opinion of. I encourage everyone to practice deep listening. And um, you can find me also at prismjustice.org. That's Prism Restorative Justice. Um, we visit the incarcerated. And uh, I would invite you to come check that out. You might be surprised.
people should listen to the zip code plays to find out more about Los Angeles in a dramatic way. You can find out about Los Angeles in many different ways, but it's a great intro to be a fly on the wall in people's lives and in their uh, most dramatic or comic moments. Not only, you know, hear a compelling story and uh, follow a journey of people, but at the same time, learn about a neighbor. Hi, I'm Alex Goldberg, a playwright who wrote The Six Pianos of Miradero, which is part of the Zip Code Play series at Antaeus Theatre Company. If you'd like to hear more, please listen to this conversation. So following the first season of the radio plays and the theater company would have events, uh, salons, where they would do a listening party and then they'd have a panel and discuss the play and that sort of thing. And following the first panel, uh, a woman named Arlene Vidor uh, approached me via email and she is one of the uh, board members or trustees of the theater company. And she's also a, a Glendale historian. And she said, well, you know, we're the theaters in Glendale we'd love to have a Glendale story. And I knew right away, you know, she's the perfect person to talk about it uh, with. And so I said, you, you tell me some ideas, tell me some stories that are uh, uh, important to Glendale history. And I would be happy to dramatize it. And so for months, she and I went back and forth and she had some ideas and all of her ideas were very good story ideas. Um, but some of them either didn't resonate with me or weren't my story to tell. Uh, and, you know, the different stories are uh, about different people and I won't get into that, but like some stories aren't for me to be the playwright for. But this one about um, Leslie Brand, who is one of the city's founders and what happens right after he passes away, it really hit, hit me. And I said, oh, I, I, I know how the story is going to work. I know how uh, we can increase the dramatic stakes in the short format and I know how we will, uh, uh, you know, make it exciting. And I also understand these characters and I, I feel for all of them, which is important when you write. You have to, you know, put yourself in every character shoots. So The Six Pianos of Mira Adero tells the story of Leslie Brand. He is one of the real life city founders of Glendale. He, the city existed, but it was basically a small farming community. He moved here, saw the potential, not just for the city and the, the beautiful area that he loved, but also the potential for him to get extremely stupid rich. And uh, he did just that. He bought huge tracts of land. He brought commerce to Glendale, brought uh, railway lines, brought water, brought electricity, and then started selling off his land into subdivisions, became uh, enormously wealthy. Um, and when he passed away, uh, he wound up leaving most of his estate to the city of Glendale, uh, most notably the Brand Library, which was his house at the time. It was called uh, El Miradero. Uh, huge house on a hill, if you haven't seen it, look it up and you can, you'll recognize it. Anyone who lived in LA and knows Glendale sees it sitting on the hill. Um, so it also learned in my research about him that uh, he was a bigamist. He was married uh, and then married a second time when he got uh, a younger woman pregnant. So I guess in his mind, uh, bigamy is less of a crime than having a bastard child. So he wound up marrying uh, two women. And so this is a story about the reading of the will after he passes. And the people present at the will reading are the lawyer and his two wives who discover each other's who they are early on in the story. It's always a joy working with Antaeus because they bring together such wonderful people. Uh, I had known uh, Lisa Dring for uh, about a year. I had actually met her during the pandemic, so I never met her in person, but uh, I witnessed her uh, do some script analysis of another script. I uh, hired her to do some work on one of my scripts, and then this opportunity came up and said, I want her to direct because she is truly a captain. Uh, all directors have to be able to completely run the room. And it's very difficult for these radio plays because the rehearsal process is so quick. So once she was on board, I was very happy. And then, you know, it's such a joy to go to the theater and have that meeting where you discuss casting. You have like a list of so many wonderful actors, like five to seven people that could easily jump into these roles. And we agreed on our first choices. Um, Kitty Swink uh, plays Mary Louise Brand. Uh, she's a, a, one of the former artistic directors of the theater uh, and just a, a powerhouse of an actor. Peter James Smith is uh, one of my favorite actors that I've ever 
watched, let alone worked with. Um, he's been involved uh, in and out with the theater company for years. Um, he uh, was on uh, the West Wing. He was one of the staffers. So he you know, was in 75 or 60 episodes of the West Wing. And Alex Helquist rounds out our uh, uh, triangle of actors. And she is just a fearless person. And when I was writing the script, I actually had her in mind because there were some emotional twists um, that happened on a dime and not many people could do that convincingly. And I knew she could. So having those three actors, having the director, just a great all-star team and we were ready to go. What I would like audiences to take from this play is that with every empire that is built, with every great city or great uh, buildings that, that rise up, it, it comes um, at the sacrifice of many people. And those people often go unrecognized. You will know, they always say history is written by the victors. And that is true. You know, we have Brand Boulevard in Glendale, which he literally named after himself. That wasn't named in his honor. He named it that. And he's got this building named after him and he did so much. But you don't hear about the people who sacrifice for that dream and for that vision. Uh, and I wanted to highlight a story about two women in his life uh, who did just that. And they had to put aside uh, maybe their dreams or ambitions um, so he could get his. I enjoy listening to all of the zip code plays because in this short play format, you're instantly immersed in a different neighborhood. And when the audio is done well, and with Jeff Gardner, it always is, right away, you can tell a little bit where you are by what you're hearing. Are you hearing highways? Are you hearing ocean? Are you hearing, you know, uh, urban cityscape? Uh, and which urban cityscape are you hearing? You know, there's, there's so many different sounds of Los Angeles, just like there are so many different neighborhoods. So that's what I want to do is be immersed right away into a story about people that I don't know, but I want to get to know them. Theater companies like Antius are extremely important to the local artistic scene. Every city has theater companies and they're the heart. Arts are, are the heart and soul of any city. And it's always the same when, when cities grow is there's a vibrant arts community and then it draws people in. People come in and they go to the theater and they go to the restaurant next door. And so that restaurant benefits and they, you know, they uh, uh, go to a, a bar afterwards and that sort of thing. It, you know, theater not only employs people and creates great art, but it helps to foster community. L.A. is made up of, as we see in the zip code plays, dozens of small communities. And if you look not even too hard, you'll see that in most of these communities, there is a live performance scene and support it. You don't have to go too far. You don't have to sit in traffic. Although I would say some of the, uh, not all of them, but some of them like Antius are worth sitting in traffic for. Hi, I'm Alex Goldberg and I'm a playwright. I wrote The Six Pianos of Miradero, which is part of the Zip Code Plays radio series at Antius Theater Company. All three seasons of the Zip Code Play series, which are short plays set in different Los Angeles zip codes are available and they're available for free. I've enjoyed listening to the zip code plays. I've listened to all of them, um, all the seasons. And I think that w when you are in, in this COVID world, especially I've, I've gotten into podcasts a little bit, which I hadn't before. And the discovery that you find out, but not only that, but in each of these uh, iterations of, of zip codes, uh, I've learned something about um, a zip code that I, I didn't know about, or either that, or it it, it kind of um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It deepened my knowledge of of certain parts of LA. I've, I've been in LA for it'll be 40 years soon, and I'm still surprised uh, to find out new things. And I just found out 
a lot of new locations. And uh, it was just fascinating. So uh, I think one of the things that they have at the, uh, the website is to do sort of a, a tour, an online tour of these locations. And I think that's pretty fascinating. I, I, I think a lot of people in LA could possibly know that there's um, sound studios all over Los Angeles, but probably a lot of people who aren't in the business don't know that the majority of them are in Burbank, you know, that, those kind of things, or, you know, the, um, the frog town, that one in particular that you, you learn about these frogs uh, and I just didn't know about that. So it just, there's a lot of fascinating things. There's a, the new one. I first moved here and I lived in Glendale and I went to Brand Park a, a lot and there's uh, one about Brand Park on this round. And it's just some fascinating history that I just didn't know about. And it makes you dig a little bit more um, if you're a curious person into, wow, uh, I, I didn't know that. That's a, that's a fascinating story. And, and these group of writers have dug in and found uh, some really fascinating stories in each of these zip codes. But I think also um, in them, there's just a, there's a lot of lessons to be learned, uh, whether it's a tolerance or um, love or any of these human emotions that we have. There's a, a lot in there that is discussed that I think will grab your heart uh, or, and, and in, in many cases, it will make you laugh too. So uh, I think they're just like little nuggets, uh, especially again in this, this uh, COVID world that we're currently living in, these uh, little nuggets of escape. But while you're escaping with the humanity and these great performances and writing and directing, then you also, um, you get uh, some knowledge. Hi, my name is Steve Apostolina. I am the playwright of True Sound, zip code 91505. And if you want to find more about it, listen to this conversation. Well, I heard about it at the same time the rest of the lab heard about it. They uh, were doing, uh, because of COVID, they wanted to do something different. And I, I think uh, Bill uh, Brocktrup and uh, Kitty Swink and and Anna Rose O'Halloran came up with a very clever idea to do these zip code plays and do something different because people were already very quickly getting Zoom fatigue. And so to do this kind of uh, podcast drama, you know, radio type play, I think was a great idea. So uh, they put out a, a call to the lab members for pitches. And um, I just, I didn't pitch, I just wrote a piece. <laughs> Because <laughs> I thought, ah, I'll just write it. And I wrote it. And um, they chose uh, six others. Uh, I think it was six, uh, just really, really good pieces um, in the first round. And then the second round, um, they chose uh, this piece of mine called True Sound. And uh, it was it was a great experience. It was a challenge I'd never written for just the audio world in itself. But I'd been part of the audio world through voiceover for 25, almost 30 years. So uh, it's a world I knew quite well. Like I said, I, I make my living doing voiceover. And um, I thought, I live in Burbank. And Burbank um, is probably home to, I don't know, I'm, I'm throwing out a number, but at least 60 and maybe 70% of the post-production houses that we use most often, and including places like Warner Brothers and, and uh, we're close by Universal. And there's just so many post-production uh, houses that happen here. And so I thought, well, um, a Hollywood story might be kind of interesting. And then I also thought about sound because it was an audio play. And I thought, um, well, I don't want to do voiceover, but I thought Foley might be a good idea. And I'd been privy to a couple of Foley sessions. Uh, a couple of friends had brought me down to, I say down because sometimes they're often <laughs> like in basements. And um, 
this studio happened to be in a basement and I, I got to see how Foley was run. And I thought that might be a challenge, uh, not only for me to write with all these sounds available, but to challenge our sound guru, uh, Jeff Gardner. And he just did a magnificent job uh, with all the sounds. I really challenged him with a, a lot, a variety of sounds but uh, incorporated it into the story. And so that was the inspiration was to write from there. Uh, I don't want to have any spoilers, but I, I, I will tell you that um, it, it takes place um, on a, a late evening when uh, they are doing, uh, working on a, a horror film called 13 Below. And um, the, the mixer, the person in the booth, Jazz, is uh, working there and there is... Uh, a young lady who is coming in to be an apprentice to learn a bit about Foley from this old time guy who's been around for 40, 50 years named Ron. And um, I, I, let's just say that uh, um, it's, it's, it's a light piece that uh, turns very dark. <laughs> That's all I'll say. Have a listen. And then you'll find out, but it, it's, it's quite interesting. And it, it incorporates uh, the sound into the story. And the piece is called True Sound. Well, first of all, uh, we had a director, uh, Greg T. Daniel. And Greg has directed all over town and uh, actually was going to direct a full length play of mine at one point. And then he, he got uh, booked elsewhere and was unable to do it. But I'd wanted to work with him. And so he was on board. Uh, he read it and loved it. And he and I are almost exactly the same age. I'm about a month older uh, than he is. And so our, our shorthand was, was really uh, natural when we made references to certain uh, iconic films or, or whatever, for, especially from our time period, we got each other right away. And so that was 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 wonderful. He was very good with the actors, and uh, the actors were just uh, fantastic. Peter Van Norden uh, plays the the older man, and uh, Cherish Money Duke plays uh, the mixer, and Emily Goss plays uh, the uh, woman who comes in to apprentice and learn. And um, we only had, I think two total hours of rehearsal, but they worked so hard in that brief amount of time. And then you have to factor in that uh, Jeff Gardner, the sound designer, Foley, everything um, sonically, um, he has to put his input in, in as well in these rehearsals to say, hey, have you thought about this? He does that ahead of time looking at the script, but once you read it and you, you, you can see uh, it's it's really quite a, a ballet of, of choreography to get this done in the amount of time that they did. And I, I was just flabbergasted. But the whole team was uh, fantastic. And I was uh, very fortunate to have them uh, bring my words to life. The, the main difference to writing uh, for live theater and, and for an audio play is is that you have to, at least I have to, and I've only written one, so I'm, I'm speaking from a, a novice point of view, but uh, in the audio play, you have to constantly pull yourself back and realize, okay, the audience is only hearing this. So all the information that can come with body language, uh, with action, all of this, has to be conveyed through the line and through the voice. And so there's a lot of things that you can do visually that you can't. And so you just have to, at least I did, I would uh, close my eyes. I would read it to myself and, and record it and close my eyes and think, is this conveying what I'm trying to convey? And then of course, certain things that you you don't think of that uh, there, our sound guy Jeff would say well have you thought about this sound because they're in this room so we need to establish this room or 
this is in the booth. So we need to establish they're in the booth. How does that sound different? What are the differences? So um, it, it's a bit of a challenge, but it, it was a lot of fun to do. I, well, I want them to, uh, first and foremost, I want them to ha- uh, be involved in a great story. I want to put them on a ride. And then like most of my pieces, I want to surprise them. And uh, that's one of the things that I tend to do is I, I rarely, uh, almost never write with an outline. And one of the reasons I do that is because I, as I write, I tend to surprise myself by going in a direction that I had no idea that's where it was going to go. And sometimes it's, um, you know, just a treasure hunt and it's fruitless. But a lot of times you go in a direction that you don't think you had meant to go in in the original uh, concept and you just, you find gold. So I I really want to take the audience on a ride. I want them to be involved with these characters and uh, I just want them to be uh, surprised in a good way and hope they, they come away thinking, wow, that was fun and uh, entertaining. And I, I think that's one of the, the, the things that I always try to do in my pieces, um, I, I love to have pieces where um, people will talk about the, the ending or the theme after the show, but also most importantly, I, I want them to be entertained. If they're not entertained, um, they're not gonna be interested in the piece. So it has to be entertaining. Hi, my name is Steve Apostolina. My zip code play, 91505, is called True Sound. And to find that and all the other zip code plays, go to antias.org. And under that, you can find the zip code plays. And I hope you come in and give a listen. Why is the theater experience so unique? Well, I think what we've really noticed during this entire shutdown, this entire pandemic is not only have people missed the art and the storytelling, um, but what they've really missed is the community and the coming together. That's what we've noticed at NTS, that it is, um, the theaters can be artistic homes for the uh, creators, for the actors and the writers, the directors and designers, but they're also uh, homes for the audience, for the community to come together and, um, you know, hear that story around a campfire that goes back to that old, um, we all gather around the campfire to hear some kind of a, a tale. And uh, it's not the same when you're at home alone. I mean, there are great stories to be heard and, you know, God knows that television and film also do great stories, but there's something about that coming together and gathering, uh, you know, in a circle or some on circle and, and, and hearing a story together. And uh, that just can't be replicated in any, any other way. Hi, I'm Bill Brocktrip. I'm the artistic director at NTS Theater Company. And um, please watch this video if you want more information about the zip code plays or uh, anything else going on at NTS. Um, NTS Theater Company uh, created the zip code plays because we were looking for a way to um, continue working and continue telling stories 
during uh, the shutdown that's uh, happening because of a pandemic. Um, we were uh, interested in a, a couple different things. And one was the idea of telling stories about Los Angeles. As a classical theater company, we often end up telling stories about um, um, country houses outside Moscow and the, the London penthouses and uh, Italian villas. And it's, it's harder sometimes to find things that speak to Los Angeles and our community. And so we wanted to look at um, what makes Los Angeles unique and special. And we started thinking about all the different areas, um, all the diversity, all the, the richness of culture that is in Los Angeles. And so we approached writers in our Playwrights Lab and asked them to choose a zip code and to uh, write a half hour story, um, a half hour play uh, about, about that zip code and whatever genre they wanted, whether it was comedy, satire, history, romance, whatever they want to write about. We said, you know, do that, but just tell a story that's unique to this neighborhood. And the cool thing now is with the three seasons of zip code plays, we're getting kind of a patchwork quilt of what Los Angeles is and all the different areas that come together to make this unique whole, this beautiful mosaic. So um, that was something that interested us. We were also interested in the idea of audio plays because uh, I think <laughs> like a lot of people, we're a little weary of Zoom. Uh, you know, I know that uh, many of us are uh, in meetings all day on Zoom. And so the last thing you might wanna do uh, uh, on an evening is, is go and listen to a Zoom play. So we're, but I love podcasts. I mean, I love podcasts. I listen to them all the time. I've got headphones on, you know, every different topic. And that's what's amazing about podcasts, you know, history and, and uh, true crime and politics and humor and travel, every, anything you're interested in, there are podcasts for it. And I, I, I love them. And I love being told a story in an intimate way, kind of like right here. And I thought it was analogous to the way that we tell stories at NTS. Our theater is small. And so you're right up close with the actors. And I felt this telling of a story in, in your ear by the actors um, was analogous to the kind of work that we do and made sense for us. So we got very interested in this idea of telling the stories on audio play. We were absolutely thrilled with the reaction to season one of, uh, of the Zipco plays. We had no idea whether this would kind of go over or not, or whether people would find them, but um, we were really blown away. And it answered a lot of questions that we, uh, we had things we had been thinking about, but um, we're surprised and happy to find because we offer them for free on our website or on Spotify, Apple, wherever you get podcasts. People can listen to these um, uh, if they have geographical issues about coming to our, our theater, they're far away, or, or whether they have transportation issues, uh, work issues, scheduling, childcare, uh, or whether they're people who just don't feel that the theater was ever, ever an embracing place for them. Uh, as well as um, financial barriers that keep people theater can be expensive. So this um, was able to reach out to lots and lots of people who, who were not regular uh, attendees of, of our theater or maybe any theater. Um, so we were blown away. We have had now, uh, I think we're up to near on 60,000 uh, uh, listens to the podcast. And, you know, that's more uh, than can fit in our theater in a year. So it's it's been really thrilling to reach out to people who, um, both who are fans of Antias, uh, but also new fans, whether they live uh, in out of state or wherever they may be. Um, we've had, um, we actually had listens to from, I, I think all the continents to, except, uh, <laughs> except Antarctica, but uh, we're working on it. You can listen to the zip code plays in any order, but we have an order that we uh, kind of put them in. So the first play is uh, South Central um, by Kari Wyatt, South Central Los Angeles. And it is a a piece uh, set in um, 1953 um, when uh, Central Avenue uh, had was just coming off of being a thriving neighborhood and just beginning to to change, um, and it's a it's a really interesting historical piece that talks about um, uh, race relations in Los Angeles and in the world. Um, I think it's uh, it, it's it's. It's funny, it's uh, a little dark, uh, it's a little sexy, and it touches on an interesting history of Los Angeles that a lot of people wouldn't know. The second play is set in Pacific Palisades by Alex Goldberg, and uh, it is a very interesting, based on true story, crazy true story, a little piece of, uh, an odd little piece of uh, LA historical uh, anomaly. It's just a strange little story. Uh, and so it's based on a true thing of something um, that happened in the Palisades uh, 
in, on the verge of World War II. And so I think people will want to tune in to find out like what kind of odd things were happening in the Palisades at that time. The third play is, um, is Santa Monica by Nana Agrawal. And it is um, a satirical piece based on a true thing that happened to her, an actual <laughs> event that happened to her. Uh, in Santa Monica, and it, it really just pokes fun at the kind of pretensions that uh, one finds in Los Angeles <laughs> and, and some, of those, uh, some of those stereotypes about Los Angeles that, uh, you know, are a little bit true. Um, and I think it's a very funny little piece of satire. The fourth play is set in Westwood, and it is by Deb Height, and it is um, it's in an interesting genre of like found materials. It is, um, uh, it is items that have been uh, tape recordings that had been found in an FBI file uh, on an uh, on a woman who's uh, become a, a newly old, a new protester in the in the social justice world, uh, and um, it's uh, as if as, as in the Blair Witch Project, and so far as like it's found material, uh, and it's uh, set in Westwood. The next play is. Um, uh, set in Sun Valley, and it's by Steve Serpus. And it is a really interesting uh, relationship story between two people um, in a, set in an auto junkyard, two people who have um, uh, a lot of coincidence has reconnected them, and they kind of come together and find a little bit of salvation in uh, uh, far out in the valley. Um, and the last play is Downtown Los Angeles by, um, by Angela J. Davis. And it is a really it's a piece of magical realism. It is a little fantasia uh, where some historical figures come back to life in Los Angeles and sort of set in a swirling world high above the city of angels. We take a look at um, grace and kindness and forgiveness. And it's a, kind of a perfect ending for uh, this series of our zip code plays. So season two of the Zip Code Plays, we wanted to continue looking at um, a variety of uh, parts of L.A. County, um, different geographical areas, and we wanted to uh, look at different styles. So uh, first up, we have uh, 90069 West Hollywood, where we have a, a very uh, funny story, uh, Brunch Interrupted by Sean Abley, uh, which is... Uh, looks at issues of colonization and gentrification in, uh, in uh, West Hollywood. Um, and I'm, of course, partial to that one because um, I get to play a role in it. I actually have a, an acting part. So uh, I, I enjoyed that one very much and the awesome co-stars that we have on that. Um, so we open the season with West Hollywood. Next, we have 90026 Echo Park, uh, $10 in a tambourine, which looks at... Um, uh, the Early Days of Los Angeles with Amy Semple McPherson uh, and uh, Mr. Mulholland, uh, uh, who built up this, uh, this city in their own individual ways and um, takes a look at uh, the challenges that uh, she faced as a woman um, in Echo Park, uh, building up uh, Los Angeles uh, when it was really just starting out. Um, it's a great play, and that is written by uh, Mildred Inez Lewis. Then we have 90303 Inglewood, The Vig by Paula Sismar, which I love this story too. It takes place um, in the last days of the Hollywood Park racetrack. Um, and it's um, uh, in a bit of an old fashioned story. I, I, what I love about it is it sort of tells that uh, the story of people who come to Los Angeles searching for a dream, um, which is a lot of us. Um, often you see that kind of in a showbiz uh, context, you know, some young person off the bus uh, from wherever they come from looking for uh, Los Angeles to answer their dreams. And in this case, um, it takes place in a different setting, but uh, ask those same questions about chasing, chasing dreams as a young person coming here and what, how do you make it in this, this world of Los Angeles. Then we have a 91331 Pacoima Golden Shine and that's by Kari Wyatt who wrote our uh, South Central uh, episode in season one. He's back. Um, this is a, uh, it's our first ghost story. It's a, a kind of a haunting tale of um, uh, of a professor who's uh, haunted by the past and looking to move forward in the future. Uh, it's a little spooky and uh, a little um, resonant about the times we live in and uh, where we're going. It's, uh, it's an awesome story. Then we have 91601 
North Hollywood, end of the line. Uh, North Hollywood is where NTS used to be. That's our where our former former home was. That is uh, Pepper Chambers' play. Um, uh, and that has a very interesting structure. It's kind of in two parts. The first is a, uh, a bit of a comedy about a woman who um, wants to start her own detective agency. And um, things take a more serious uh, turn in the second half when she witnesses something that um, uh, that actually is a problem, an ongoing kind of crime that's happening. And she witnesses that and then has to deal with the consequences. And then we finish out the season with 91754 Monterey Park. Bingo Bitches by Elizabeth Wong, which um, <laughs> is very, I love this play too. I love them all. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of all of them. This is a, is a story of um, some older women at a, uh, uh, a bingo uh, hall at their uh, local community center in Monterey Park. Uh, and it really asks questions about uh, whose place is, is this? Whose land is this? It's about taking one's own space and owning one's own space. Um, but set in a very, very funny uh, uh, bingo hall. Um, and those are the plays of uh, The Makeup Season 2. So Season 3, we are very excited to um, finally have a play in our very own hometown of Glendale. This is set in 91201 Glendale, The Six Pianos of Miradero, and that is written by Alex Goldberg, who wrote our... Um, our Pacific Palisades show last uh, in season one. So he has returned uh, for us to open up this season in Glendale, our hometown. And this is a little history play about um, Mr. Brand, who um, Brand Avenue is named after. Our, our theater is a, uh, you know, just around the corner from Brand Avenue on Broadway. Um, this is the story about uh, his uh, wife, his will, and his legacy in Glendale, um, the Six Pianos of Miradero. Uh, then we go to 91505 Burbank, for True Sound by Steve Apostolina. Um, you know, Steve is a, a writer and actor, but he also makes uh, his living working in um, uh, post-production voiceovers, doing uh, looping and uh, uh, walla groups. And he knows that world of post-production uh, very well. And this play is set in a Burbank soundstage late at night where a uh, an apprentice and a master of the uh, art of, um, post-production sound and meat and uh, things get a little dicey. Uh, that's called True Sound. Then we will go to 90262 Linwood, Blue Like You, written by Ann Noble, which is a story of a mother and daughter uh, coming together after a very long uh, time being apart. And it is a very funny, touching, gentle play about uh, the importance of names and what we call ourselves and who we are and that is Blue Like You. Uh, then we are going to uh, 90027 Griffith Park, uh, where Pepper Chambers, who wrote our North Hollywood play in season two, is back with The Fire In Between, which tells the story of uh, a couple ambitious young men um, uh, and uh, Griffith Park and an incident that happened in 1933, a true story um, that, uh, that takes place in the park, which is a... Uh, um, you know, we're very lucky to have a huge urban wilderness in the middle of Los Angeles, um, and that's Griffith Park. Uh, then we will go to 90039 Frogtown for um, Anaxorus Boreas, which is a uh, story about a gentrifying neighborhood um, and uh, some <laughs> a bit of a, a biblical plague uh, happens, uh, happens there as uh, new residents of the community are faced with um, some unexpected neighbors. Uh, oh, I should say, A Frog Town is written by Daniel Hirsch. And then uh, Diana Burbano brings us 90028 Hollywood, Marie Dressler, Good Gal. Um, a look at uh, uh, the early days of the film industry in Hollywood, where, um, you know, which brought so many of us to, uh, to town uh, to pursue that film and television world. And uh, Diana Burbano looks at Marie Dressler, a character actress from the uh, from the beginning of Hollywood, and her sort of struggles and uh, triumphs, and how she makes it in this uh, in this early days of the silver screen, which we thought was an appropriate way to um, to wrap up season three. So we created um, some additional programming around the Zip Code plays, and that's the Zip Code Play Tours. Um, what we decided to do was choose uh, landmarks, uh, historical highlights, uh, architectural gems, uh, points of interest in each one of the zip codes. 
um, and make a, a, an audio tour of them. And these are tours that you can do um, uh, virtually, digitally, you can um, uh, follow them along, uh, or you can actually go to the zip code and drive around and, um, and look at these. We have um, uh, great actors from within our company narrating the tours. So much like when you go to a museum and there's an audio tour that you listen to as you go around the museum, these audio tours will uh, bring you uh, throughout the zip code, each, each individual zip code, and you'll learn about the, uh, the, the sites and, uh, uh, of that spot. And they're really interesting. I've gone and done them all. So, uh, you know, as a test case and, you know, there are parts of uh, Los Angeles that I don't know and I was not aware of at all. And so the chance to drive around them and get to know those places has been a real treat. And whether, you know, whether you live on the west side or the east side or wherever you are, there's probably a part of town you don't know so well. So uh, Pacific Palisades was a place I had really didn't know very well. And Pacoima is another place I did not know very well. So um, we, we go all around Los Angeles and um, it's a chance to get to know these places. When we first uh, released them, it was uh, right during um, a lockdown that had, had come up. So we were recommending to everyone that they do them uh, virtually and uh, give them a listen. And you can see pictures and um, and listen to the, to the to the explanations of the places. But I think now, you know, people are are um, careful and and take uh, take caution. They should be able to go around and do these in person as well. And we also uh, were able to hook up with individual um, independently owned businesses in each each of the zip codes. So, you know, there are, are stops for uh, uh, coffee or uh, uh, snacks uh, along the way. So we recommend that you uh, um, uh, give those places a try and uh, uh, get to know the neighborhoods. It's a good way to, to get to know Los Angeles. And, you know, also when you, it's been interesting now that we have quite a few of them to see how much, um, you know, one architect who worked in, in this neighborhood turns out did something over here and turns out they did something else over here. So there are a lot of uh, connections that start to, to happen um, if, you, if you take advantage of the entire, the entire program. And those are the zip code play tours. We could not have done this project unless we had an amazing sound designer. Uh, Jeff Gardner is our uh, audio producer, our sound designer, and our Foley artist. Um, you, you may know that Foley is um, all the sound effects that are, are added in, you know, whether it's horse hooves or rain and lightning, thunder, cars crashing into things. Um, that is all Foley that's done afterwards. So we uh, would not have done the project if we didn't have Jeff Gardner, who is absolutely brilliant. He's an actor in our company, a terrific actor, and also um, an incredible sound designer. Um, so Jeff uh, is the one who kind of figured out how we could accomplish the Zipco plays to begin with by uh, getting different um, uh, microphone setups, uh, kind of a portable booth uh, that um, the actors can record in, you know, uh, blankets to hang behind them so that the sound all sounds right. Um, figured out the platform. We record them um, not on Zoom, but on another platform that uh, allows for a clearer sound. And then uh, Jeff made videos for all of the actors um, to figure out how to set up these kits in their own homes. Each kit is delivered to each individual actor at their house. Um, they set up the system following uh, videos, instructional videos that Jeff made. So he's also a, a video artist. Um, and um, then well, on the day of recording, uh, each person records in their own home uh, with the microphone kit that we have. Uh, and then all those, those different tracks come together Jeff puts it together and it all sounds like everybody's in the same place, whether they're fighting or kissing or uh, whatever they're doing. Um, it sounds like the people were together in the room and they were not. And in fact, in the West Hollywood um, uh, play that we did, um, my husband is, uh, uh, I've never actually met. Uh, the guy plays my husband. So um, it's, it's, um, it's, it's been odd to do them remotely, but because of the way Jeff is able to pull this together, it sounds like we're all in the same place. Then once the recordings are completed, um, there's a lot of time spent uh, with the editing of those together to make the tracks all sound correct. Um, and then adding in these uh, sound effects, these Foley, uh, Foley effects, um, depending on, you know, and some of them have been much more difficult than others. I know that, uh, for example, Inglewood with all the horse hooves, that was a, that was a, 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 big, a big thing to do. Um, uh, I think the Frogtown one is uh, another, uh, another one that's been a challenge, but they've all been challenging in their own way. And Jeff is amazing because he rises to each challenge. And 
uh, and figures out a way to make it all work. And then he and Ellen Mandel, who does our original music, work together to um, uh, to put a sort of a score around and, and around it that's appropriate for each piece. Each one is, a, we have a theme, but there are unique qualities to each one that Jeff and Ellen work on together to, to um, make it all a, a seamless product. And people may not notice that um, it, it necessarily, but you would notice it if it was not good. Uh, so the fact that it is so smooth and seamless is a tribute to Jeff and Ellen. I think the thing I want people to take away from the entire Zip Code Play project is a sense of what Los Angeles is and who we are and uh, what this city is about. You know, it's a big, sprawling, unwieldy city. Um, we know that. It takes uh, hours to drive across from one end to the other. Um, and it can be a place that is isolating in some ways. Um, you know, you don't run into people necessarily in the same way you do on the streets of New York or something. Um, and uh, but when we put all these pieces together and you hear now, we have 18 uh, zip code plays, when you hear them in their entirety, um, you start to really get a, a, a sense of how this city is uh, as a whole and all the unique pieces that make it up. And, um, and as a theater that wants to serve our community here, I think it's really important that we, we get to know Los Angeles better. And I think this will help people get to know Los Angeles better. Yeah, I really want to keep the zip code place going. Um, season one, two, and three have been, uh, I just am super proud of them. I mean, they, it, because, uh, I don't know, I don't know how to say it. I'm just, they make me thrilled when I hear the, or the when I hear the, the uh, sort of rough drafts of them that Jeff Gardner sends me, uh, I just sort of beam with pride because these are um, things that existed only as an idea and now they exist as something that everyone can hear and listen to. So uh, I want to keep going. I feel like we have lots of, a lot more zip codes to look at, a lot more uh, parts of Los Angeles. And then who knows, we could spread out. We could do California. We can do different uh, places across the country. I think this format really, really can speak to um, the sense of place that... Uh, sometimes it's difficult to, to reach. You know, it's interesting um, when you think about the future of some of these plays. Um, they are written as um, half hour uh, pieces, but some of them um, I think really could lend themselves to further exploration. The characters are so unique, the uh, situation uh, would allow for expansion. Uh, some of them I think are perfect just as they are, and I, I wouldn't want to touch them. I think they're just perfect as they are. But um, indeed, some of them are being, are being read other places and in festivals at other other theaters across the country. So um, uh, I think that's exciting too. And that, that uh, you know, like a short story, that might be the entire thing and it might be perfect um, as is. Uh, some, I think, um, could absolutely be expanded into full length pieces and, um, I know, I know actually for a fact that some of them are being uh, worked out in that direction. And um, if, if that's the case, and if they, they turn out right, it would be a very exciting thing to have them uh, on the stage at NTS when we're back in person. I think people need to hear them because, uh, well, for one, the talent uh, and the caliber of the, the writing and the casts are um, incredible. I don't think anybody will be disappointed. I think anyone who listens to one will want to hear another. They're uh, a maximum a half hour long. So it's a nice bite-sized piece uh, for your for your walk or for your uh, cleaning the kitchen or the garage, um, folding the laundry. It's a perfect, it's a perfect way to uh, spend a little time immersed in another world. Um, and yeah, there's no reason not to. And they're free. Uh, the Antius Playwrights Lab is a a unique part of, uh, of the NTS Theater Company. You know, we um, began as a classical theater company, and so our canon of plays was often um, Shakespeare and uh, Chekhov and um, Ibsen. Um, we have for a, a, a long time been looking to expand that and to say, what makes a classic? It's a question we're always asking ourselves and pushing those boundaries out. So within that, um, we've had for a number of years a playwrights lab where on Tuesday nights, different writers bring in 20 pages of material, new, new pages or pages they've worked on previously. Uh, and actors within our company read those and, um, and then a discussion ensues about uh, where the play is moving next. Um, from that, uh, we started doing a, 
a, a reading series called Lab Results, where we heard um, six full-length plays in a public uh, public readings for six plays that came out of the Playwrights Lab. And from those, uh, in 2019, we produced uh, two original works um, that um, you know were, were, were developed within the Playwrights Lab entirely, and we presented those on the main stage. Um, when we were looking for uh, zip code plays, of course, we immediately turned to the writers in the lab um, because they're they're so good, they're so varied, um, and um, the writers pitched things to us, and we chose uh, now um, eighteen of these. So uh, the Playwrights Lab has become a more and more a, a super important part of Antias and the Antias community. It's great for the actors. It's great for the writers there. Um, and while we, of course, want to continue with the classics and doing um, doing those uh, plays from the from the canon, we also want to expand that and uh, looking for new classics for plays. And by that, generally, I mean um, we look at, at plays with timely and timeless themes. There has to be a kind of um, depth and breadth to these plays for them to sort of fit into the Antias brand. Um, but within the playwrights lab, people also write, uh, you know, kitchen sink dramas and things that might not uh, might not be on brand for us, but are terrific plays that are well deserving of production. And it's our hope to help people at other theaters find those, so that our writers' uh, work is is spread out across the city and across the country. Um, uh, and then and then some of them fit um, more specifically in Antias' uh, kind of definition of timely and timeless. But the playwrights lab is a is a really vital. And of course, during the pandemic, it's continued to meet uh, virtually. And um, we have found that, you know, you can uh, develop new plays, uh, you know, on Zoom and uh, in, in readings uh, virtually uh, in a pretty handy way. So it's continued and throughout this shutdown and has become a part of the uh, fabric of Antius. I think it's, um, it's important to everyone at Antius that uh, everything that we do is looked at through um, a lens of equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, the Playwrights Lab uh, represents that and uh, represents that in that we want talented writers who are talking about um, every different topic and every different experience and every different background. We want to know those stories. Um, I look at um, our, um, and in Tia's end, uh, with the zip code plays particularly, I look at our job as to provide a lovely box uh, uh, a lovely candy box, and uh, each playwright puts in uh, a different bonbon or a chocolate or a lemon bar or whatever they want, to, whatever they want. Um, and our job, I feel, is to strengthen and amplify those voices and then provide a nice lid with a bow for them. Uh, and that's what we provide, and they provide a delicious bite uh, in each case. And uh, that's how I look at it. In some ways, it's hard to say why theater is so important to the to the structure of a community when there are uh, obviously medical issues and that people have there are severe problems in the world, you know, right now, and maybe always. But I don't think we can put art aside and just say it's not worth uh, anything. I think that uh, artists change the culture. They they change the topic of conversation. They move the they move the meter on uh, uh, where uh, people are in the world. Um, I don't know. Uh, you know, everyone has their own opinion about what art can do and the power of art uh, to uh, make social change, to um, uh, speak out about important topics. Uh, my personal. Uh, experience has shown me or what interests me, I guess, is telling true stories, uh, uh, shining a light on voices that we have not heard, uh, looking at um, issues from all sides and allowing audiences to, to take what they will. Um, I don't, I don't, um, uh, I'm not as big a fan of, of preaching to the audience as I am uh, to, um, uh, presenting stories about people's humanity, different characters' humanity, whether those things are, um, you know, not are good, bad, or indifferent. Um, to, to to talk about the complexities of the human human character of humanity, 
um, and letting people draw their own conclusions from that. I know that art has um, has affected my life in, in every way. I think that is true for a lot of young people coming up. I think it's true for older people who are asking questions about what's life mean. And probably anybody who's asking questions about what does life mean. Uh, art is there to, to shine a light on that and to, to, to delve into those, those difficult questions. And I wouldn't want to live in a society where that was not important. Uh, so we, uh, while, while there are all kinds of causes out there that need, need help, I think supporting art is a very noble and uh, uh, exciting and challenging way to spend one's time. Well, there are always ways for people to get involved at NTS, um, uh, whether they are subscribers, donors, audience members. Um, we are always looking to invite you to get involved. Um, it's a, I think NTS um, is a real community. Uh, I think it's a place where people come together and uh, feel like it's their artistic home. Uh, we're small enough that there's an intimacy, but large enough that there's some structure to what we're doing um, and, and, a, and a, a big enough tent that everyone is welcome. Uh, so I would encourage people to get involved by um, uh, listening to the zip code plays, by checking out the website, antias.org. Um, come and see what we're doing. Um, when we're back in person, for sure, come and see what we're doing. Um, uh, there's always a place to, to be a part of, uh, part of this. And I, I hope that we are able to create a bigger and bigger and more embracing home for everybody, uh, whether they are uh, in the audience, whether they are working behind the scenes, whether they're um, uh, working front of house, whatever they're doing. Um, this is a place where like-minded people come together. And uh, you know, somebody said we, that a theater should be like a, a town square where we all kind of come together and talk about things and hash out ideas and share thoughts. And uh, uh, I like that idea. Hi, I'm Bill Brocktrup. I'm the artistic director of NTS Theatre Company. Um, and we invite you to uh, check out our website and everything going on at nts.org and, um, and become a part of uh, what we're doing. Uh, thank you so much.